a treatise on domestic economy, for the use of young ladies at home, and at school. By Miss Catherine E. Beecher. To American mothers, whose intelligence and virtues have inspired admiration and respect, whose experience has furnished many valuable suggestions, in this work, whose approbation will be highly valued, and whose influence, in promoting the object aimed at, is respectfully solicited, this work is dedicated, by their friend and countrywoman, the author. Preface. To the third edition. The author of this work was led to attempt it, by discovering, in her extensive travels, the deplorable sufferings of multitudes of young wives and mothers, from the combined influence of poor health, poor domestics, and a defective domestic education. The number of young women whose health is crushed, ere the first few years of married life are past, would seem incredible to one who has not investigated this subject, and it would be vain to attempt to depict the sorrow, discouragement, and distress experienced in most families where the wife and mother is a perpetual invalid. The writer became early convinced that this evil results mainly from the fact that young girls, especially in the more wealthy classes, are not trained for their profession. In early life, they go through a course of school training which results in great debility of constitution, while, at the same time, their physical and domestic education is almost wholly neglected. Thus they enter on their most arduous and sacred duties so inexperienced and uninformed, and with so little muscular and nervous strength, that probably there is not one chance in ten, that young women of the present day, will pass through the first years of married life without such prostration of health and spirits as makes life a burden to themselves, and, it is to be feared, such as seriously interrupts the confidence and happiness of married life. The measure which, more than any other, would tend to remedy this evil, would be to place domestic economy on an equality with the other sciences in female schools. This should be done because it can be properly and systematically taught, not practically, but as a science, as much so as political economy or moral science, or any other branch of study, because it embraces knowledge, which will be needed by young women at all times and in all places, because this science can never be properly taught until it is made a branch of study, and because this method will secure a dignity and importance in the estimation of young girls, which can never be accorded while they perceive their teachers and parents practically attaching more value to every other department of science than this. When young ladies are taught the construction of their own bodies, and all the causes in domestic life which tend to weaken the constitution, when they are taught rightly to appreciate and learn the most convenient and economical modes of performing all family duties, and of employing time and money, and when they perceive the true estimate accorded to these things by teachers and friends, the grand cause of this evil will be removed. Women will be trained to secure, as of first importance, a strong and healthy constitution, and all those rules of thrift and economy that will make domestic duty easy and pleasant. To promote this object, the writer prepared this volume as a textbook for female schools. It has been examined by the Massachusetts Board of Education, and been deemed worthy by them to be admitted as a part of the Massachusetts School Library. It has also been adopted as a textbook in some of our largest and most popular female schools, both at the East and West. The following, from the pen of Mr. George B. Emerson, one of the most popular and successful teachers in our country, who has introduced this work as a textbook in his own school will exhibit the opinion of one who has formed his judgment from experience in the use of the work, it may be objected that such things cannot be taught by books. Why not? Why may not the structure of the human body, and the laws of health deduced therefrom, be as well taught as the laws of natural philosophy? Why are not the application of these laws to the management of infants and young children as important to a woman as the application of the rules of arithmetic to the extraction of the cube root? Why may not the properties of the atmosphere be explained, in reference to the proper ventilation of rooms, or exercise in the open air, as properly as to the burning of steel or sodium? Why is not the human skeleton as curious and interesting as the air pump, and the action of the brain? as the action of a steam engine. Why may not the healthiness of different kinds of food and drink, the proper modes of cooking, 
and the rules in reference to the modes and times of taking them, be discussed as properly as rules of grammar, or facts in history. Are not the principles that should regulate clothing, the rules of cleanliness, the advantages of early rising and domestic exercise, as readily communicated as the principles of mineralogy, or rules of syntax? Are not the rules of Jesus Christ, applied to refine domestic manners and preserve a good temper, as important as the abstract principles of ethics, as taught by Paley, Wayland, or Dufroy? May not the advantages of neatness, system, and order, be as well illustrated in showing how they contribute to the happiness of a family, as by showing how they add beauty to a copybook, or a portfolio of drawings? Would not a teacher be as well employed in teaching the rules of economy, in regard to time and expenses, or in regard to dispensing charity, as in teaching double, or single entry in bookkeeping? are not the principles that should guide in constructing a house, and in warming and ventilating it properly, as important to young girls as the principles of the Athenian commonwealth, or the rules of Roman tactics. Is it not as important that children should be taught the dangers to the mental faculties, when overexcited on the one hand, or left unoccupied on the other, as to teach them the conflicting theories of political economy, or the speculations of metaphysicians? For ourselves, we have always found children, especially girls, peculiarly ready to listen to what they saw would prepare them for future duties. The truth, that education should be a preparation for actual, real life, has the greatest force with children. The constantly recurring inquiry, what will be the use of this study, is always satisfied by showing, that it will prepare for any duty, relation, or office which in the natural course of things, will be likely to come. We think this book extremely well suited to be used as a textbook in schools for young ladies, and many chapters are well adapted for a reading book for children of both sexes. To this the writer would add the testimony of a lady who has used this work with several classes of young girls and young ladies. She remarked that she had never known a school book that awaken more interest and that some young girls would learn a lesson in this when they would study nothing else. She remarked, also, that when reciting the chapter on the construction of houses, they became greatly interested in inventing plans of their own, which gave an opportunity to the teacher to point out difficulties and defects. Had this part of domestic economy been taught in schools, our land would not be so defaced with awkward, misshapen, inconvenient, and, at the same time, needlessly expensive houses, as it now is. Although the writer was trained to the care of children, and to perform all branches of domestic duty, by some of the best of housekeepers, much in these pages is offered, not as the result of her own experience, but as what has obtained the approbation of some of the most judicious mothers and housekeepers in the nation. The articles on physiology and hygiene, and those on horticulture, were derived from standard works on these subjects, and are sanctioned by the highest authorities. The American Housekeeper's Receipt Book is another work prepared by the author of The Domestic Economy, in connection with several experienced housekeepers, and is designed for a supplement to this work. On pages 354a and 354b will be found the preface and analysis of that work the two books being designed for a complete course of instructions on every department of domestic economy. The copyright interest in these two works is held by a board of gentlemen appointed for the purpose, who, after paying a moderate compensation to the author for the time and labor spent in preparing these works, will employ all the remainder paid over by the publishers, to aid in educating and locating such female teachers as wish to be employed in those portions of our country which are most destitute of schools. The contract with the publisher provides that the publisher shall guarantee the sales and thus secure against any losses for bad debts, for which he shall receive 5%. He shall charge 20%. For commissions paid to retailers, and also the expenses of printing, paper, and binding, at the current market prices, and make no other charges. The net profits thus determined are then to be divided equally, the publishers taking one half, 
and paying the other half to the board above mentioned. Contents. Preface 7 Chapter I. Peculiar responsibilities of American women. American women should feel a peculiar interest in democratic institutions. The maxim of our civil institutions. Its identity with the main principle of Christianity. Relations involving subordination, why they are needful. Examples. How these relations are decided in a democracy. What decides the equity of any law or institution? The principle of aristocracy. The tendency of democracy in respect to the interests of women. Illustrated in the United States. Testimony of the Tocqueville. Miss Martinez misrepresentations. In what respects are women subordinate? And why? Wherein are they equal or superior in influence? And how are they placed by courtesy? How can American women rectify any real disadvantages involved in our civil institutions? Opinion of de Tocqueville as to the influence and example of American democracy. Responsibilities involved in this view, especially those of American women, 25 Chapter 2 Difficulties peculiar to American women. A law of moral action to be noted. Its application. Considerations to be borne in mind, in appreciating peculiar trials. Application to American women. Difference between this and aristocratic countries. How this affects the interests of American women. Effect of wealth, in this country, on domestic service. Effects on the domestic comfort of women. Second peculiar trial of American women. Extent of this evil. The writer's observation on this point. Effects on the anticipations of mothers and daughters. Infrequency of healthful women in the wealthy classes. Causes which operate to undermine the female constitution. Excitement of mind. Course of intellectual training. Taxation, in domestic life, of American mothers and housekeepers. Exercise and fresh air needful to balance mental excitement. Defect in American, compared with English, customs, in this respect. Difference in the health and youthfulness of appearance between English and American mothers. Liabilities of American women to the uncommon exposures of a new country. Remarks of de Tocqueville and the writer on this point. 38 Chapter 3 Remedies for the preceding difficulties. First remedy suggested. Obligations of wealthy ladies on this point. How a dearth of domestics may prove a blessing. Second remedy. Domestic economy should be taught in schools. Third remedy. Reasons for endowing colleges and professional schools. Similar reasons exist for endowing female institutions. Present evils in conducting female education. A sketch of a model female institution. Accommodations provided. Mode of securing exercise to pupils. Objections to this answered. Calisthenics. Course of intellectual discipline adopted. Mode of division of labor adopted. Example of Illinois in regard to female education. Economy of health and time secured by such institutions. Plan suggested for the early education of young girls. Last remedy suggested, 48 Chapter 4 on domestic economy as a branch of study. Impediment to making domestic economy a study at school. First reason why it should be so made. State of domestic service precarious. Second reason. Examples illustrating. Third reason. Questions asked. First objection, how answered. Next objection, how answered. Next objection, how answered. Last reason, 63 chapter V. On the care of health. Importance of a knowledge of the laws of health, and of the human system, to females. Construction of the human frame. Bones, their structure, design, and use. Engraving and description. Spinal column. Engravings of vertebra. Exercise of the bones. Muscles, their constitution, use, and connection with the bones. Engraving and description. Operation of muscles. Nerves, their use. Spinal column. Engravings and descriptions. Distortions of the spine. Engravings and descriptions. Blood vessels, their object. Engravings and descriptions. The heart, and its connection with the system. Engravings and descriptions. 
organs of digestion and respiration, engraving and description, process of digestion, circulation of the blood, process of respiration, necessity of pure air, the skin, process of perspiration, insensible perspiration, heat of the body, absorbance, importance of frequent ablutions and change of garments, follicles of oily matter in the skin, nerves of feeling, 68 chapter vi. on healthful food. Responsibility of a housekeeper in regard to health and food. The most fruitful cause of disease. Gastric juice, how proportioned. Hunger the natural guide as to quantity of food. A benevolent provision, how perverted, and its effects. A morbid appetite, how caused. Effects of too much food in the stomach. Duty of a housekeeper in reference to this. Proper time for taking food. Peristaltic motion. Need of rest to the muscles of the stomach. Time necessary between each meal. Exceptions of hard laborers and active children. Exercise, its effect on all parts of the body. How it produces hunger. What is to be done by those who have lost the guidance of hunger in regulating the amount of food. On quality of food. Differences to risk from bad food between healthy persons who exercise, and those of delicate and sedentary habits. Stimulating food, its effects. Condiments needed only for medicine, and to be avoided as food. Difference between animal and vegetable food. Opinion of some medical men. Medical men agree as to the excess of animal food in American diet. Extracts from medical writers on this point. Articles most easily digested. The most unhealthful articles result from bad cooking. Caution as to mode of eating. Reason why mental and bodily exertions are injurious after a full meal. Changes in diet should be gradual, and why. Drink most needed at breakfast, and why. Dinner should be the heartiest meal, and why. Little drink to be taken while eating, and why. Extremes of heat or cold, why injurious in food. Fluids immediately absorbed from the stomach. Why soups are hard of digestion. Case of Alexis St. Martin. Why highly concentrated nourishment is not good for health. Beneficial effects of using unbolted flour. Scarcity of wheat under William Pitt's administration, and its effects. Causes of a debilitated constitution from the misuse of food. 94 Chapter 7 on healthful drinks. Responsibility of a housekeeper in this respect. Stimulating drinks not required for the perfection of the human system. Therefore they are needless. First evil in using them. Second evil. Five kinds of stimulating articles in use in this country. First argument in favor of stimulants, and how answered. Second argument, how answered. The writer's view of the effects of tea and coffee on American females. Duty in reference to children. Black tea the most harmless stimulant. Warm drinks not needful. Hot drinks injurious. Effect of hot drinks on teeth. Mexican customs and their effects illustrating this. Opinion of Dr. Coombe on this subject. Difference between the stimulus of animal food and the stimulating drinks used. Common habit of drinking freely of cold water debilitating. Persons taking but little exercise require but little drink. 106 Chapter 8 on Clothing. Calculations made from bills of mortality, and inference from them. Causes of infant mortality. Of the circulation in infancy. Warm dress for infants, and why. Investigations in France, and results. Dangers from the opposite extreme. Effects of too much clothing. Rule of safety. Feather beds, why unhealthy in warm weather. Best nightgowns for young children. Clothing, how to be proportioned. Irrational dress of women. Use of flannel next the skin. Evils of tight dresses to women. False taste in our prints of fashions. Modes in which tight dresses operate to weaken the constitution. Rule of safety is to looseness of dress. Example of English ladies in appropriateness of dress, 112 chapter 9 on cleanliness. Importance of cleanliness not realized, without a knowledge of the nature of the skin. Foundation of the maxim respecting the healthfulness of dirt. 
office of the skin, other organs which perform similar duties, amount of matter daily exhaled by the skin, effect of a chill upon the skin, when perspiring, illustration of this, effect of closing the pores of the skin, with dirt or other matter, the skin absorbs matter into the blood, reasons for a daily ablution of the whole body, effects of fresh air on clothing worn next the skin, Americans compared with other nations as to care of the skin, cautions in regard to a use of the bath, how to decide when cold bathing is useful, warm bath tends to prevent colds, and why, when a bath should be taken, advantages of general ablutions to children, care of the teeth, 118 chapter x. On early rising. Universal impression in respect to this practice. Why it should be regarded as American and democratic. Practice in aristocratic circles in England. Appeal to American women. First consideration in favor of early rising. Another physiological reason in its favor. Another reason. Time necessary for sleep. Proper hours for rising and retiring. Evils of protracted sleep. Testimony of Sir John Sinclair. Another reason for early rising. Responsibility of parents for the health and industry of a family. Effects of early rising on general society. 122 Chapter 11 on domestic exercise. Causes which produce delicacy and decay of the female constitution. Want of exercise. Neglect of the laws of health. Want of pure air. Objectionable amusements. Sleeping by day. Want of exercise a greater cause of these evils, than all the others combined. Importance of understanding the influence of the neglect or abuse of the muscular system. Nerves of sensation and of motion. Both need exercise. Rules for exercise. Importance of a feeling of interest in taking exercise. Walks merely for exercise. Exercise most proper for young girls. Exercise, more than anything else, imparts fresh strength and vitality to all parts of the body. Mistakes of mothers and teachers on this subject. Effects of neglecting to use the muscles, effects of excessive use of them. Effect of school confinement and seats. Extract from the young lady's friend. Lady Montague. Daughter of a French nobleman. 128 Chapter 12 On Domestic Manners. What are good manners? Defect in American manners. Coldness and reserve of the descendants of the Puritans accounted for. Cause of the want of courtesy in American manners. Want of discrimination. Difference of principles regulating aristocratic and democratic manners. Rules for regulating the courtesies founded on precedence of age, office, and station in a democracy. Manners appropriate to superiors and subordinates. Miss Martinez remarks on the universal practice of Americans to give precedence to woman. Peculiar defect of Americans in this respect. This to be remedied in the domestic circle, alone. Rules of precedence to be enforced in the family. Manners and tones towards superiors to be regulated in the family. Treatment of grown brothers and sisters by young children. Acknowledgement of favors by children to be required. Children to ask leave or apologize in certain cases. Rules for avoiding remarks that wound the feelings of others. Rules of hospitality. Conventional rules. Rules for table manners. Caution as to teaching these rules to children. Caution as to allowances to be made for those deficient in good manners. Comparison of English and American manners, by de Tocqueville. America may hope to excel all nations in refinement, taste, and good breeding, and why. Effects of wealth and equalization of labor. Allusion to the manners of courts in the past century. 136 Chapter 13 On the preservation of a good temper in a housekeeper. Influence of a housekeeper on domestic happiness. Contrasts to illustrate. Sympathy. Influence of tones. Allowances to be made for housekeepers. Considerations to aid in regulating temper and tones. First, her duty is to be regarded as dignified, important, and difficult. Second, she should feel that she really has great difficulties to meet and overcome. Third, 
she should deliberately calculate upon having her plans interfered with, and be prepared for the emergency. Fourth, all her plans should be formed consistently with the means at command. Fifth, system, economy, and neatness, only valuable when they tend to promote the comfort and well-being of the family. Sixth, government of tones of voice. Some persons think angry tones needful. They mistake. Illustration. Scolding, unladylike, and in bad taste. A forgiving spirit necessary. Seventh and last consideration offered, right view of a superintending providence. Fretfulness and complaining sinful. 148 Chapter 14 On Habits of System and Order. Question of the equality of the sexes, frivolous and useless? Relative importance and difficulty of the duties a woman is called to perform. Her duty is not trivial. More difficult than those of the queen of a great nation. A habit of system and order necessary. Right apportionment of time, general principles. Christianity to be the foundation. Intellectual and social interests to be preferred to gratification of taste or appetite. The latter to be last in our estimation. No sacrifice of health allowable. Neglect of health a sin in the sight of God. Regular season of rest appointed by the Creator. Divisions of time. Systematic arrangement of house articles and other conveniences. Regular employment for each member of a family. Children can be of great service. Boys should be taught family work. Advantage to them in afterlife. Older children to take care of infants of a family. 155 Chapter 15 On Giving in Charity. No point of duty more difficult to fix by rule than charity. First consideration semicolon object for which we are placed in this world. How to be perfectly happy. Self denying benevolence. Important distinction. Second consideration semicolon natural principles not to be exterminated, but regulated and controlled. All constitutional propensities good, and designed to be gratified. Their abuses to be guarded against. Third consideration semicolon superfluities sometimes proper, and sometimes not. Fourth consideration semicolon no rule of duty right for one and not for all. The opposite of this principle tested. Some use of superfluities necessary. Physical gratifications should always be subordinate to social intellectual, and moral advantages. Difficulties in the way. Remarks upon them. Plan for keeping an account of necessaries and superfluities. Untoward results of our actions do not always prove that we deserve blame. Examples of conformity to the rules here laid down. General principles to guide in deciding upon objects of charity. Parable of Good Samaritan. Who are our neighbors? those most in need to be first relieved. Intellectual and moral wants more necessary to be supplied than physical. Not much need of charity in supplying physical wants in this country. System of associated charities, in which many small sums are combined. Indiscriminate charity, very injurious to society, as a general rule. Exceptions. Impropriety of judging of the charities of others. 167 Chapter 16 On Economy of Time and Expenses. Underscore Economy of Time. Value of Time. Right Apportionment of Time. Laws Appointed by God for the Jews. Proportions of Property and Time the Jews were required to devote to intellectual, benevolent, and religious purposes. The Levites. The Weekly Sabbath. The Sabbatical Year. Three-sevenths of the time of the Jews devoted to God's service. Christianity removes the restrictions laid on the Jews, but demands all our time to be devoted to our own best interests and the good of our fellow men. Some practical good to be the ultimate end of all our pursuits. Enjoyment connected with the performance of every duty. Great mistake of mankind. A final account to be given of the apportionment of our time. Various modes of economizing time. System and order. Uniting several objects in one employment. Employment of odd intervals of time. We are bound to aid others in economizing time. Economy in expenses. Necessity of information on this point. Contradictory notions. 
general principles in which all agree, knowledge of income and expenses, every one bound to do as much as she can to secure system and order, examples, evils of want of system and forethought, young ladies should early learn to be systematic and economical, articles of dress and furniture should be in keeping with each other, and with the circumstances of the family, mistaken economy, education of daughters away from home injudicious, nice sewing should be done at home, cheap articles not always most economical, buying by wholesale economical only in special cases, penurious savings made by getting the poor to work cheap, relative obligations of the poor and the rich in regard to economy, economy of providence in the unequal distribution of property, carelessness of expense not a mark of gentility, beating down prices improper in wealthy people, inconsistency in American would be fashionables, 180 chapter 17 on health of mind. Intimate connection between the body and mind. Brain excited by improper stimulants taken into the stomach. Mental faculties then affected. Example of a person having lost a portion of his skull. Causes of mental diseases. Want of oxygenized blood. Fresh air absolutely necessary. Excessive exercise of the intellect or feelings a cause of derangement. Such attention to religion, as prevents the performance of other duties, wrong. Teachers and parents should look to this. Unusual precocity in children usually the result of a diseased brain. Parents generally add fuel to this fever. Idiocy often the result, or the precocious child sinks below the average of mankind. This evil yet prevalent in colleges and other seminaries. A medical man necessary in every seminary. Some pupils always needing restraint in regard to study. A third cause of mental disease, the want of appropriate exercise of the various faculties of the mind. Extract from Dr. Coombe. Examples of wealthy ladies. Beneficial results of active intellectual employments. Indications of a diseased mind. 195 Chapter 18 On the Care of Domestics. No subject on which American women need more wisdom, patience, principle, and self control. Its difficulties. Necessary evils. Miseries of aristocratic lands. Wisdom of conforming to actual circumstances. How to judge correctly respecting domestics. They should be treated as we would expect to be under similar circumstances. When labor is scarce, its value is increased. Instability of domestics, how it may be remedied. Pride and insubordination, how remedied. Abhorrence of servitude a national trait of character. Domestics easily convinced of the appropriateness of different degrees of subordination. Example. Domestics may be easily induced to be respectful in their deportment, and appropriate in their dress. Deficiencies of qualifications for the performance of their duties, how remedied. For warning, better than chiding. Preventing, better than finding fault. Faults should be pointed out in a kind manner. Some employers think it their office and duty to find fault. Domestics should be regarded with sympathy and forbearance. 204 Chapter 19 On the Care of Infants. Necessity of a knowledge of this subject, to every young lady. Examples. Extracts from Doctors Coombe, Bell, and E. Burl. Half the deaths of infants owing to mismanagement, and errors in diet. Errors of parents and nurses. Error of administering medicines to children, unnecessarily. Need of fresh air, attention to food, cleanliness, dress, and bathing. Cholera infantum not cured by nostrums. Formation of good habits in children. 213 Chapter 20 On the Management of Young Children. Physical Education of Children. Remark of Dr. Clark, and Opinion of Other Medical Men. Many popular notions relating to animal food for children, erroneous. The formation of the human teeth and stomach does not indicate that man was designed to live on flesh. Opinions of Linus and Guvia. Stimulus of animal food not necessary to full development of the physical and intellectual powers. Examples. Of Laplanders, Kamkatkadels, Scotch Highlanders, 
Siberian exiles, Africans, Arabs. Popular notion that animal food is more nourishing than vegetable. Different opinions on this subject. Experiments. Opinions of Dr. Coombe and others. Examples of men who lived to a great age. Dr. Franklin's testimony. Sir Isaac Newton and others. Albany Orphan Asylum. Deleterious practice of allowing children to eat at short intervals. Intellectual training. Schoolrooms. Moral character. Submission, self denial, and benevolence. The three most important habits to be formed in early life. Extremes to be guarded against. Medium course. Adults sometimes forget the value which children set on trifles. Example. Impossible to govern children, properly, without appreciating the value they attach to their pursuits and enjoyments. Those who govern children should join in their sports. This the best way to gain their confidence and affection. But older persons should never lose the attitude of superiors. Unsteadiness in government. Illustrations. Punishment from unsteady governors, does little good. Over government. Want of patience and self-control in parents and governors. Example of parents more effectual than their precepts. Formation of habits of self-denial in early life. Denying ourselves to promote the happiness of others. Habits of honesty and veracity. Habits of modesty. Delicacy studiously to be cherished. Licentious and impure books to be banished. Bulwer a licentious writer, and to be discountenanced. 220 Chapter 21 On the care of the sick. Women frequently called upon to direct in cases of indisposition. Extremes to be avoided. Grand cause of most diseases, excess in eating and drinking. Fasting useful. Extracts from Drs. Burn and Coombe. Necessity of a woman's understanding the nature and operation of common medicines. Simple electuary. Discretion required. Useful directions in regard to nursing the sick. Fresh air absolutely necessary. Frequent ablutions important. Dressing a blister. Arrangements to be made beforehand, when practicable. Importance of cleanliness, nothing more annoying to the sick, than a want of it. Necessity of a proper preparation of food, for the sick. Physicians' directions to be well understood and implicitly followed. Kindness, patience, and sympathy, towards the sick, important. Impositions of apothecaries. Drugs to be locked up from the access of children. 234 Chapter 22 On Accidents and Antidotes. Medical aid should be promptly resorted to. Suffocation, from substances in the throat. Common cuts. Wounds of arteries, and other severe cuts. Bruises. Sprains. Broken limbs. Falls. Blows on the head. Burns. Drowning. Poisons colon corrosive sublimate, arsenic, or cobalt, opium acids, alkalis, stupefaction from fumes of charcoal, or from entering a well, lime kiln, or coal mine, hemorrhage of the lungs, stomach, or throat, bleeding of the nose, dangers from lightning, 240 chapter 23 on domestic amusements and social duties. Indefiniteness of opinion on this subject. Every person needs some recreation. General rules. How much time to be given? What amusements proper? Those should always be avoided, which cause pain, or injure the health, or endanger life, or interfere with important duties, or are pernicious in their tendency. Horse racing, circus riding, theatres, and gambling. Dancing, as now conducted, does not conduce to health of body or mind, but the contrary. Dancing in the open air beneficial. Social benefits of dancing considered. Ease and grace of manners better secured by a system of calisthenics. The writer's experience. Balls going out of fashion, among the more refined circles. Novel reading. Necessity for discrimination. Young persons should be guarded from novels. Proper amusements for young persons. Cultivation of flowers and fruits. Benefits of the practice. Music. Children enjoy it. Collections of shells, plants, 
minerals, and c. children's games and sports. Parents should join in them. Mechanical skill of children to be encouraged. Other enjoyments. Social enjoyments not always considered in the list of duties. Main object of life to form character. Family friendship should be preserved. Plan adopted by families of the writer's acquaintance. Kindness to strangers. Hospitality. Change of character of communities in relation to hospitality. Hospitality should be prompt. Strangers should be made to feel at their ease. 244 Chapter 24 on the construction of houses. Importance to family comfort of well constructed houses. Rules for constructing them. Economy of labor. Large houses. Arrangement of rooms. Wells and cisterns. Economy of money. Shape and arrangement of houses. Porticos, piazzas, and other ornaments. Simplicity to be preferred. Fireplaces. Economy of health. Outdoor conveniences. Doors and windows. Ventilation. Economy of comfort. Domestics. Spare chambers. Good taste. Proportions. Color and ornaments. Underscore plans of houses and domestic conveniences. Receipts for whitewash. 258 Chapter 25 on fires and lights. Wood fires. Construction of fireplaces. Fisets. Building a fire. Wood. Cautions. Stoves and grates. Cautions. Stove pipes. Anthracite coal. Bituminous coal. Proper grates. Coal stoves. On lights. Lamps. Oil. Candles. Lard. Pearl ash and water for cleansing lamps. Care of lamps. Difficulty. Articles needed in trimming lamps. Astral lamps. Wicks. Dipping wicks in vinegar. Shades. Weak eyes. Entry lamps. Night lamps. Tapers. Waxed tapers for use in sealing letters. To make candles. Molds. Dipped candles. Rush lights. 280 Chapter 26 On washing. All needful accommodations should be provided. Plenty of water, easily accessible, necessary. Articles to be provided for washing. Substitutes for soft water. Common mode of washing. Assorting clothes. To wash bedding. Feathers. Calicos. Bran water. Potato water. Soda washing. Soda soap. Mode of soda washing. Cautions in regard to colored clothes, and flannels. To wash brown linen, muslins, nankeen, woolen table covers and shawls, woolen yarn, worsted and woolen hose. To cleanse gentlemen's broadcloths. To make lee, soft soap, hard soap, white soap, starch, and other articles used in washing. 284 Chapter 27 on starching, ironing and cleansing dot to prepare starch, glue and gum starch, beefs or rock gall, starching muslins and laces, to cleanse or white and silk lace, or blonde, and white lace veils, on ironing, articles to be provided for ironing, sprinkling, folding, and ironing, 292 chapter 28 on whitening, cleansing, and dyeing to whiten articles and remove stains from them. Mixtures to remove stains and grease. To cleanse silk handkerchiefs and ribbands, silk hose or gloves, down and feathers, straw and leghorn hats. On colouring. Pink, red, yellow, blue, green, salmon, buff, dove, slate, brown, black, and olive colours. 296 Chapter 29 On the Care of Parlors. Proper arrangement of rooms, shades and colors, carpets, curtains, and other furniture should be selected with reference to each other. Laying down carpets, blocks to prevent sofas and tables from rubbing against walls, and to hold doors open. Footstools, sweeping carpets, teals, wet Indian meal. Taking up and cleansing carpets. Washing carpets. Straw matting. Pictures and glasses. Curtains and sofas. 
mahogany furniture, unvarnished furniture, mixtures for hearths and jams, sweeping and dusting parlors, 302 chapter 30 on the care of breakfast and dining rooms. Large closet necessary, dumb waiter, or sliding closet, furniture for a table, on setting a table, rules for doing it properly, semicolon for breakfast and tea, for dinner, on waiting at table, on carving and helping at table, 306 Chapter 31 On the care of chambers and bedrooms. Importance of well ventilated sleeping rooms. Debility and ill health caused by a want of pure air. Chamber furniture. Cheap couch. Bedding. Feathers, straw, or hair. Mattresses. To make a bed. Domestics should be provided with single beds, and washing conveniences. On packing and storing articles. To fold a gentleman's coat and shirt, and a frock. Packing trunks. Carpet bags. Bonnet covers. Packing household furniture for moving. 311 Chapter 32 On the care of the kitchen, cellar, and storeroom. Importance of a convenient kitchen. Floor should be painted. Sink and drain. Washing dishes. Conveniences needed. Rules. Kitchen furniture. Crockery. Ironware, tinware, woodenware, basketware, other articles, on the care of the cellar, storeroom, modes of destroying insects and vermin, 317 chapter 33 on sewing, cutting, and mending. Importance of young girls being taught various kinds of stitching, directions for doing various kinds of work, work baskets, and their contents. On cutting and fitting garments, silks, cotton and linen, old silk dresses quilted for skirts, flannel, white should be colored, children's flannels, nightgowns, wrappers, bedding, mending, 324 chapter 34 on the care of yards and gardens. On the preparation of soil, for pot plants, on the preparation of a hot bed, planting flower seeds, to plant garden seeds, transplanting, to reap hothouse plants, on laying out yards, gardens, flower beds, bulbs and tuberous roots, list of various kinds of flowers, in reference to color, and height, annuals, climbing plants, perennials, herbaceous roots, shrubs, list of those most suitable for adorning a yard, roses, Varieties of shade trees, time for transplanting trees, care of house plants, 331 chapter 35 on the propagation of plants. Different modes of propagation semicolon by offsets, cuttings, layers, budding, or inoculating, ingrafting semicolon whip grafting, split grafting, stock grafting, pruning, thinning. 341 Chapter 36 On the Cultivation of Fruit. Value of attention to this subject. Preparation of soil. Planting of seeds. Budding, grafting, and transplanting. Training the limbs. Attention to the soil. Manuring. Filberts. Figs. Currants. Gooseberries. Raspberries. Strawberries. Grapes. To preserve fruit. Modes of preserving fruit trees. Fire blight. Worms. 347 Chapter 37 Miscellaneous Directions. Women should know how to take proper care of domestic animals. Care of a horse. Care of a cow. Poultry. Cautions for winter. Smoky chimneys. House cleaning. Parties. Invitations. Comfort of guests. Flower baskets. Fireboards. Waterproof shoes, earthenware, cements, and C. and C. 351 note. Dot cooking, 354 glossary, 355 index, 371 list of engravings. Dot 1. The human skeleton, showing the connection of the bones of the system, 702, 3, 4. The cervical, dorsal, and lumbar vertebra, 
725. Muscles of the arm, 746. Vertical section of the skull and spinal column, side view, 777. View of the same as seen from behind, 778. Ramifications of the nerves, 799, 10, 11. Natural and distorted spines, 8112. Vascular system, or blood vessels, 8213. The two sides of the heart, separated, 8514. The heart, with its two sides united, as in nature, 8615. The heart, with the great blood vessels, on a larger scale, 8716. Organs of digestion and respiration, 8817. Elevation of a cottage of fine proportions, 26218. Ground plan of the same, 26219. Arrangement of one side of a room 26320. Fireplace and mantelpiece, 26521. Elevation of a cottage on a different plan from the former, 26522. Ground plan of the same, 26623, 24. Ground plan and second story of a two story cottage, 26725. Front elevation of the latter cottage, 26826. Front elevation, on a different plan, 26827, 28. Plans of first and second stories of the latter elevation, 26929, 30. Plans of first and second stories of a larger house, 27031. Front elevation of a very convenient cottage, 27132. Ground plan of the same, 27233. Cottage of Daniel Wadsworth, Esquire, near Hartford, Connecticut, 27434. Accommodations for securing water with the least labor, 27535. Backdoor accommodations, 27636. Latticed portico, 27737. Sliding closet, or dumb waiter. 27,838. Cheap couch, 31,239. Plan of a flower bed, 33,440. Budding, 34,341. Grafting, 34,442. Stock grafting, 345. Domestic economy. Chapter 1. The peculiar responsibilities of American women. There are some reasons why American women should feel an interest in the support of the democratic institutions of their country, which it is important that they should consider. The great maxim, which is the basis of all our civil and political institutions, is that all men are created equal, and that they are equally entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But it can readily be seen that this is only another mode of expressing the fundamental principle which the great ruler of the universe has established, as the law of his eternal government. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, and whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, are the scripture forms, by which the supreme lawgiver requires that each individual of our race shall regard the happiness of others, as of the same value as his own, and which forbid any institution in private or civil life, which secures advantages to one class, by sacrificing the interests of another. The principles of democracy, then, are identical with the principles of Christianity. But, in order that each individual may pursue and secure the highest degree of happiness within his reach, unimpeded by the selfish interests of others, a system of laws must be established, which sustain certain relations and dependencies in social and civil life. What these relations and their attending obligations shall be, are to be determined, not with reference to the wishes and interests of a few, 
but solely with reference to the general good of all, so that each individual shall have his own interest, as well as the public benefit, secured by them. For this purpose, it is needful that certain relations be sustained, which involve the duties of subordination. There must be the magistrate and the subject, one of whom is the superior, and the other the inferior. There must be the relations of husband and wife, parent and child, teacher and pupil, employer and employed, each involving the relative duties of subordination. The superior, in certain particulars, is to direct, and the inferior is to yield obedience. Society could never go forward, harmoniously, nor could any craft or profession be successfully pursued, unless these superior and subordinate relations be instituted and sustained. But who shall take the higher, and who the subordinate, stations in social and civil life? This matter, in the case of parents and children, is decided by the Creator. He has given children to the control of parents, as their superiors, and to them they remain subordinate, to a certain age or so long as they are members of their household. And parents can delegate such a portion of their authority to teachers and employers, as the interests of their children require. In most other cases, in a truly democratic state, each individual is allowed to choose for himself, who shall take the position of his superior. No woman is forced to obey any husband but the one she chooses for herself, nor is she obliged to take a husband if she prefers to remain single. So every domestic, and every artisan or laborer, after passing from parental control, can choose the employer to whom he is to accord obedience, or, if he prefers to relinquish certain advantages, he can remain without taking a subordinate place to any employer. Each subject, also, has equal power with every other, to decide who shall be his superior as a ruler. The weakest, the poorest, the most illiterate, has the same opportunity to determine this question, as the richest, the most learned, and the most exalted dot and the various privileges that wealth secures, are equally open to all classes. Every man may aim at riches, unimpeded by any law or institution which secures peculiar privileges to a favored class, at the expense of another. Every law, and every institution, is tested by examining whether it secures equal advantages to all, and, if the people become convinced that any regulation sacrifices the good of the majority to the interests of the smaller number, they have power to abolish it. The institutions of monarchical and aristocratic nations are based on precisely opposite principles. They secure, to certain small and favored classes, advantages, which can be maintained, only by sacrificing the interests of the great mass of the people. Thus, the throne and aristocracy of England are supported by laws and customs, which burden the lower classes with taxes, so enormous, as to deprive them of all the luxuries, and of most of the comforts, of life. Poor dwellings, scanty food, unhealthy employments, excessive labor, and entire destitution of the means and time for education are appointed for the lower classes, that a few may live in palaces, and riot in every indulgence. The tendencies of democratic institutions, in reference to the rights and interests of the female sex, have been fully developed in the United States, and it is in this aspect, that the subject is one of peculiar interest to American women. In this country, it is established, both by opinion and by practice, that woman has an equal interest in all social and civil concerns, and that no domestic, civil, or political, institution, is right, which sacrifices her interest to promote that of the other sex. But in order to secure her there more firmly in all these privileges, it is decided, that, in the domestic relation, she take a subordinate station, and that, in civil and political concerns, her interests be entrusted to the other sex, without her taking any part in voting, or in making and administering laws. The result of this order of things has been fairly tested, and is thus portrayed by M. de Tocqueville, a writer, who, for intelligence, fidelity, and ability, ranks second to none. There are people in Europe, who, confounding together the different characteristics of the sexes, would make of man and woman, 
beings not only equal, but alike. They would give to both the same functions, impose on both the same duties, and grant to both the same rights. They would mix them in all things, comma, their business, their occupations, their pleasures. It may readily be conceived that, by thus attempting to make one sex equal to the other, both are degraded, and, from so preposterous a medley of the works of nature, nothing could ever result, but weak men and disorderly women. It is not thus that the Americans understand the species of democratic equality, which may be established between the sexes. They admit, that, as nature has appointed such wide differences between the physical and moral constitutions of man and woman, her manifest design was, to give a distinct employment to their various faculties, and they hold, that improvement does not consist in making beings so dissimilar do pretty nearly the same things, but in getting each of them to fulfill their respective tasks, in the best possible manner. The Americans have applied to the sexes the great principle of political economy, which governs the manufactories of our age, by carefully dividing the duties of man from those of woman, in order that the great work of society may be the better carried on. In no country has such constant care been taken, as in America, to trace two clearly distinct lines of action for the two sexes, and to make them keep pace one with the other, but in two pathways which are always different. American women never manage the outward concerns of the family, or conduct a business, or take a part in political life, nor are they, on the other hand, ever compelled to perform the rough labor of the fields, or to make any of those laborious exertions, which demand the exertion of physical strength. No families are so poor, as to form an exception to this rule. If, on the one hand, an American woman cannot escape from the quiet circle of domestic employments, on the other hand, she is never forced to go beyond it. Hence it is, that the women of America, who often exhibit a masculine strength of understanding, and a manly energy, generally preserve great delicacy of personal appearance, and always retain the manners of women, although they sometimes show that they have the hearts and minds of men. Nor have the Americans ever supposed, that one consequence of democratic principles, is, the subversion of marital power, or the confusion of the natural authorities in families. They hold, that every association must have a head, in order to accomplish its object, and that the natural head of the conjugal association is man. They do not, therefore, deny him the right of directing his partner, and they maintain, that, in the smaller association of husband and wife, as well as in the great social community, the object of democracy is, to regulate and legalize the powers which are necessary, not to subvert all power. This opinion is not peculiar to one sex, and contested by the other. I never observed, that the women of America considered conjugal authority as a fortunate usurpation of their rights, nor that they thought themselves degraded by submitting to it. It appears to me, on the contrary, that they attach a sort of pride to the voluntary surrender of their own will, and make it their boast to bend themselves to the yoke, not to shake it off. Such, at least, is the feeling expressed by the most virtuous of their sex, the others are silent, and in the United States it is not the practice for a guilty wife to clamor for the rights of woman, while she is trampling on her holiest duties. Although the travelers, who have visited North America, differ on a great number of points, they agree in remarking, that morals are far more strict, there, than elsewhere. a. It is evident that, on this point, the Americans are very superior to their progenitors, the English. In England, as in all other countries of Europe, public malice is constantly attacking the frailties of women. Philosophers and statesmen are heard to deplore, that morals are not sufficiently strict and the literary productions of the country constantly lead one to suppose so. In America, all books, novels not accepted, suppose women to be chaste, and no one thinks of relating affairs of gallantry. It has often been remarked, that, in Europe, a certain degree of contempt lurks, even in the flattery which men lavish upon women. Although a European frequently affects to be the slave of woman, it may be seen that he never sincerely thinks her his equal. In the United States, 
Men seldom compliment women, but they daily show how much they esteem them. They constantly display an entire confidence in the understanding of a wife, and a profound respect for her freedom. They have decided that her mind is just as fitted as that of a man to discover the plain truth, and her heart is firm to embrace it, and they have never sought to place her virtue, any more than his, under the shelter of prejudice, ignorance, and fear. It would seem, that in Europe, where man so easily submits to the despotic sway of woman, they are nevertheless curtailed of some of the greatest qualities of the human species, and considered as seductive, but imperfect beings, and, what may well provoke astonishment, women ultimately look upon themselves in the same light, and almost consider it as a privilege that they are entitled to show themselves futile, feeble, and timid. The women of America claim no such privileges. It is true, that the Americans rarely lavish upon women those eager attentions which are commonly paid them in Europe. But their conduct to women always implies, that they suppose them to be virtuous and refined, and such is the respect entertained for the moral freedom of the sex, that, in the presence of a woman, the most guarded language is used, lest her ear should be offended by an expression. In America, a young unmarried woman may, alone, and without fear, undertake a long journey. Thus the Americans do not think that man and woman have either the duty, or the right, to perform the same offices, but they show an equal regard for both their respective parts, and, though their lot is different, they consider both of them, as beings of equal value. They do not give to the courage of woman the same form, or the same direction, as to that of man, but they never doubt her courage, and if they hold that man and his partner ought not always to exercise their intellect and understanding in the same manner, they at least believe the understanding of the one to be as sound as that of the other, and her intellect to be as clear. Thus, then, while they have allowed the social inferiority of woman to subsist, they have done all they could to raise her. morally and intellectually, to the level of man, and, in this respect, they appear to me to have excellently understood the true principle of democratic improvement. As for myself, I do not hesitate to avow, that, although the women of the United States are confined within the narrow circle of domestic life, and their situation is, in some respects, one of extreme dependence, I have nowhere seen women occupying a loftier position, and if I were asked, now I am drawing to the close of this work, in which I have spoken of so many important things done by the Americans, to what the singular prosperity and growing strength of that people ought mainly to be attributed, I should reply comma to the superiority of their women. This testimony of a foreigner, who has had abundant opportunities of making a comparison, is sanctioned by the assent of all candid and intelligent men, who have enjoyed similar opportunities dot it appears, then, that it is in America, alone, that women are raised to an equality with the other sex, and that, both in theory and practice, their interests are regarded as of equal value. They are made subordinate in station, only where a regard to their best interests demands it, while, as if in compensation for this, by custom and courtesy, they are always treated as superiors. Universally, in this country, through every class of society, precedence is given to woman, in all the comforts, conveniences, and courtesies, of life. In civil and political affairs, American women take no interest or concern, except so far as they sympathize with their family and personal friends, but in all cases, in which they do feel a concern, their opinions and feelings have a consideration, equal, or even superior, to that of the other sex. In matters pertaining to the education of their children, in the selection and support of a clergyman, in all benevolent enterprises, and in all questions relating to morals or manners, they have a superior influence. In such concerns, it would be impossible to carry a point, contrary to their judgment and feelings, while an enterprise, sustained by them, will seldom fail of success. If those who are bewailing themselves over the fancied wrongs and injuries of women in this nation, could only see things as they are, they would know, that, 
whatever remnants of a barbarous or aristocratic age may remain in our civil institutions, in reference to the interests of women, it is only because they are ignorant of them, or do not use their influence to have them rectified, for it is very certain that there is nothing reasonable, which American women would unite in asking, that would not readily be bestowed. The preceding remarks, then, illustrate the position, that the democratic institutions of this country are in reality no other than the principles of Christianity carried into operation, and that they tend to place woman in her true position in society, as having equal rights with the other sex, and that, in fact, they have secured to American women a lofty and fortunate position, which, as yet, has been attained by the women of no other nation. There is another topic, presented in the work of the above author, which demands the profound attention of American women. The following is taken from that part of the introduction to the work, illustrating the position that, for ages, there has been a constant progress, in all civilized nations, towards the democratic equality attained in this country. The various occurrences of national existence have everywhere turned to the advantage of democracy, all men have aided it by their exertions, those who have intentionally labored in its cause, and those who have served it unwittingly, those who have fought for it, and those who have declared themselves its opponents, have all been driven along in the same track, have all labored to one end, all have been blind instruments in the hands of God. The gradual development of the equality of conditions, is, therefore, a providential fact, and it possesses all the characteristics of a divine decree, it is universal, it is durable, it constantly eludes all human interference, and all events, as well as all men, contribute to its progress. The whole book, which is here offered to the public, has been written under the impression of a kind of religious dread, produced in the author's mind, by the contemplation of so irresistible a revolution which has advanced for centuries, in spite of such amazing obstacles, and which is still proceeding in the midst of the ruins it has made. It is not necessary that God himself should speak, in order to disclose to us the unquestionable signs of his will. We can discern them in the habitual course of nature, and in the invariable tendency of events. If the men of our time were led, by attentive observation, and by sincere reflection, to acknowledge that the gradual and progressive development of social equality is at once the past and future of their history, this solitary truth would confer the sacred character of a divine decree upon the change. To attempt to check democracy, would be, in that case, to resist the will of God, and the nations would then be constrained to make the best of the social lot awarded to them by providence. It is not, then, merely to satisfy a legitimate curiosity that I have examined America, my wish has been to find instruction by which we may ourselves profit. I have not even affected to discuss whether the social revolution, which I believe to be irresistible, is advantageous or prejudicial to mankind. I have acknowledged this revolution, as a fact already accomplished, or on the eve of its accomplishment, and I have selected the nation, from among those which have undergone it, in which its development has been the most peaceful and the most complete, in order to discern its natural consequences, and, if it be possible, to distinguish the means by which it may be rendered profitable. I confess, that in America I saw more than America, I sought the image of democracy itself, with its inclinations, its character, its prejudices, and its passions, in order to learn what we have to fear, or to hope, from its progress. It thus appears, that the sublime and elevating anticipations which have filled the mind and heart of the religious world, have become so far developed, that philosophers and statesmen are perceiving the signs, and are predicting the approach, of the same grand consummation. There is a day advancing, by seers predicted, and by poets sung, when the curse of selfishness shall be removed, when scenes surpassing fable, and yet true, shall be realized, when all nations shall rejoice and be made blessed, under those benevolent influences, which the Messiah came to establish on earth. And this is the country, which the disposer of events designs shall go forth as the sinusure of nations, to guide them to the light and blessedness of that day. To us is committed the grand, the responsible privilege, of exhibiting to the world, 
the beneficent influences of Christianity, when carried into every social, civil, and political institution, and, though we have, as yet, made such imperfect advances, already the light is streaming into the dark prison house of despotic lands, while startled kings and sages, philosophers and statesmen, are watching us with that interest, which a career so illustrious, and so involving their own destiny, is calculated to excite. They are studying our institutions, scrutinizing our experience, and watching for our mistakes, that they may learn whether a social revolution, so irresistible, be advantageous or prejudicial to mankind. There are persons, who regard these interesting truths merely as food for national vanity, but every reflecting and Christian mind, must consider it as an occasion for solemn and anxious reflection. Are we, then, a spectacle to the world? Has the eternal lawgiver appointed us to work out a problem, involving the destiny of the whole earth? Are such momentous interests to be advanced or retarded, just in proportion as we are faithful to our high trust? What manner of persons, then, ought we to be, in attempting to sustain so solemn, so glorious a responsibility? But the part to be enacted by American women, in this great moral enterprise, is the point to which special attention should here be directed. The success of democratic institutions, as is conceded by all, depends upon the intellectual and moral character of the mass of the people. If they are intelligent and virtuous, democracy is a blessing, but if they are ignorant and wicked, it is only a curse, and as much more dreadful than any other form of civil government, as a thousand tyrants are more to be dreaded than one. It is equally conceded that the formation of the moral and intellectual character of the young is committed mainly to the female hand. The mother forms the character of the future man, the sister bends the fibers that are hereafter to be the forest tree, the wife sways the heart, whose energies may turn for good or for evil the destinies of a nation. Let the women of a country be made virtuous and intelligent, and the men will certainly be the same. The proper education of a man decides the welfare of an individual but educate a woman, and the interests of a whole family are secured. If this be so, as none will deny, then to American women, more than to any others on earth, is committed the exalted privilege of extending over the world those blessed influences, which are to renovate degraded man, and clothe all climes with beauty. No American woman, then, has any occasion for feeling that hers is an humble or insignificant lot. The value of what an individual accomplishes, is to be estimated by the importance of the enterprise achieved, and not by the particular position of the laborer. The drops of heaven which freshen the earth, are each of equal value, whether they fall in the lowland meadow, or the princely parterre. The builders of a temple are of equal importance, whether they labor on the foundations, or toil upon the dome. Thus, also, with those labors which are to be made effectual in the regeneration of the earth. And it is by forming a habit of regarding the apparently insignificant efforts of each isolated laborer, in a comprehensive manner, as indispensable portions of a grand result, that the minds of all, however humble their sphere of service, can be invigorated and cheered. The woman, who is rearing a family of children, the woman, who labors in the schoolroom, the woman, who, in her retired chamber, earns, with her needle, the might, which contributes to the intellectual and moral elevation of her country, even the humble domestic, whose example and influence may be molding and forming young minds, while her faithful services sustain a prosperous domestic state semicolon each and all may be animated by the consciousness, that they are agents in accomplishing the greatest work that ever was committed to human responsibility. It is the building of a glorious temple, whose base shall be coextensive with the bounds of the earth, whose summit shall pierce the skies, whose splendor shall be mon all lands, and those who hew the lowliest stone, as much as those who carve the highest capital, will be equally honored, when its top stone shall be laid, with new rejoicings of the morning stars, and shoutings of the sons of God. Footnote, a. Miss Martin is a singular exception to this remark. After receiving unexampled hospitalities and kindnesses, she gives the following picture of her entertainers. 
having in other places spoken of the American woman as having her intellect confined, and her morals crushed, and as deficient in education, because she has none of the objects in life for which an enlarged education is considered requisite, she says, it is assumed, in America, particularly in New England, that the morals of society there are peculiarly pure. I am grieved to doubt the fact, but I do doubt it. The old Robin Gray story is a frequently enacted tragedy here, and one of the worst symptoms that struck me, was, that there was usually a demand upon my sympathy in such cases. The unavoidable consequence of such a mode of marrying, is, that the sanctity of marriage is impaired, and that vice succeeds. There are sad tales in country villages, here and there, that attest this, and yet more in towns, in a rank of society where such things are seldom or never heard of in England. I unavoidably knew of more cases of lapse in highly respectable families in one state, than never came to my knowledge at home, and they were got over with a disgrace far more temporary and superficial than they could have been visited with in England. The vacuity of mind of many women, is, I conclude, the cause of a vice, which it is painful to allude to, but which cannot honestly be passed over. It is no secret on the spot, that the habit of intemperance is not infrequent among women of station and education in the most enlightened parts of the country. I witnessed some instances, and heard of more. It does not seem to me to be regarded with all the dismay which such a symptom ought to excite. To the stranger, a novelty so horrible, a spectacle so fearful, suggests wide and deep subjects of investigation. It is not possible for language to give representations more false in every item. In evidence of this, the writer would mention, that, within the last few years, she has travelled almost the entire route taken by Miss Martina, except the lower tier of the southern states, and, though not meeting the same individuals has mingled in the very same circles. Moreover, she has resided from several months to several years in eight of the different northern and western states, and spent several weeks at a time in five other states. She has also had pupils from every state in the Union, but two, and has visited extensively at their houses. But in her whole life, and in all these different positions, the writer has never, to her knowledge, seen even one woman, of the classes with which she has associated, who had lapsed in the manner indicated by Miss Martina, nor does she believe that such a woman could find admission in such circles anywhere in the country. As to intemperate women, five cases are all of whom the writer has ever heard, in such circles, and two of these many believe to be unwarrantably suspected. After following in Miss Martina's track, and discovering all the falsehood, twaddle, gossip, old sores, and almanac stories, which have been strung together in her books, no charitable mode of accounting for the medley remains, but to suppose her the pitiable dupe of that love of hoaxing so often found in our country. Again, Miss Martina says, we passed an unshaded meadow, where the grass had caught fire, every day, at eleven o'clock, the preceding summer. This demonstrates the necessity of shade. A woman, with so little common sense, as to swallow such an absurdity for truth, and then tack to it such an astute deduction, must be a tempting subject for the above-mentioned mischievous propensity. Chapter 2. Difficulties Peculiar to American Women. In the preceding chapter, were presented those views, which are calculated to inspire American women with a sense of their high responsibilities to their country, and to the world and of the excellence and grandeur of the object to which their energies may be consecrated. But it will be found to be the law of moral action, that whatever involves great results and great benefits, is always attended with great hazards and difficulties. And as it has been shown, that American women have a loftier position, and a more elevated object of enterprise, than the females of any other nation, so it will appear, that they have greater trials and difficulties to overcome than any other women are called to encounter. Properly to appreciate the nature of these trials, it must be borne in mind, that the estimate of evils and privations depends, not so much on their positive nature, as on the character and habits of the person who meets them. A woman, educated in the savage state, 
finds it no trial to be destitute of many conveniences, which a woman, even of the lowest condition, in this country, would deem indispensable to existence. So a woman, educated with the tastes and habits of the best New England or Virginia housekeepers, would encounter many deprivations and trials, which would never occur to one reared in the log cabin of a new settlement. So, also, a woman, who has been accustomed to carry forward her arrangements with well-trained domestics, would meet a thousand trials to her feelings and temper, by the substitution of ignorant foreigners, or shiftless slaves, which would be of little account to one who had never enjoyed any better service. Now, the larger portion of American women are the descendants of English progenitors, who, as a nation, are distinguished for systematic housekeeping, and for a great love of order, cleanliness, and comfort. And American women, to a greater or less extent, have inherited similar tastes and habits. But the prosperity and democratic tendencies of this country produce results, materially affecting the comfort of housekeepers, which the females of monarchical and aristocratic lands are not called to meet. In such countries, all ranks and classes are fixed in a given position, and each person is educated for a particular sphere and style of living. And the dwellings, conveniences, and customs of life, remain very nearly the same, from generation to generation. This secures the preparation of all classes for their particular station, and makes the lower orders more dependent, and more subservient to employers. But how different is the state of things in this country? Everything is moving and changing. Persons in poverty are rising to opulence, and persons of wealth are sinking to poverty. The children of common laborers, by their talents and enterprise, are becoming nobles in intellect, or wealth, or office, while the children of the wealthy, enervated by indulgence, are sinking to humbler stations. The sons of the wealthy are leaving the rich mansions of their fathers, to dwell in the log cabins of the forest, where very soon they bear away the daughters of ease and refinement, to share the privations of a new settlement. Meantime, even in the more stationary portions of the community, there is a mingling of all grades of wealth, intellect, and education. There are no distinct classes, as in aristocratic lands, whose bounds are protected by distinct and impassable lines, but all are thrown into promiscuous masses. Thus, persons of humble means are brought into contact with those of vast wealth, while all intervening grades are placed side by side. Thus, too, there is a constant comparison of conditions, among equals, and a constant temptation presented to imitate the customs, and to strive for the enjoyments, of those who possess larger means. In addition to this, the flow of wealth, among all classes, is constantly increasing the number of those who live in a style demanding much hired service, while the number of those, who are compelled to go to service, is constantly diminishing. Our manufactories, also, are making increased demands for female labor, and offering larger compensation. In consequence of these things, there is such a disproportion between those who wish to hire, and those who are willing to go to domestic service, that, in the non-slaveholding states, were it not for the supply of poverty-stricken foreigners, there would not be a domestic for each family who demands one. And this resort to foreigners, poor as it is, scarcely meets the demand, while the disproportion must every year increase, especially if our prosperity increases. For, just in proportion as wealth rolls in upon us, the number of those, who will give up their own independent homes to serve strangers, will be diminished. The difficulties and sufferings, which have accrued to American women, from this cause, are almost incalculable. There is nothing which so much demands system and regularity, as the affairs of a housekeeper, made up, as they are, of ten thousand desultory and minute items, and yet, this perpetually fluctuating state of society seems forever to bar any such system and regularity. The anxieties, vexations, perplexities, and even hard labor, which come upon American women, from this state of domestic service, are endless and many a woman has, in consequence, been disheartened, discouraged, and ruined in health.
The only wonder is, that, amid so many real difficulties, American women are still able to maintain such a character for energy, fortitude, and amiableness, as is universally allowed to be their due. But the second, and still greater difficulty, peculiar to American women, is, a delicacy of constitution, which renders them early victims to disease and decay. The fact that the women of this country are unusually subject to disease, and that their beauty and youthfulness are of shorter continuance than those of the women of other nations, is one which always attracts the attention of foreigners, while medical men and philanthropists are constantly giving fearful monitions as to the extent and alarming increase of this evil. Investigations make it evident, that a large proportion of young ladies, from the wealthier classes, have the incipient stages of curvature of the spine, one of the most sure and fruitful causes of future disease and decay. The writer has heard medical men, who have made extensive inquiries, say, that a very large proportion of the young women at boarding schools, are affected in this way, while many other indications of disease and debility exist in cases where this particular evil cannot be detected. In consequence of this enfeebled state of their constitutions, induced by a neglect of their physical education, as soon as they are called to the responsibilities and trials of domestic life, their constitution fails, and their whole existence is rendered a burden. For no woman can enjoy existence, when disease throws a dark cloud over the mind and incapacitates her for the proper discharge of every duty. The writer, who for some ten years has had the charge of an institution, consisting of young ladies from almost every state in the Union, since relinquishing that charge, has traveled and visited extensively in most of the non-slaveholding states. In these circuits, she has learned the domestic history, not merely of her pupils, but of many other young wives and mothers whose sorrowful experience has come to her knowledge. And the impression, produced by the dreadful extent of this evil, has at times been almost overwhelming. It would seem as if the primeval curse, which has written the doom of pain and sorrow on one period of a young mother's life, in this country had been extended over all, so that the hour seldom arrives, when she forgetteth her sorrow for joy that a man is born into the world. Many a mother will testify, with shuddering that the most exquisite sufferings she ever endured, were not those appointed by nature, but those, which, for week after week, have worn down health and spirits, when nourishing her child. And medical men teach us, that this, in most cases, results from a debility of constitution, consequent on the mismanagement of early life. And so frequent and so mournful are these, and the other distresses that result from the delicacy of the female constitution, that the writer has repeatedly heard mothers say, that they had wept tears of bitterness over their infant daughters, at the thought of the sufferings which they were destined to undergo, while they cherished the decided wish, that these daughters should never marry. At the same time, many a reflecting young woman is looking to her future prospects, with very different feelings and hopes from those which Providence designed. A perfectly healthy woman, especially a perfectly healthy mother, is so unfrequent, in some of the wealthier classes, that those, who are so, may be regarded as the exceptions, and not as the general rule. The writer has heard some of her friends declare, that they would ride fifty miles, to see a perfectly healthy and vigorous woman, out of the labouring classes. This, although somewhat jocose, was not an entirely unfair picture of the true state of female health in the wealthier classes. There are many causes operating, which serve to perpetuate and increase this evil. It is a well-known fact, that mental excitement tends to weaken the physical system, unless it is counterbalanced by a corresponding increase of exercise and fresh air. Now, the people of this country are under the influence of high commercial, political, and religious stimulus, altogether greater than was ever known by any other nation, and in all this, women are made the sympathizing companions of the other sex. At the same time, young girls, in pursuing an education, have ten times greater an amount of intellectual taxation demanded, than was ever before exacted. Let any daughter, educated in our best schools at this day, compare the course of her study with that pursued in her mother's early life 
and it will be seen that this estimate of the increase of mental taxation probably falls below the truth. Though, in some countries, there are small classes of females, in the higher circles, who pursue literature and science to a far greater extent than in any corresponding circles in this country, yet, in no nation in the world are the advantages of a good intellectual education enjoyed, by so large a proportion of the females. And this education has consisted far less of accomplishments, and far more of those solid studies which demand the exercise of the various powers of mind, than the education of the women of other lands. And when American women are called to the responsibilities of domestic life, the degree in which their minds and feelings are taxed, is altogether greater than it is in any other nation. No women on earth have a higher sense of their moral and religious responsibilities, or better understand, not only what is demanded of them, as housekeepers, but all the claims that rest upon them as wives, mothers, and members of a social community. An American woman, who is the mistress of a family, feels her obligations, in reference to her influence over her husband and a still greater responsibility in rearing and educating her children. She feels, too, the claims which the moral interests of her domestics have on her watchful care. In social life, she recognizes the claims of hospitality, and the demands of friendly visiting. Her responsibility, in reference to the institutions of benevolence and religion, is deeply realized. The regular worship of the Lord's Day and all the various religious meetings and benevolent societies which place so much dependence on female influence and example. She feels obligated to sustain. Add to these multiplied responsibilities, the perplexities and evils which have been pointed out, resulting from the fluctuating state of society, and the deficiency of domestic service, and no one can deny that American women are exposed to a far greater amount of intellectual and moral excitement, than those of any other land. Of course, in order to escape the danger resulting from this, a greater amount of exercise in the fresh air, and all those methods which strengthen the constitution, are imperiously required. But, instead of this, it will be found, that, owing to the climate and customs of this nation, there are no women who secure so little of this healthful and protecting regimen, as ours. Walking and riding and gardening, in the open air, are practiced by the women of other lands, to a far greater extent, than by American females. Most English women, in the wealthier classes, are able to walk six and eight miles, without oppressive fatigue, and when they visit this country, always express their surprise at the inactive habits of American ladies. In England, regular exercise, in the open air, is very commonly required by the mother, as a part of daily duty, and is sought by young women, as an enjoyment. In consequence of a different physical training, English women, in those circles which enjoy competency, present an appearance which always strikes American gentlemen as a contrast to what they see at home. An English mother, at thirty, or thirty-five, is in the full bloom of perfected womanhood, as fresh and healthful as her daughters. But where are the American mothers, who can reach this period unfaded and unworn? In America, young ladies of the wealthier classes are sent to school from early childhood, and neither parents nor teachers make it a definite object to secure a proper amount of fresh air and exercise, to counterbalance this intellectual taxation. As soon as their school days are over, dressing, visiting, evening parties, and stimulating amusements, take the place of study, while the most unhealthful modes of dress add to the physical exposures. To make morning calls, or do a little shopping, is all that can be termed their exercise in the fresh air, and this, compared to what is needed, is absolutely nothing, and on some accounts is worse than nothing. B. In consequence of these, and other evils, which will be pointed out more at large in the following pages, the young women of America grow up with such a delicacy of constitution, that probably eight out of ten become subjects of disease, either before or as soon as they are called to the responsibilities of domestic life. But there is one peculiarity of situation, 
in regard to American women, which makes this delicacy of constitution still more disastrous. It is the liability to the exposures and hardships of a newly settled country. One more extract from de Tocqueville will give a view of this part of the subject, which anyone, familiar with Western life, will admire for its verisimilitude. The same strength of purpose which the young wives of America display in bending themselves, at once, and without repining, to the austere duties of their new condition, is no less manifest in all the great trials of their lives. In no country in the world, are private fortunes more precarious, than in the United States. It is not uncommon for the same man, in the course of his life, to rise and sink again through all the grades which lead from opulence to poverty. American women support these vicissitudes with a calm and unquenchable energy. It would seem that their desires contract, as easily as they expand, with their fortunes. The greater part of the adventurers, who migrate, every year, to people the western wilds, belong to the old Anglo-American race of the northern states. Many of these men, who rush so boldly onward in pursuit of wealth, were already in the enjoyment of a competency in their own part of the country. They take their wives along with them, and make them share the countless perils and privations, which always attend the commencement of these expeditions. I have often met, even on the verge of the wilderness, with young women, who, after having been brought up amid all the comforts of the large towns of New England, had passed, almost without any intermediate stage, from the wealthy abode of their parents, to a comfortless hovel in a forest. Fever, solitude, and a tedious life, had not broken the springs of their courage. Their features were impaired and faded, but their looks were firm, they appeared to be, at once, sad and resolute. In another passage, he gives this picturesque sketch, by the side of the hearth, sits a woman, with a baby on her lap. She nods to us, without disturbing herself. Like the pioneer, this woman is in the prime of life, her appearance would seem superior to her condition, and her apparel even betrays a lingering taste for dress. But her delicate limbs appear shrunken, her features are drawn in, her eye is mild and melancholy. Her whole physiognomy bears marks of a degree of religious resignation, a deep quiet of all passion, and some sort of natural and tranquil firmness, ready to meet all the ills of life, without fearing and without braving them. Her children cluster about her, full of health, turbulence, and energy, they are true children of the wilderness, their mother watches them, from time to time, with mingled melancholy and joy. To look at their strength and her languor, one might imagine that the life she had given them had exhausted her own, and still she regrets not what they have cost her. The house, inhabited by these emigrants, has no internal partition all oft. In the one chamber of which it consists, the whole family is gathered for the night. The dwelling is itself a little world, an ark of civilization amid an ocean of foliage. A hundred steps beyond it, the primeval forest spreads its shades, and solitude resumes its sway. Such scenes, and such women, the writer has met, and few persons realize how many refined and lovely women are scattered over the broad prairies and deep forests of the West, and none, but the far there above, appreciates the extent of those sacrifices and sufferings, and the value of that firm faith and religious hope, which live, in perennial bloom, amid those vast solitudes. If the American women of the East merit the palm, for their skill and success as accomplished housekeepers, still more is due to the heroines of the West, who, with such unyielding fortitude and cheerful endurance, attempt similar duties, amid so many disadvantages and deprivations. But, though American women have those elevated principles and feelings, which enable them to meet such trials in so exemplary a manner, their physical energies are not equal to the exertions demanded. Though the mind may be bright and firm, the casket is shivered, though the spirit may be willing, the flesh is weak. A woman of firm health, with the hope and elasticity of youth, may be envied rather than pitied, as she shares with her young husband the hopes and enterprises of pioneer life. But, when the body fails, then the eye of hope grows dim, the heart sickens, 
the courage dies, and, in solitude, weariness, and suffering, the wanderer pines for the dear voices and the tender sympathies of a far distant home. Then it is, that the darkest shade is presented, which marks the peculiar trials and liabilities of American women, and which exhibits still more forcibly the disastrous results of that delicacy of constitution which has been pointed out. For, though all American women, or even the greater part of them, are not called to encounter such trials, yet no mother, who rears a family of daughters, can say, that such a lot will not fall to one of her flock, nor can she know which will escape. The reverse is a fortune, and the chances of matrimony, expose every woman in the nation to such liabilities, for which she needs to be prepared. Footnote, B, so little idea have most ladies, in the wealthier classes, of what is a proper amount of exercise, that, if they should succeed in walking a mile or so, at a moderate pace, three or four times a week, they would call it taking a great deal of exercise. Chapter 3 Remedies for the preceding difficulties. Having pointed out the peculiar responsibilities of American women, and the peculiar embarrassments which they are called to encounter, the following suggestions are offered as remedies for such difficulties. In the first place, the physical and domestic education of daughters should occupy the principal attention of mothers in childhood, and the stimulation of the intellect should be very much reduced. As a general rule, Daughters should not be sent to school before they are six years old, and, when they are sent, far more attention should be paid to their physical development, than is usually done. They should never be confined, at any employment, more than an hour at a time, and this confinement should be followed by sports in the open air. Such accommodations should be secured, that, at all seasons, and in all weathers, the teacher can every half hour send out a portion of her school, for sports. And still more care should be given to preserve pure air in the schoolroom. The close stoves, crowded condition, and poisonous air, of most schoolrooms, act as constant drains on the health and strength of young children. In addition to this, much less time should be given to school, and much more to domestic employments, especially in the wealthier classes. A little girl may begin, at five or six years of age, to assist her mother, and, if properly trained, by the time she is ten, she can render essential aid. From this time, until she is fourteen or fifteen, it should be the principal object of her education to secure a strong and healthy constitution, and a thorough practical knowledge of all kinds of domestic employments. During this period, Though some attention ought to be paid to intellectual culture, it ought to be made altogether secondary in importance, and such a measure of study and intellectual excitement, as is now demanded in our best female seminaries, ought never to be allowed, until a young lady has passed the most critical period of her youth, and has a vigorous and healthful constitution fully established. The plan might be adopted, of having schools for young girls kept only in the afternoon that their mornings might be occupied in domestic exercise, without interfering with school employments. Where a proper supply of domestic exercise cannot be afforded, the cultivation of flowers and fruits might be resorted to, as a delightful and unfailing promotive of pleasure and health. And it is to that class of mothers, who have the best means of securing hired service, and who are the most tempted to allow their daughters to grow up with inactive habits that their country and the world must look for a reformation, in this respect. Whatever ladies in the wealthier classes decide shall be fashionable, will be followed by all the rest, but, while they persist in the aristocratic habits, now so common, and bring up their daughters to feel as if labor was degrading and unbecoming, the evils pointed out will never find a remedy. It is, therefore, the peculiar duty of ladies, who have wealth, to set a proper example, in this particular, and make it their first aim to secure a strong and healthful constitution for their daughters, by active domestic employments. All the sweeping, dusting, care of furniture and beds, the clear starching, and the nice cooking, should be done by the daughters of a family, and not by hired servants. It may cost the mother more care, and she may find it needful to hire a person for the express purpose of instructing and superintending her daughters 
in these employments, but it should be regarded as indispensable to be secured, either by the mother's agency, or by a substitute. It is in this point of view, that the dearth of good domestics in this country may, in its results, prove a substantial blessing. If all housekeepers, who have the means, could secure good servants, there would be little hope that so important a revolution, in the domestic customs of the wealthy classes, could be effected. And so great is the natural indolence of mankind, that the amount of exercise, needful for health, will never be secured by those who are led to it through no necessity, but merely from rational considerations. Yet the pressure of domestic troubles, from the want of good domestics, has already determined many a mother, in the wealthy classes, to train her daughters to aid her in domestic service, and thus necessity is compelling mothers to do what abstract principles of expediency could never secure. A second method of promoting the same object, is, to raise the science and practice of domestic economy to its appropriate place, as a regular study in female seminaries. The succeeding chapter will present the reasons for this, more at large. But it is to the mothers of our country, that the community must look for this change. It cannot be expected, that teachers, who have their attention chiefly absorbed by the intellectual and moral interests of their pupils, should properly realize the importance of this department of education. But if mothers generally become convinced of this, their judgment and wishes will meet the respectful consideration they deserve, and the object will be accomplished. The third method of securing a remedy for the evils pointed out, is, the endowment of female institutions, under the care of suitable trustees, who shall secure a proper course of education. The importance of this measure cannot be realized by those, who have not turned their attention to this subject, and for such. The following considerations are presented. The endowment of colleges, and of law, medical, and divinity, schools, for the other sex, is designed to secure a thorough and proper education, for those who have the most important duties of society to perform. The men who are to expound the laws, the men who have the care of the public health, and the men who are to communicate religious instruction, should have well disciplined and well informed minds and it is mainly for this object that collegiate and professional institutions are established. Liberal and wealthy individuals contribute funds, and the legislatures of the states also lend assistance, so that every state in this nation has from one to twenty such endowed institutions, supplied with buildings, apparatus, a library, and a faculty of learned men to carry forward a superior course of instruction and the use of all these advantages is secured, in many cases, at an expense, no greater than is required to send a boy to a common school and pay his board there. No private school could offer these advantages, without charging such a sum, as would forbid all but the rich from securing its benefits. By furnishing such superior advantages, on low terms, multitudes are properly educated, who would otherwise remain in ignorance, and thus the professions are supplied, by men properly qualified for them. Were there no such institutions, and no regular and appropriate course of study demanded for admission to the bar, the pulpit, and to medical practice, the education of most professional men would be desultory, imperfect, and deficient. Parents and children would regulate the course of study according to their own crude notions, and, instead of having institutions which agree in carrying on a similar course of study, each school would have its own peculiar system, and compete in conflict with every other. Meantime, the public would have no means of deciding which was best, nor any opportunity for learning when a professional man was properly qualified for his duties. But as it is, the diploma of a college, and the license of an appointed body of judges, must both be secured before a young man feels that he has entered the most promising path to success in his profession. Our country, then, is most abundantly supplied with endowed institutions, which secure a liberal education, on such low terms as make them accessible to all classes, and in which the interests of education are watched over, sustained, and made permanent, by an appropriate board of trustees. But are not the most responsible of all duties committed to the charge of woman. Is it not her profession to take care of mind, body, 
and soul? And that, too, at the most critical of all periods of existence? And is it not as much a matter of public concern, that she should be properly qualified for her duties, as that ministers, lawyers, and physicians, should be prepared for theirs? And is it not as important, to endow institutions which shall make a superior education accessible to all classes, comma for females, as for the other sex? And is it not equally important, that institutions for females be under the supervision of intelligent and responsible trustees, whose duty it shall be to secure a uniform and appropriate education for one sex as much as for the other? It would seem as if every mind must accord an affirmative reply as soon as the matter is fairly considered dot as the education of females is now conducted, any man or woman who pleases, can establish a female seminary, and secure recommendations which will attract pupils. But whose business is it to see that these young females are not huddled into crowded rooms? Or that they do not sleep in ill-ventilated chambers? Or that they have healthful food? Or that they have the requisite amount of fresh air and exercise? or that they pursue an appropriate and systematic course of study, or that their manners, principles, and morals, are properly regulated. Parents either have not the means, or else are not qualified to judge, or, if they are furnished with means and capacity, they are often restricted to a choice of the best school within reach, even when it is known to be exceedingly objectionable. If the writer were to disclose all that can truly be told of boarding school life, and its influence on health, manners, disposition, intellect, and morals, the disclosure would both astonish and shock every rational mind. And yet she believes that such institutions are far better managed in this country, than in any other, and that the number of those, which are subject to imputations in these respects, is much less than could reasonably be expected. But it is most surely the case, that much remains to be done in order to supply such institutions as are needed for the proper education of American women. In attempting a sketch of the kind of institutions which are demanded, it is very fortunate that there is no necessity for presenting a theory, which may, or may not, be approved by experience. It is the greatest honor of one of our newest Western states, that it can boast of such an institution, endowed, too, wholly by the munificence of a single individual. A slight sketch of this institution, which the writer has examined in all its details, will give an idea of what can be done, by showing what has actually been accomplished. This institution C, is under the supervision of a board of trustees, who hold the property in trust for the object to which it is devoted, and who have the power to fill their own vacancies. It is furnished with a noble and tasteful building, of stone, so liberal in dimensions and arrangement, that it can accommodate ninety pupils and teachers, giving one room to every two pupils, and all being so arranged, as to admit of thorough ventilation. This building is surrounded by extensive grounds, enclosed with handsome fences, where remains of the primeval forest still offer a freshing shade for juvenile sports. To secure adequate exercise for the pupils, two methods are adopted. By the first, each young lady is required to spend a certain portion of time in domestic employments, either in sweeping, dusting, setting and clearing tables, washing and ironing, or other household concerns. Let not the aristocratic mother and daughter express their dislike of such an arrangement, till they can learn how well it succeeds. Let them walk, as the writer has done, through the large airy halls, kept clean and in order by their fair occupants to the washing and ironing rooms. That they will see a long hall, conveniently fitted up with some thirty neatly painted tubs, with a clean floor, and water conducted so as to save both labor and slopping. Let them see some thirty or forty merry girls, superintended by a motherly lady, chatting and singing, washing and starching, while every convenience is at hand, and everything around is clean and comfortable. Two hours, thus employed enable each young lady to wash the articles she used during the previous week, which is all that is demanded, while thus they are all practically initiated into the arts and mysteries of the wash tub. The superintendent remarked to the writer, that, after a few weeks of probation, 
Most of her young washers succeeded quite as well as those whom she could hire, and who made it their business. Adjacent to the washing room, is the ironing establishment, where another class are arranged, on the ironing day, around long, extended tables, with heating furnaces, clothes frames, and all needful appliances. By a systematic arrangement of school and domestic duties, a moderate portion of time, usually not exceeding two hours a day, from each of the pupils, accomplished all the domestic labor of a family of ninety, except the cooking, which was done by two hired domestics. This part of domestic labor it was deemed inexpedient to incorporate as a portion of the business of the pupils, inasmuch as it could not be accommodated to the arrangements of the school, and was in other respects objectionable. Is it asked, how can young ladies paint, play the piano? and study, when their hands and dresses must be unfitted by such drudgery? The woman who asks this question, has yet to learn that a pure and delicate skin is better secured by healthful exercise, than by any other method, and that a young lady, who will spend two hours a day at the wash tub, on with a broom, is far more likely to have rosy cheeks, a finely molded form, and a delicate skin, than one who lolls all day in her parlor or chamber or only leaves it, girt in tight dresses, to make fashionable calls. It is true, that long protracted daily labor hardens the hand, and unfits it for delicate employments, but the amount of labor needful for health produces no such effect. As to dress, and appearance, if neat and convenient accommodations are furnished, there is no occasion for the exposures which demand shabby dresses. A dark calico, genteely made, with an oiled silk apron, and wide cuffs of the same material, secures both good looks and good service. This plan of domestic employments for the pupils in this institution, not only secures regular healthful exercise, but also aids to reduce the expenses of education, so that, with the help of the endowments, it is brought within the reach of many, who otherwise could never gain such advantages. In addition to this, a system of calisthenic d exercises is introduced, which secures all the advantages which dancing is supposed to effect, and which is free from the dangerous tendencies of that fascinating and fashionable amusement. This system is so combined with music, and constantly varying evolutions, as to serve as an amusement, and also as a mode of curing distortions, particularly all tendencies to curvature of the spine, while, at the same time, it tends to promote grace of movement, and easy manners. Another advantage of this institution, is, an elevated and invigorating course of mental discipline. Many persons seem to suppose, that the chief object of an intellectual education is the acquisition of knowledge. But it will be found, that this is only a secondary object. The formation of habits of investigation, of correct reasoning, of persevering attention, of regular system, of accurate analysis, and of vigorous mental action, is the primary object to be sought in preparing American women for their arduous duties, duties which will demand not only quickness of perception, but steadiness of purpose, regularity of system, and perseverance in action. It is for such purposes, that the discipline of the mathematics is so important an element in female education, and it is in this aspect, that the mere acquisition of facts, and the attainment of accomplishments, should be made of altogether secondary account. In the institution here described, a systematic course of study is adopted, as in our colleges, designed to occupy three years. The following slight outline of the course, will exhibit the liberal plan adopted in this respect. In mathematics, the whole of arithmetic contained in the larger works used in schools, the whole of Euclid, and such portions from day's mathematics as are requisite to enable the pupils to demonstrate the various problems in Olmsted's larger work on natural philosophy. In language, besides English grammar, a short course in Latin is required, sufficient to secure an understanding of the philosophy of the language, and that kind of mental discipline which the exercise of translating affords. In philosophy, chemistry, astronomy, botany, geology and mineralogy, intellectual and moral philosophy, political economy, and the evidences of Christianity, the same textbooks are used as are required at our best colleges. 
in geography, the most thorough course is adopted, and in history, a more complete knowledge is secured, by means of charts and textbooks, than most of our colleges offer. To these branches, are added Griscom's physiology, E. Bigelow's technology, and John's archaeology, together with a course of instruction in polite literature, for which Chambers's English literature is employed as the textbook, each recitation being attended with selections and criticisms, from teacher or pupils, on the various authors brought into notice. Vocal music, on the plan of the Boston Academy, is a part of the daily instructions. Linear drawing, and penciling, are designed also to be a part of the course. Instrumental music is taught, but not as a part of the regular course of study. To secure proper instruction in all these branches, the division of labor, adopted in colleges, is pursued. Each teacher has distinct branches as her department, for which she is responsible, and in which she is independent. One teacher performs the duties of a governess, in maintaining rules, and attending to the habits and manners of the pupils. By this method, the teachers have sufficient time, both to prepare themselves, and to impart instruction and illustration in the classroom. In this institution it is made a direct object of effort to cure defects of character and habits. At the frequent meetings of the principal and teachers, The peculiarities of each pupil are made the subjects of inquiry, and methods are devised for remedying defects through the personal influence of the several teachers. This, when thus made a direct object of combined effort, often secures results most gratifying and encouraging. One peculiarity of this institution demands consideration. By the method adopted here, the exclusive business of educating their own sex is, as it ever ought to be confined to females. The principal of the institution, indeed, is a gentleman, but, while he takes the position of a father of the family, and responsible head of the whole concern, the entire charge of instruction, and most of the responsibilities in regard to health, morals, and manners, rest upon the female teachers, in their several departments. The principal is the chaplain and religious teacher, and is a member of the board of instructors, so far as to have a right to advise, and an equal vote, in every question pertaining to the concerns of the school, and thus he acts as a sort of regulator and mainspring in all the various departments. But no one person in the institution is loaded with the excessive responsibilities, which rest upon one, where a large institution of this kind has a principal, who employs and directs all the subordinate assistants. The writer has never before seen the principle of the division of labor and responsibility so perfectly carried out in any female institution, and she believes that experience will prove that this is the true model for combining, in appropriate proportions, the agency of both sexes in carrying forward such an institution. There are cases where females are well qualified, and feel willing to take the place occupied by the principle. But such cases are rare. One thing more should be noticed, to the credit of the rising state where this institution is located. A female association has been formed, embracing a large portion of the ladies of standing and wealth, the design of which is to educate, gratuitously, at this and other similar institutions, such females as are anxious to obtain a good education, and are destitute of the means. If this enterprise is continued, with the same energy and perseverance as has been manifested during the last few years, that state will take the lead of her sister states in well-educated women, and if the views in the preceding pages are correct, this will give her precedence in every intellectual and moral advantage. Many, who are not aware of the great economy secured by a proper division of labor, will not understand how so extensive a course can be properly completed in three years. But in this institution, none are received under fourteen, and a certain amount of previous acquisition is required, in order to admission, as is done in our colleges. This secures a diminution of classes, so that but few studies are pursued at one time, while the number of well-qualified teachers is so adequate, that full time is afforded for all needful instruction and illustration. Where teachers have so many classes, 
that they merely have time to find out what the pupils learn from books, without any aid from their teachers, the acquisitions of the pupils are vague and imperfect, and soon pass away, so that an immense amount of expense, time, and labor, is spent in acquiring or recalling what is lost about as fast as it is gained. Parents are little aware of the immense waste incurred by the present mode of conducting female education. In the wealthy classes, young girls are sent to school, as a matter of course, year after year, confined, for six hours a day, to the schoolhouse, and required to add some time out of school to learning their lessons. Thus, during the most critical period of life, they are for a long time immured in a room, filled with an atmosphere vitiated by many breaths, and are constantly kept under some sort of responsibility in regard to mental effort. Their studies are pursued at random, often changed with changing schools, while book after book, heavily taxing the parent's purse, is conned a while, and then supplanted by others. Teachers have usually so many pupils, and such a variety of branches to teach, that little time can be afforded to each pupil, while scholars, at this thoughtless period of life, feeling sure of going to school as long as they please, manifest little interest in their pursuits. The writer believes that the actual amount of education, permanently secured by most young ladies from the age of 10 to 14, could all be acquired in one year, at the institution described by a young lady at the age of 15 or 16. Instead of such a course as the common one, if mothers would keep their daughters as their domestic assistants, until they are 14, requiring them to study one lesson, and go out, once a day, to recite it to a teacher, it would abundantly prepare them, after their constitutions are firmly established, to enter such an institution, where, in three years, they could secure more, than almost any young lady in the country now gains by giving the whole of her youth to school pursuits. In the early years of female life, reading, writing, needlework, drawing, and music, should alternate with domestic duties, and one hour a day, devoted to some study, in addition to the above pursuits, would be all that is needful to prepare them for a thorough education after growth is attained, and the constitution established. This is the time when young women would feel the value of an education, and pursue their studies with that maturity of mind, and vividness of interest, which would double the perpetuity and value of all their acquisitions. The great difficulty, which opposes such a plan, is, the want of institutions that would enable a young lady to complete, in three years, the liberal course of study, here described. But if American mothers become convinced of the importance of such advantages for their daughters, and will use their influence appropriately and efficiently, they will certainly be furnished. There are other men of liberality and wealth, besides the individual referred to, who can be made to feel that a fortune, expended in securing an appropriate education to American women, is as wisely bestowed, as in founding colleges for the other sex who are already so abundantly supplied. We ought to have institutions, similar to the one described, in every part of this nation, and funds should be provided, for educating young women destitute of means, and if American women think and feel, that, by such a method, their own trials will be lightened, and their daughters will secure a healthful constitution and a thorough domestic and intellectual education, the appropriate expression of their wishes will secure necessary funds. The tide of charity, which has been so long flowing from the female hand to provide a liberal education for young men, will flow back with abundant remuneration. The last method suggested for lessening the evils peculiar to American women, is, a decided effort to oppose the aristocratic feeling, that labor is degrading, and to bring about the impression, that it is refined and ladylike to engage in domestic pursuits. In past ages, and in aristocratic countries, leisure and indolence and frivolous pursuits have been deemed ladylike and refined, because those classes, which were most refined, countenanced such an opinion. But whenever ladies of refinement, as a general custom, patronize domestic pursuits, then these employments will be deemed ladylike. It may be urged, however, that it is impossible for a woman who cooks, washes, and sweeps, to appear in the dress, 
or acquire the habits and manners, of a lady, that the drudgery of the kitchen is dirty work, and that no one can appear delicate and refined, while engaged in it. Now all this depends on circumstances. If a woman has a house, destitute of neat and convenient facilities, if she has no habits of order and system, if she is remiss and careless in person and dress semicolon then all this may be true. But, if a woman will make some sacrifices of costly ornaments in her parlor, in order to make her kitchen neat and tasteful, if she will sacrifice expensive dishes, in order to secure such conveniences for labor as protect from exposures, if she will take pains to have the dresses, in which she works, made of suitable materials, and in good taste, if she will rise early, and systematize and oversee the work of her family, so as to have it done thoroughly, neatly, and in the early part of the day, she will find no necessity for any such apprehensions. It is because such work has generally been done by vulgar people, and in a vulgar way, that we have such associations, and when ladies manage such things, as ladies should, then such associations will be removed. There are pursuits, deemed very refined and genteel, which involve quite as much exposure as kitchen employments. For example, to draw a large landscape, in colored crayons, would be deemed very ladylike, but the writer can testify, from sad experience, that no cooking, washing, sweeping, or any other domestic duty, ever left such deplorable traces on hands, face, and dress, as this same lady-like pursuit. Such things depend entirely on custom and associations, and every American woman, who values the institutions of her country, and wishes to lend her influence in extending and perpetuating such blessings, may feel that she is doing this, whenever, by her example and influence, she destroys the aristocratic association, which would render domestic labor degrading. Footnotes, c. The right remits the name of this institution, lest an inference should be drawn which would be unjust to other institutions. There are others equally worthy of notice, and the writer selects this only because her attention was especially directed to it as being in a new state, and endowed wholly by an individual. d. From two Greek words, comma Greek. Kalos, Kalos, beauty, and, Greek, Sthenos, Sthenos, strength, being the union of both. The writer is now preparing for the press, an improved system, of her own invention, which, in some of its parts, has been successfully introduced into several female seminaries, with advantage. This plan combines singing with a great variety of amusing and graceful evolutions, designed to promote both health and easy manners. e. This work, which has gone through numerous editions, and been received by the public with great favor, forms no. LXXXV. Of the family library, and no. LVI. Of the school district library, issued by the publishers of this volume. It is abundantly illustrated by engravings, and has been extensively introduced as a school textbook. Chapter 4. On Domestic Economy as a Branch of Study. The greatest impediment to making domestic economy a branch of study is the fact that neither parents nor teachers realize the importance or the practicability of constituting it a regular part of school education. It is with reference to this that the first aim of the writer will be to point out some of the reasons for introducing domestic economy as a branch of female education to be studied at school. The first reason, is, that there is no period, in a young lady's life, when she will not find such knowledge useful to herself and to others. The state of domestic service, in this country, is so precarious, that there is scarcely a family, in the free states, of whom it can be affirmed, that neither sickness, discontent, nor love of change, will deprive them of all their domestics so that every female member of the family will be required to lend some aid, in providing food and the conveniences of living, and the better she is qualified to render it, the happier she will be, and the more she will contribute to the enjoyment of others. A second reason, is, that every young lady, at the close of her school days, and even before they are closed, is liable to be placed in a situation, in which she will need to do, herself, 
or to teach others to do, all the various processes and duties detailed in this work. That this may be more fully realized, the writer will detail some instances, which have come under her own observation. The eldest daughter of a family returned from school, on a visit, at sixteen years of age. Before her vacation had closed, her mother was laid in the grave, and such were her father's circumstances, that she was obliged to assume the cares and duties of her lost parent. The care of an infant, the management of young children, the superintendence of domestics, the charge of family expenses, the responsibility of entertaining company, and the many other cares of the family state, all at once came upon this young and inexperienced schoolgirl. Again, a young lady went to reside with a married sister, in a distant state. While on this visit, the elder sister died, and there was no one but this young lady to fill the vacant place, and assume all the cares of the nursery, parlor, and kitchen. Again, a pupil of the writer, at the end of her school days, married, and removed to the West. She was an entire novice in all domestic matters, a not a stranger in the place to which she removed. In a year, she became a mother, and her health failed, while, for most of the time, she had no domestics, at all, or only Irish or Germans, who scarcely knew even the names, or the uses, of many cooking utensils. She was treated with politeness by her neighbors, and wished to return their civilities, but how could this young and delicate creature, who had spent all her life at school, or in visiting and amusement, take care of her infant, attend to her cooking, washing, ironing, and baking, the concerns of her parlor, chambers, kitchen, and cellar, and yet visit and receive company? If there is anything that would make a kindly heart ache, with sorrow and sympathy, it would be to see so young, so amiable, so helpless a martyr to the mistaken system of female education now prevalent. I have the kindest of husbands, said the young wife, after her narrative of sufferings, and I never regretted my marriage, but, since this babe was born, I have never had a single waking hour of freedom from anxiety and care. Oh! How little young girls know what is before them, when they enter married life. Let the mother or teacher, whose eye may rest on these lines, ask herself, if there is no cause for fear that the young objects of her care may be thrown into similar emergencies, where they may need a kind of preparation, which as yet has been withheld. Another reason for introducing such a subject, as a distinct branch of school education, is, that, as a general fact, young ladies will not be taught these things in any other way. In reply to the thousand times repeated remark, that girls must be taught their domestic duties by their mothers, at home, it may be inquired, in the first place, what proportion of mothers are qualified to teach a proper and complete system of domestic economy. When this is answered, it may be asked, what proportion of those who are qualified, have that sense of the importance of such instructions, and that energy and perseverance which would enable them actually to teach their daughters, in all the branches of domestic economy presented in this work. It may then be asked, how many mothers actually do give their daughters instruction in the various branches of domestic economy? Is it not the case, that, owing to ill health, deficiency of domestics, and multiplied cares and perplexities, a large portion of the most intelligent mothers, and those, too, who most realize the importance of this instruction, actually cannot find the time, and have not the energy, necessary to properly perform the duty. They are taxed to the full amount of both their mental and physical energies, and cannot attempt anything more. Almost every woman knows, that it is easier to do the work, herself, than it is to teach an awkward and careless novice, and the great majority of women, in this country, are obliged to do almost everything in the shortest and easiest way. This is one reason why the daughters of very energetic and accomplished housekeepers are often the most deficient in these respects, while the daughters of ignorant or inefficient mothers, driven to the exercise of their own energies, often become the most systematic and expert. It may be objected, that such things cannot be taught by books. This position may fairly be questioned. Do not young ladies learn, from books, how to make hydrogen and oxygen? Do they not have pictures of furnaces, 
alembics, and the various utensils employed in cooking the chemical agents? Do they not study the various processes of mechanics, and learn to understand and to do many as difficult operations, as any that belong to housekeeping? All these things are explained, studied, and recited in classes, when everyone knows that little practical use can ever be made of this knowledge. Why, then, should not that science and art, which a woman is to practice during her whole life, be studied and recited? It may be urged, that, even if it is studied, it will soon be forgotten. And so will much of everything studied at school. But why should that knowledge, most needful for daily comfort, most liable to be in demand, be the only study omitted, because it may be forgotten. It may also be objected, that young ladies can get such books, and attend to them out of school. And so they can get books on chemistry and philosophy, and study them out of school, but will they do it? And why ought we not to make sure of the most necessary knowledge, and let the less needful be omitted? If young ladies study such a work as this, in school, they will remember a great part of it, and, when they forget, in any emergency, they will know where to resort for instruction. But if such books are not put into schools, probably not one in twenty will see or hear of them, especially in those retired places where they are most needed. And is it at all probable, that a branch, which is so likely esteemed as to be deemed unworthy a place in the list of female studies, will be sought for and learned by young girls, who so seldom look into works of solid instruction after they leave school. So deeply is the writer impressed with the importance of this, as a branch of female education, at school, that she would deem it far safer and wiser to omit any other, rather than this dot another reason, for introducing such a branch of study into female schools, is, the influence it would exert, in leading young ladies more correctly to estimate the importance and dignity of domestic knowledge. It is now often the case, that young ladies rather pride themselves on their ignorance of such subjects, and seem to imagine that it is vulgar and ungenteel to know how to work. This is one of the relics of an aristocratic state of society, which is fast passing away. Here, the tendency of everything is to the equalization of labor, so that all classes are feeling, more and more, that indolence is disreputable. And there are many mothers, among the best educated and most wealthy classes, who are bringing up their daughters, not only to know how to do, but actually to do, all kinds of domestic work. The writer knows young ladies, who are daughters of men of wealth and standing and who are among the most accomplished in their sphere, who have for months been sent to work with a Manchu Amekar, to acquire a practical knowledge of her occupation, and who have at home learned to perform all kinds of domestic labor. And let the young women of this nation find, that domestic economy is placed, in schools, on equal or superior ground to chemistry, philosophy, and mathematics, and they will blush to be found ignorant of its first principles, as much as they will to hesitate respecting the laws of gravity, or the composition of the atmosphere. But, as matters are now conducted, many young ladies know how to make oxygen and hydrogen, and to discuss questions of philosophy or political economy, far better than they know how to make a bed and sweep a room properly, and they can construct a diagram in geometry with far more skill than they can make the simplest article of female dress. It may be urged that the plan suggested by the writer, in the previous pages, would make such a book as this needless, for young ladies would learn all these things at home, before they go to school. But it must be remembered, that the plan suggested cannot fully be carried into effect, till such endowed institutions, as the one described, are universally furnished. This probably will not be done, till at least one generation of young women are educated. It is only on the supposition that a young lady can, at fourteen or fifteen years of age, enter such an institution, and continue the three years, that it would be easy to induce her to remain, during all the previous period, at home, in the practice of domestic economy, and the limited course of study pointed out. In the present imperfect, desultory, varying, mode of female education, where studies are begun, changed, partially learned, and forgotten, 
It requires nearly all the years of a woman's youth, to acquire the intellectual education now demanded. While this state of things continues, the only remedy is, to introduce domestic economy as a study at school. It is hoped that these considerations will have weight, not only with parents and teachers, but with young ladies themselves, and that all will unite their influence to introduce this, as a popular and universal branch of education, into every female school. Chapter 5. On the care of health. There is no point where a woman is more liable to suffer from a want of knowledge and experience, than in reference to the health of a family committed to her care. Many a young lady, who never had any charge of the sick, who never took any care of an infant, who never obtained information on these subjects from books, or from the experience of others, in short, with little or no preparation, has found herself the principal attendant in dangerous sickness, the chief nurse of a feeble infant, and the responsible guardian of the health of a whole family. The care, the fear, the perplexity, of a woman, suddenly called to these unwanted duties, none can realize, till they themselves feel it, or till they see some young and anxious novice first attempting to meet such responsibilities. To a woman of age and experience, these duties often involve a measure of trial and difficulty, at times deemed almost insupportable, how hard, then, must they press on the heart of the young and inexperienced. There is no really efficacious mode of preparing a woman to take a rational care of the health of a family, except by communicating that knowledge, in regard to the construction of the body, and the laws of health, which is the basis of the medical profession. Not that a woman should undertake the minute and extensive investigation requisite for a physician, but she should gain a general knowledge of first principles, as a guide to her judgment in emergencies when she can rely on no other aid. Therefore, before attempting to give any specific directions on the subject of this chapter, a short sketch of the construction of the human frame will be given, with a notice of some of the general principles, on which specific rules in regard to health are based. This description will be arranged under the general heads of bones, muscles, nerves, blood vessels, organs of digestion and respiration, and the skin. Bones. The bones are the most solid parts of the body. They are designed to protect and sustain it, and also to secure voluntary motion. They are about 250 in number, there being sometimes a few more or less, and are fastened together by cartilage, or gristle, a substance like the bones, but softer and more elastic. In order to convey a more clear and correct idea of the form, relative position, and connection, of the bones constituting the human framework, the engraving on page 70, figure 1, is given. Illustration, figure 1. By the preceding engraving, it will be seen, that the cranium, or skull, consists of several distinct pieces, which are united by sutures, or seams as represented by the zigzag lines, A, being the frontal bone, B, the parietal bone, C, the temporal bone, and D, the place of the occipital bone, which forms the back part of the head, and therefore is not seen in the engraving. The nasal bones, or bones of the nose, are shown at E, F, is the cheekbone, G, the upper, and H, the lower, jaw bones, I, I. The spinal column, or backbone, consisting of numerous small bones, called vertebra, J, J, the seven true ribs, which are fastened to the spine, behind, and by the cartilages, K, K, to the sternum, or breastbone, L, in front, M, M, are the first three false ribs, which are so called, because they are not united directly to the breastbone but by cartilages to the seventh true rib, N, N, are the lower two falls, which are also called floating, ribs, because they are not connected with the breast bone, nor the other ribs, in front, O, O, P, Q, are the bones of the pelvis, which is the foundation on which the spine rests, R, R, are the collar bones, S, S, the shoulder blades, T, T, the bones of the upper arm, U, U, the elbow joints, 
where the bones of the upper arm and forearm are united in such a way that they can move like a hinge, V W, V W, are the bones of the forearm, X, X, those of the wrists, Y, Y, those of the fingers, Z, Z, are the round heads of the thigh bones, where they are inserted into the sockets of the bones of the pelvis, giving motion in every direction, and forming the hip joint, a B, a B, are the thigh bones, C, C, the knee joints, D, E, D, E, the leg bones, F, F, the ankle joints, G, G, the bones of the foot. The bones are composed of two substances, comma one animal, and the other mineral. The animal part is a very fine network, called the cellular membrane. In this, are deposited the harder mineral substances, which are composed principally of carbonate and phosphate of lime. In very early life, the bones consist chiefly of the animal part, and are then soft and pliant. As the child advances in age, the bones grow harder, by the gradual deposition of the phosphate of lime, which is supplied by the food, and carried to the bones by the blood. In old age, the hardest material preponderates, making the bones more brittle than in earlier life. As we shall soon have occasion to refer, particularly, to the spinal, or vertebral column, and the derangement to which it is liable, we give, on page 72, representations of the different classes of vertebra, viz. the cervical, from the Latin, cervix, the neck, the dorsal, from dorsum, the back, and lumbar, from lumbus, the loins. Illustration, Figure 2. Figure 2, represents one of the cervical vertebra. Seven of these, placed one above another, constitute that part of the spine which is in the neck. Illustration, Figure 3. Figure 3, is one of the dorsal vertebra, twelve of which, form the central part of the spine. Illustration, Figure 4. Figure 4, represents one of the lumbar vertebra, five in number, which are immediately above the sacrum. These vertebra are so fastened, that the spine can bend, in any direction, and the muscles of the trunk are used in holding it erect or in varying its movements. By the drawings here presented, it will be seen, that the vertebra of the neck, back, and loins, differ somewhat in size and shape, although they all possess the same constituent parts, thus, A, in each, represents the body of the vertebra, B, the articulating processes, by which each is joined to its fellow, above and below it, C, the spinous process or that part of the vertebra, which forms the ridge to be felt, on pressure, the whole length of the center of the back. The backbone receives its name, spine, or spinal column, from these spinous processes. It is the universal law of the human frame, that exercise is indispensable to the health of the several parts. Thus, if a blood vessel be tied up, so as not to be used, it shrinks, and becomes a useless string. If a muscle be condemned to inaction, it shrinks in size, and diminishes in power, and thus it is also with the bones. Inactivity produces softness, debility, and unfitness for the functions they are designed to perform. This is one of the causes of the curvature of the spine, that common and pernicious defect in the females of America. From inactivity, the bones of the spine become soft and yielding, and then, if the person is often placed, for a length of time, in positions that throw the weight of the body unequally on certain portions of the spine, they yield to this frequent compression, and a distortion ensues. The positions taken by young persons, when learning to write or draw, or to play on the guitar, harp, or piano, and the position of the body when sleeping on one side, on high pillows, all tend to produce this effect by throwing the weight of the body unequally, and for a length of time, on particular parts of the spine. Illustration, Figure 5. Muscles. The muscles are the chief organs of motion, and consist of collections of fine fibers or strings, united in casings of membrane or thin skin. They possess an elastic power, like India rubber, which enables them to extend and contract. The red meat in animals consists of muscles. 
every muscle has connected with it nerves, veins, and arteries, and those designed to move the bones, are fastened to them by tendons at their extremities. The muscles are laid over each other, and are separated by means of membranes and layers of fat, which enable them to move easily, without interfering with each other. The figure on page 74, represents the muscles of the arm, as they appear when the skin and fat are removed. The muscles O and B are attached, at their upper ends, to the bone of the arm, and by their lower ends to the upper part of the forearm, near the elbow joint. When the fibers of these muscles contract, the middle part of them grows larger, and the arm is bent at the elbow. The muscle C, is, in like manner, fastened, by its upper end, to the shoulder blade and the upper part of the arm, and by its lower end to one of the bones of the forearm, near the elbow. When the arm is bent, and we wish to straighten it, it is done by contracting this muscle. The muscles D, D, are fastened at one end near the elbow joint, and at the other near the ends of the fingers, and on the back of the hand are reduced in size, appearing like strong cords. These cords are called tendons. They are employed in straightening the fingers, when the hand is shut. These tendons are confined by the ligament or band, E, which binds them down, around the wrist, and thus enables them to act more efficiently, and secures beauty of form to the limb. The muscles at F, are those which enable us to turn the hand and arm outward. Every different motion of the arm has one muscle to produce it, and another to restore the limb to its natural position. Those muscles which bend the body are called flexors, those which straighten it, extensors. When the arm is thrown up, one set of muscles is used to pull it down, another set, when it is thrown forward, a still different set is used, when it is thrown back, another, different from the former, when the arm turns in its socket, still another set is used, and thus every different motion of the body is made by a different set of muscles. All these muscles are compactly and skillfully arranged, so as to work with perfect ease. Among them, run the arteries, veins, and nerves, which supply each muscle with blood and nervous power, as will be hereafter described. The size and strength of the muscles depend greatly on their frequent exercise. If left inactive, they grow thin and weak, instead of giving the plumpness to the figure, designed by nature. The delicate and feeble appearance of many American women, is chiefly owing to the little use they make of their muscles. Many a pale, puny, shad-shaped girl, would have become a plump, rosy, well-formed person, if half the exercise, afforded to her brothers in the open air, had been secured to her, during childhood and youth. Nerves. The nerves are the organs of sensation. They enable us to see, hear, feel, taste, and smell, and also combine with the bones and muscles in producing motion. The first engraving, on p. 77, figure 6, is a vertical section of the skull, and of the spinal column, or backbone, which supports the head, and through which runs the spinal cord, whence most of the nerves originate. It is a side view, and represents the head and spine, as they would appear, if they were cut through the middle from front to back. Figure 7, exhibits them as they would appear, if viewed from behind. In figure 6, A, represents the cerebrum, or great brain, B, the cerebellum, or little brain, which is situated directly under the great brain, at the back and lower part of the head, C, D, E, is the spinal marrow, which is connected with the brain at C, and runs through the whole length of the spinal column. This column consists, as has already been stated, of a large number of small bones, F, F, called vertebra, laid one above another, and fastened together by cartilage, or gristle, G, between them. Illustration, Figure 6. Illustration, Figure 7. Between each two vertebra, or spinal bones, there issues from the spine, on each side, a pair of nerves. The lower broad part of the spine, CP, figure 1, P, 70, and figure 7, P, 77, is called the sacrum, in this, are eight holes, 
through which the lower pairs of nerves pass off. The nerves of the head and lungs run directly from the brain, those of all other parts of the body proceed from the spine, passing out in the manner already mentioned. The nerves which thus proceed from the spine, branch out, like the limbs and twigs of a tree, till they extend over the whole body, and, so minutely are they divided and arranged, that a point, destitute of a nerve, cannot be found on the skin. Some idea of the ramifications of the nerves, may be obtained by reference to the following engraving, figure 8, in this, A, A, represents the cerebrum, or great brain, B, B, the cerebellum, or little brain, see also A, B, in figure 6, C, C, represents the union of the fibers of the cerebrum, D, D, the union of the two sides of the cerebellum, E, 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 the spinal marrow, which passes through the center of the spine, as seen at C, D, E, in figure 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, branches of the nerves going to different parts of the body. As the nerves are the organs of sensation, all pain is an affection of some portion of the nerves. The health of the nerves depends very greatly on the exercise of the muscles, with which they are so intimately connected. This shows the reason why the headache, tictaliorux, diseases of the spine, and other nervous affections, are so common among American women. Their inactive habits, engenderability of the nervous system, and these diseases follow, as the consequence. Illustration, Figure 8. It can be seen, by reference to the side view, represented on page 77, Figure 6 that the spine is naturally curved back and forward. When, from want of exercise, its bones are softened, and the muscles weakened, the spine acquires an improper curve, and the person becomes what is called crooked, having the neck projected forward, and, in some cases, having the back convex, where it should be concave. Probably one half of the American women have the head thus projecting forward, instead of carrying it in the natural, erect position, which is both graceful and dignified. The curvature of the spine, spoken of in this work as so common, and as the cause of so many diseases among American women, is what is denominated the lateral curvature, and is much more dangerous than the other distortion. The indications of this evil, are, the projection of one shoulder blade more than the other, and, in bad cases, one shoulder being higher, and the hip on the opposite side more projecting than the other. In this case, the spine, when viewed from behind, instead of running in a straight line, as in figure 7 and 9, is curved somewhat, as may be seen in figures 10 and 11. This effect is occasioned by the softness of the bones, induced by want of exercise, together with tight dressing, which tends to weaken the muscles that are thus thrown out of use. Improper and long continued positions in drawing, writing, and sleeping, which throw the weight of the body on one part of the spine, induce the same evil. This distortion is usually accompanied with some consequent disease of the nervous system, or some disarrangement of the internal organs. By comparing figures 9 and 11, the difference between a natural and distorted spine will be readily perceived. In figure 10, the curved line shows the course of the spine, occasioned by distortion. The perpendicular line, in this and figure 11, indicates the true direction of the spine. The horizontal lines show that one shoulder and hip are forced from their proper level. Illustration, figure 9. Illustration, figure 10. Illustration, figure 11. Blood vessels. The blood is the fluid into which our food is changed, and which is employed to minister nourishment to the whole body. For this purpose, it is carried to every part of the body, by the arteries, and, after it has given out its nourishment, returns to the heart, through the veins. The subjoined engraving, figure 12, which presents a rude outline of the vascular system, will more clearly illustrate this operation, as we shall presently show. Illustration, figure 12. Before entering the heart, the blood receives a fresh supply of nourishment by a duct which leads from the stomach. The arteries have their origin from the heart, in a great trunk, called the aorta, 
which is the parent of all the arteries, as the spinal marrow is the parent of the nerves which it sends out. When the arteries have branched out into myriads of minute vessels, the blood which is in them passes into as minute veins, and these run into each other, like the rills and branches of a river, until they are all united into great veins, which run into the heart. One of these large receivers, called the vena cava superior, or upper vena cava, brings back the blood from the arms and head. The other, the vena cava inferior, or lower vena cava, brings back the blood from the body and lower limbs. In the preceding figure, H, is the heart, which is divided into four compartments, two, called auricles, used for receiving the blood, and two, called ventricles, used for sending out the blood. A, is the aorta, or great artery, which sends its branches to every part of the body. In the upper part, at A, 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 are the main branches of the aorta, which go to the head and arms. Below, at A, A, are the branches which go to the lower limbs. The branches which set off at X, X, are those by which the intestines are supplied by vessels from the aorta. Every muscle in the whole body, all the organs of the body, and the skin, are supplied by branches sent off from this great artery. When the blood is thus dispersed through any organ, in minute vessels, it is received, at their terminations, by numerous minute veins, which gradually unite, forming larger branches, till they all meet in either the upper or lower vena cava, which returns the blood to the heart. The eye, is the vena cava inferior, which receives the blood from the veins of the lower parts of the body, as seen at V, V. The blood, sent into the lower limbs from the aorta, is received by minute veins, which finally unite at V, V, and thus it is emptied through the lower vena cava into the heart, O, O, represent the points of entrance of those tributaries of the vena cava, which received the blood from the intestines, which is sent out by the aorta at X, X. In the upper part, V, S, is the vena cava superior, which receives the blood from the head and arms, V, 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 are the tributaries of the upper vena cava, which bring the blood back from the head and arms, D, D, represents the course of the thoracic duct, a delicate tube by which the chyle is carried into the blood, as mentioned on page 89, T shows the place where this duct empties into a branch of the vena cava. It thus appears, that wherever a branch of the aorta goes to carry blood, there will be found a tributary of the upper or lower vena cava, to bring it back. The succeeding engravings, will enable the reader to form a more definite idea of this important function of the system, the circulation of the blood. The heart, in man, and in all warm-blooded animals, is double having two auricles and two ventricles. In animals with cold blood, as fishes, the heart is single, having but one auricle and one ventricle. Figure 13, represents the double heart as it appears when the two sides are separated, and also the great blood vessels, those on the left of the figure being on the right side of the body, and vice versa. The direction of the blood is represented by the arrows. A, represents the lower vena cava returning the blood from the lower parts of the body, and L, the upper vena cava, returning the blood from the head and arms. B, is the right sinus, or auricle, into which the returned blood is poured. From this cavity of the heart, the blood is carried into the right ventricle, C, and from this ventricle, the pulmonary arteries, D, convey into the lungs the blood which is returned from the body. These five vessels, A, B, C, D, and L, belong to the right side of the heart, and contain the venous or dark colored blood, which has been through the circulation, and is now unfit for the uses of the system, till it has passed through the lungs. Illustration, Figure 13. When the blood reaches the lungs, and is exposed to the action of the air which we breathe, it throws off its impurities, becomes bright in color, and is then called arterial blood. It then returns to the left side of the heart, on the right of the engraving, by the pulmonary vein Z, E, also seen at M, M, figure 15, into the left auricle F, 
once it is forced into the ventricle, G. From the left ventricle, proceeds the aorta, H, H, which is the great artery of the body, and conveys the blood to every part of the system. I, J, K, are branches of the aorta, going to the head and arms. Illustration, Figure 14. Figure 14, represents the heart, with its two sides united as in nature, and will be understood from the description of figure 13. On the opposite page, figure 15, represents the heart, with the great blood vessels, on a still larger scale, A, being the left ventricle, B, the right ventricle, C, E, F, the aorta, or great artery, rising out of the left ventricle, G, H, I, the branches of the aorta, going to the head and arms, K, L, L, the pulmonary artery, and its branches, M, M, veins of the lungs, which bring the blood back from the lungs to the heart, N, right auricle, O, vena cava inferior, P, veins returning blood from the liver and bowels, Q, the vena cava superior, R, the left auricle, S, the left coronary artery, which distributes the blood exclusively to the substance of the heart. Illustration, Figure 15. Organs of digestion and respiration. Digestion and respiration are the processes, by which the food is converted into blood for the nourishment of the body. The engraving on the next page, Figure 16, shows the organs by which these operations are performed. In the lower part of the engraving, is the stomach, marked S which receives the food through the gullet, marked G. The latter, though in the engraving it is cut off at G, in reality continues upwards to the throat. The stomach is a bag composed of muscles, nerves, and blood vessels, united by a material similar to that which forms the skin. As soon as food enters the stomach, its nerves are excited to perform their proper function of stimulating the muscles. A muscular, called the peristaltic, motion immediately commences, by which the stomach propels its contents around the whole of its circumference, once in every three minutes. Illustration, Figure 16. This movement of the muscles attracts the blood from other parts of the system, for the blood always hastens to administer its supplies to any organ which is called to work. The blood vessels of the stomach are soon distended with blood from which the gastric juice is secreted by minute vessels in the coat of the stomach. This mixes with the food, and reduces it to a soft pulpy mass, called chyme. It then passes through the lower end of the stomach, into the intestines, which are folded up in the abdomen, and the upper portion, only, of which, is shown in the engraving, at A, A. The organ marked L, L, is the liver, which, as the blood passes through its many vessels, secretes a substance called bile, which accumulates in the gallbladder, marked B. After the food passes out of the stomach, it receives from the liver a portion of bile, and from the pancreas the pancreatic juice. The pancreas does not appear in this drawing, being concealed behind the stomach. These two liquids separate the substance which has passed from the stomach, into two different portions. One is a light liquid, very much like cream in appearance, and called chyle, of which the blood is formed, the other is a more solid substance, which contains the refuse and useless matter, with a smaller portion of nourishment, and this, after being further separated from the nourishing matter which it contains, is thrown out of the body. There are multitudes of small vessels, called lacteals, which, as these two mixed substances pass through the long and winding folds of the intestines in the abdomen, absorb the chyle, and convey it to the thoracic duct, which runs up close by the spine, and carries the chyle, thus received, into a branch of the vena cava superior, a T, whence it is mingled with the blood going into the heart. In this engraving, the lacteals and thoracic duct are not shown but their position is indicated by the dotted lines, marked X, Y, X, being the lacteals, and Y, the thoracic duct dot in the upper half of the engraving, H represents the heart, A, the commencement of the aorta, V, C, S, the termination of the vena cava superior. On each side of the heart, are the lungs, 
LL, being the left lobe, and RL, the right lobe. They are composed of a network of air vessels, blood vessels, and nerves. W, represents the trachea, or windpipe, through which, the air we breathe is conducted to the lungs. It branches out into myriads of minute vessels, which are thus filled with air every time we breathe. From the heart, run the pulmonary arteries, marked PA. These enter the lungs and spread out alongside of the branches of the air vessels, so that every air vessel has a small artery running side by side with it. When the two vena carvas empty the blood into the heart, the latter contracts, and sends this blood, through these pulmonary arteries, into the lungs. As the air and blood meander, side by side, through the lungs, the superabundant carbon and hydrogen of the blood combine with the oxygen of the air, forming carbonic acid gas, and water, which are thrown out of the lungs at every expiration. This is the process by which the chyle is converted into arterial blood, and the venous blood purified of its excess of carbon and hydrogen. When the blood is thus prepared, in the lungs, for its duties, it is received by the small pulmonary veins, which gradually unite, and bring the blood back to the heart, through the large pulmonary veins, marked PV, PV. On receiving this purified blood from the lungs, the heart contracts and sends it out again, through the aorta, to all parts of the body. It then makes another circuit through every part, ministering to the wants of all, and is afterwards again brought back by the veins to receive the fresh child from the stomach, and to be purified by the lungs. The throbbing of the heart is caused by its alternate expansion and contraction, as it receives and expels the blood. With one throb, the blood is sent from the right ventricle into the lungs, and from the left ventricle into the aorta. Every time we inspire air, the process of purifying the blood is going on, and every time we expire the air, we throw out the redundant carbon and hydrogen, taken from a portion of the blood. If the waist is compressed by tight clothing, a portion of the lungs be compressed, so that the air vessels cannot be filled. This prevents the perfect purification and preparation of the blood, so that a part returns back to the heart unfitted for its duties. This is a slow, but sure, method, by which the constitution of many a young lady is so undermined that she becomes an early victim to disease and to the decay of beauty and strength. The want of pure air is another cause, of the debility of the female constitution. When air has been rendered impure, by the breath of several persons, or by close confinement, it does not purify the blood properly. Sleeping in close chambers, and sitting in crowded and unventilated schoolrooms, are frequent causes of debility in the constitution of young persons. Of the skin. The skin is the covering of the body, and has very important functions to perform. It is more abundantly supplied with nerves and blood vessels than any other part and there is no spot of the skin where the point of the finest needle would not pierce a nerve and blood vessel. Indeed, it may be considered as composed chiefly of an interlacing of minute nerves and blood vessels, so that it is supposed there is more nervous matter in the skin, than in all the rest of the body united, and that the greater portion of the blood flows through the skin. The whole animal system is in a state of continual change and renovation. Food is constantly taken into the stomach, only a portion of which is fitted for the supply of the blood. All the rest has to be thrown out of the system, by various organs designed for this purpose. These organs are comma the lungs, which throw off a portion of useless matter when the blood is purified, the kidneys, which secrete liquids that pass into the bladder, and are thrown out from the body by that organ, and the intestines which carry off the useless and more solid parts of the food, after the lacteals have drawn off the chyle. In addition to these organs, the skin has a similar duty to perform, and as it has so much larger a supply of blood, it is the chief organ in relieving the body of the useless and noxious parts of the materials which are taken for food. Various experiments show, that not less than a pound and four ounces of waste matter is thrown off by the skin every 24 hours. This is according to the lowest calculation. Most of those, who have made experiments to ascertain the quantity, represent it as much greater, and all agree, that the skin throws off more redundant matter from the body, 
than the whole of the other organs together. In the ordinary state of the skin, even when there is no apparent perspiration, it is constantly exhaling waste matter, in a form which is called insensible perspiration, because it cannot be perceived by the senses. A very cool mirror, brought suddenly near to the skin, will be covered, in that part, with a moisture, which is this effluvium thus made visible. When heat or exercise excites the skin, this perspiration is increased, so as to be apparent to the senses. This shows the reason why it is so important frequently to wash the entire surface of the body. If this be neglected, the pores of the skin are closed by the waste matter thrown from the body, and by small particles of the thin scarf skin, so that it cannot properly perform its duties. In this way, the other organs are made to work harder, in order to perform the labor the skin would otherwise accomplish, and thus the lungs and bowels are often essentially weakened. Another office of the skin is to regulate the heat of the body. The action of the internal organs is constantly generating heat, and the faster the blood circulates, the greater is the heat evolved. The perspiration of the skin serves to reduce and regulate this heat. For, whenever any liquid changes to a vapor, it absorbs heat from whatever is nearest to it. The faster the blood flows, the more perspiration is evolved. This bedews the skin with a liquid, which the heat of the body turns to a vapor, and in this change, that heat is absorbed. When a fever takes place, this perspiration ceases, and the body is afflicted with heat. Insensible perspiration is most abundant during sleep, after eating, and when friction is applied to the skin. Perspiration is performed by the terminations of minute arteries in every part of the skin, which exude the perspiration from the blood. The skin also performs another function. It is provided with a set of small vessels, called absorbents, which are exceedingly abundant and minute. When particular substances are brought in contact with the skin, these absorbents take up some portions and carry them into the blood. It is owing to this, that opium, applied on the skin, acts in a manner similar to its operation when taken into the stomach. The power of absorption is increased by friction, and this is the reason that liniments are employed, with much rubbing, to bruises and sprains. The substance applied is thus introduced into the injured part, through the absorbents. This shows another reason for frequent washing of the skin, and for the frequent changes of the garment next to the skin. Otherwise portions of the noxious matter, thrown out by the skin, are reabsorbed into the blood, and are slow but sure causes of a decay of the strength of the system. The skin is also provided with small follicles, or bags, which are filled with an oily substance. This, by gradually exuding over the skin, prevents water from penetrating and injuring its texture. The skin is also the organ of touch. This office is performed through the instrumentality of the nerves of feeling, which are spread over all parts of the skin. This general outline of the construction of the human frame is given, with reference to the practical application of this knowledge in the various cases where a woman will be called upon to exercise her own unaided judgment. The application will be further pointed out, in the chapters on food, dress, cleanliness, care of the sick, and care of infants. Chapter 6. On Healthful Food. The person who decides what shall be the food and drink of a family, and the modes of preparation, is the one who decides, to a greater or less extent, what shall be the health of that family. It is the opinion of most medical men, that intemperance in eating is the most fruitful of all causes of disease and death. If this be so, the woman who wisely adapts the food and cooking of her family to the laws of health, removes the greatest risk which threatens the lives of those under her care. To exhibit this subject clearly, it will be needful to refer, more minutely, to the organization and operation of the digestive organs. It is found, by experiment, that the supply of gastric juice, furnished from the blood, by the arteries of the stomach, is proportioned, not to the amount of food put into the stomach, but to the wants of the body so that it is possible to put much more into the stomach than can be digested. To guide and regulate in this matter, the sensation called hunger is provided. In a healthy state of the body, 
as soon as the blood has lost its nutritive supplies, the craving of hunger is felt, and then, if the food is suitable, and is taken in the proper manner, this sensation ceases, as soon as the stomach has received enough to supply the wants of the system. But our benevolent Creator, in this, as in our other duties, has connected enjoyment with the operation needful to sustain our bodies. In addition to the allaying of hunger, the gratification of the palate is secured, by the immense variety of food, some articles of which are far more agreeable than others. This arrangement of providence, designed for our happiness, has become, either through ignorance, or want of self control, the chief cause of the various diseases and sufferings, which afflict those classes who have the means of seeking a variety to gratify the palate. If mankind had only one article of food, and only water to drink, though they would have less enjoyment in eating, they would never be tempted to put any more into the stomach, than the calls of hunger required. But the customs of society, which present an incessant change, and a great variety of food, with those various condiments which stimulate appetite, lead almost every person very frequently to eat merely to gratify the palate, after the stomach has been abundantly supplied, so that hunger has ceased. When too great a supply of food is put into the stomach, the gastric juice dissolves only that portion which the wants of the system demand. The remainder is ejected, in an unprepared state, the absorbents take portions of it into the system, and all the various functions of the body, which depend on the ministries of the blood, are thus gradually and imperceptibly injured. Very often, intemperance in eating produces immediate results, such as colic, headaches, pains of indigestion, and vertigo. But the more general result, is, a gradual undermining of all parts of the human frame, thus imperceptibly shortening life, by so weakening the constitution, that it is ready to yield, at every point, to any uncommon risk or exposure. Thousands and thousands are passing out of the world, from diseases occasioned by exposures, which a healthy constitution could meet without any danger. It is owing to these considerations, that it becomes the duty of every woman, who has the responsibility of providing food for a family, to avoid a variety of tempting dishes. It is a much safer rule, to have only one kind of healthy food, for each meal, than the abundant variety which is usually met at the tables of almost all classes in this country. When there is to be any variety of dishes, they ought not to be successive, but so arranged, as to give the opportunity of selection. How often is it the case, that persons, by the appearance of a favorite article, are tempted to eat, merely to gratify the palate, when the stomach is already adequately supplied? All such intemperance wears on the constitution, and shortens life. It not unfrequently happens, that excess in eating produces a morbid appetite, which must constantly be denied. But the organization of the digestive organs demands not only that food be taken in proper quantities, but that it be taken at proper times. It has before been shown, that, as soon as the food enters the stomach, the muscles are excited by the nerves, and the peristaltic motion commences. This is a powerful and constant exercise of the muscles of the stomach, which continues until the process of digestion is complete. During this time, the blood is withdrawn from other parts of the system, to supply the demands of the stomach, which is laboring hard with all its muscles. When this motion ceases, and the digested food has gradually passed out of the stomach, nature requires that it should have a period of repose. And if another meal be eaten, immediately after one is digested, the stomach is set to work again, before it has had time to rest, and before a sufficient supply of gastric juice is provided. The general rule, then, is, that three hours be given to the stomach for labor, and two for rest, and in obedience to this, five hours, at least, ought to elapse between every two regular meals. In cases where exercise produces a flow of perspiration, more food is needed to supply the loss, and strong laboring men may safely eat as often as they feel the want of food. So, young and healthy children, who gamble and exercise much, and whose bodies grow fast, may have a more frequent supply of food. But, as a general rule, 
meals should be five hours apart, and eating between meals avoided. There is nothing more unsafe, and wearing to the constitution, than a habit of eating at any time, merely to gratify the palate. When a tempting article is presented, every person should exercise sufficient self-denial, to wait till the proper time for eating arrives. Children, as well as grown persons, are often injured, by eating between their regular meals, thus weakening the stomach, by not affording it any time for rest. In deciding as to quantity of food, there is one great difficulty to be met by a large portion of the community. It has been shown, that the exercise of every part of the body is indispensable to its health and perfection. The bones, the muscles, the nerves, the organs of digestion and respiration, and the skin, all demand exercise, in order properly to perform their functions. When the muscles of the body are called into action, all the blood vessels entwined among them are frequently compressed. As the arteries are so contrived, that the blood cannot run back, this compression hastens it forward, through the veins, towards that organ. The heart is immediately put in quicker motion, to send it into the lungs, and they, also, are thus stimulated to more rapid action, which is the cause of that panting which active exercise always occasions. The blood thus courses with greater celerity through the body, and sooner loses its nourishing properties. Then the stomach assumes its mandate of hunger, and a new supply of food must be furnished. Thus it appears, as a general rule, that the quantity of food, actually needed by the body, depends on the amount of muscular exercise taken. A laboring man, in the open fields, probably throws off from his skin ten times the amount of perspirable matter, which is evolved from the skin of a person of sedentary pursuits. In consequence of this, he demands a far greater amount of food and drink. Those persons, who keep their bodies in a state of health, by sufficient exercise, can always be guided by the calls of hunger. They can eat when they feel hungry, and stop when hunger ceases, and then they will calculate exactly right. But the difficulty is, that a large part of the community, especially women, are so inactive in their habits, that they seldom feel the calls of hunger. They habitually eat, merely to gratify the palate. This produces such a state of the system, that they have lost the guide which nature has provided. They are not called to eat, by hunger, nor admonished, by its cessation, when to stop. In consequence of this, such persons eat what pleases the palate, till they feel no more inclination for the article. It is probable, that three-fourths of the women, in the wealthier circles, sit down to each meal without any feeling of hunger, and eat merely on account of the gratification thus afforded them. Such persons find their appetite to depend almost solely upon the kind of food on the table. This is not the case with those, who take the exercise which nature demands. They approach their meals in such a state that almost any kind of food is acceptable. The question then rises, how are persons, who have lost the guide which nature has provided, to determine as to the proper amount of food they shall take? The only rules they can adopt, are of a general nature, founded on the principles already developed. They should endeavor to proportion their food to the amount of the exercise they ordinarily take. If they take but little exercise, they should eat but little food in comparison with those who are much in the open air and take much exercise, and their food should be chiefly vegetable, and not animal. But how often is it seen, that a student, or a man who sits all day in an office, or a lady who spends the day in her parlor and chamber, will sit down to a loaded table, and, by continuing to partake of the tempting varieties, in the end load the stomach with a supply, which a stout farmer could scarcely digest. But the health of a family depends, not merely on the quantity of food taken, but very much, also, on the quality. Some kinds of food are very pernicious in their nature, and some healthful articles are rendered very injurious by the mode of cooking. Persons who have a strong constitution, and take much exercise, may eat almost anything, with apparent impunity. But young children, who are forming their constitutions, and persons who are delicate, and who take but little exercise, are very dependent for health, 
on a proper selection of food. There are some general principles, which may aid in regulating the judgment on this subject. It is found, that there are some kinds of food which afford nutriment to the blood, and do not produce any other effect on the system. There are other kinds, which are not only nourishing, but stimulating, so that they quicken the functions of the organs on which they operate. The condiments used in cookery, such as pepper, mustard, and spices, are of this nature. There are certain states of the system, when these stimulants are beneficial, but it is only in cases where there is some debility. Such cases can only be pointed out by medical men. But persons in perfect health, and especially young children, never receive any benefit from such kind of food, and just in proportion as condiments operate to quicken the labors of the internal organs, they tend to wear down their powers. A person who thus keeps the body working under an unnatural excitement, lives faster than nature designed, and the sooner the constitution is worn out. A woman, therefore, should provide dishes for her family, which are free from these stimulating condiments, and as much as possible prevent their use. It is also found, by experience, that animal food is more stimulating than vegetable. This is the reason why, in cases of fevers, or inflammations, medical men forbid the use of meat and butter. Animal food supplies chyle much more abundantly than vegetable food does, and this chyle is more stimulating in its nature. Of course, a person who lives chiefly on animal food, is under a higher degree of stimulus than if his food was chiefly composed of vegetable substances. His blood will flow faster, and all the functions of his body will be quickened. This makes it important to secure a proper proportion of animal and vegetable diet. Some medical men suppose that an exclusively vegetable diet is proved, by the experience of many individuals, to be fully sufficient to nourish the body, and bring, as evidence, the fact that some of the strongest and most robust men in the world are those who are trained, from infancy, exclusively on vegetable food. From this, they infer, that life will be shortened, just in proportion as the diet is changed to more stimulating articles, and that, all other things being equal, children will have a better chance of health and long life, if they are brought up solely on vegetable food. But, though this is not the common opinion of medical men, they all agree, that, in America, Far too large a portion of the diet consists of animal food. As a nation, the Americans are proverbial for the gross and luxurious diet with which they load their tables, and there can be no doubt that the general health of the nation would be increased, by a change in our customs in this respect. To take meat but once a day, and this in small quantities, compared with the common practice, is a rule, the observance of which would probably greatly reduce the amount of fevers eruptions, headaches, bilious attacks, and the many other ailments which are produced or aggravated by too gross a diet. The celebrated Roman physician, Baglivi, who, from practicing extensively among Roman Catholics, had ample opportunities to observe, mentions, that, in Italy, an unusual number of people recover their health in the forty days of Lent, in consequence of the lower diet which is required as a religious duty. An American physician remarks, for every reeling drunkard that disgraces our country, it contains 100 gluttons semicolon persons, I mean, who eat to excess, and suffer in consequence. Another distinguished physician says, I believe that every stomach, not actually impaired by organic disease, will perform its functions, if it receives reasonable attention, and when we perceived the manner in which diet is generally conducted, both in regard to quantity and variety of articles of food and drink, which are mixed up in one heterogeneous mass common instead of being astonished at the prevalence of indigestion, our wonder must rather be, that, in such circumstances, any stomach is capable of digesting at all. In regard to articles which are the most easily digested, only general rules can be given. Tender meats are digested more readily than those which are tough, or than many kinds of vegetable food. The farinaceous articles, such as rice, flour, corn, potatoes, and the like, are the most nutritious, and most easily digested. 
The popular notion, that meat is more nourishing than bread, is a great mistake. Good bread contains one third more nourishment than butcher's meat. The meat is more stimulating, and for this reason is more readily digested. A perfectly healthy stomach can digest almost any healthful food, but when the digestive powers are weak, every stomach has its peculiarities, and what is good for one, is hurtful to another. In such cases, experiment, alone, can decide, which are the most digestible articles of food. A person, whose food troubles him, must deduct one article after another, till he learns, by experience, which is the best for digestion. Much evil has been done, by assuming that the powers of one stomach are to be made the rule in regulating every other dot. The most unhealthful kinds of food, are those, which are made so by bad cooking, such as sour and heavy bread, cakes, pie crust, and other dishes consisting of fat, mixed and cooked with flour, also rancid butter, and high seasoned food. The fewer mixtures there are in cooking, the more healthful is the food likely to be. There is one caution, as to the mode of eating, which seems peculiarly needful to Americans. It is indispensable to good digestion, that food be well chewed and taken slowly. It needs to be thoroughly chewed, in order to prepare it for the action of the gastric juice, which, by the peristaltic motion, will be thus brought into universal contact with the minute portions. It has been found, that a solid lump of food requires much more time and labor of the stomach, than divided substances. It has also been found, that, as each bolus, or mouthful, enters the stomach, the latter closes, until the portion received has had some time to move around and combine with the gastric juice, and that the orifice of the stomach resists the entrance of any more, till this is accomplished. But, if the eater persists in swallowing fast, the stomach yields, the food is then poured in more rapidly than the organ can perform its duty of digestion, and evil results are sooner or later developed. This exhibits the folly of those hasty meals so common to travelers, and to men of business, and shows why children should be taught to eat slowly. After taking a full meal, it is very important to health, that no great bodily or mental exertion be made, till the labor of the stomach is over. Intense mental effort draws the blood to the head, and muscular exertions draw it to the muscles, and in consequence of this, the stomach loses the supply which it requires when performing its office. When the blood is thus withdrawn, the adequate supply of gastric juice is not afforded, and indigestion is the result. The heaviness which follows a full meal, is the indication which nature gives of the need of quiet. When the meal is moderate, a sufficient quantity of gastric juice is exuded in an hour, or an hour and a half, after which, labor of body and mind may safely be resumed. When undigested food remains in the stomach, and is at last thrown out into the bowels, it proves an irritating substance, producing an inflamed state in the lining of the stomach and other organs. The same effect is produced by alcoholic drinks. It is found, that the stomach has the power of gradually accommodating its digestive powers to the food it habitually receives. Thus, animals, which live on vegetables, can gradually become accustomed to animal food, and the reverse is equally true. Thus, too, the human stomach can eventually accomplish the digestion of some kinds of food, which, at first, were indigestible. But any changes of this sort should be gradual, as those which are sudden, are trying to the powers of the stomach, by furnishing matter for which its gastric juice is not prepared. In regard to the nature of the meals prepared, the breakfast should furnish a supply of liquids because their body has been exhausted by the exhalations of the night, and demands them more than at any other period. It should not be the heartiest meal, because the organs of digestion are weakened by long fasting, and the exhalations. Dinner should be the heartiest meal, because then the powers of digestion are strengthened, by the supplies of the morning meal. Light and amusing employments should occupy mind and body for an hour or more after a full meal. But little drink should be taken, while eating, as it dilutes the gastric juice which is apportioned to each quantity of food as it enters the stomach. 
it is better to take drink after the meal is past. Extremes of heat or cold are injurious to the process of digestion. Taking hot food or drink, habitually, tends to debilitate all the organs thus needlessly excited. In using cold substances, it is found that a certain degree of warmth in the stomach is indispensable to the air digestion, so that, when the gastric juice is cooled below this temperature, it ceases to act. Indulging in large quantities of cold drinks, or eating ice creams, after a meal, tends to reduce the temperature of the stomach, and thus to stop digestion. This shows the folly of those refreshments, in convivial meetings, where the guests are tempted to load the stomach with a variety, such as would require the stomach of a stout farmer to digest, and then to wind up with ice creams, thus destroying whatever ability might otherwise have existed, to digest the heavy load. The fittest temperature for drinks, if taken when the food is in the digesting process, is blood heat. Cool drinks, and even ice, can be safely taken at other times if not an excessive quantity. When the thirst is excessive, or the body weakened by fatigue, or when in a state of perspiration, cold drinks are injurious. When the body is perspiring freely, taking a large quantity of cold drink has often produced instant death. Fluids taken into the stomach are not subject to the slow process of digestion, but are immediately absorbed and carried into the blood. This is the reason why drink more speedily than food, restores from exhaustion. The minute vessels of the stomach inhale or absorb its fluids, which are carried into the blood, just as the minute extremities of the arteries open upon the inner surface of the stomach, and there exude the gastric juice from the blood. When food is chiefly liquid, soup, for example, the fluid part is rapidly absorbed. The solid parts remain, to be acted on by the gastric juice. In the case of St. Martin, F., in 50 minutes after taking soup, the fluids were absorbed, and the remainder was even thicker than is usual after eating solid food. This is the reason why soups are deemed bad for weak stomachs, as this residuum is more difficult of digestion than ordinary food. In recovering from sickness, beef tea and broths are good because the system then demands fluids to supply its loss of blood. Highly concentrated food, having much nourishment in a small bulk, is not favorable to digestion, because it cannot be properly acted on by the muscular contractions of the stomach, and is not so minutely divided, as to enable the gastric juice to act properly. This is the reason, why a certain bulk of food is needful to good digestion, and why those people, who live on whale oil, and other highly nourishing food, in cold climates, mix vegetables and even sawdust with it, to make it more acceptable and digestible. So, in civilized lands, bread, potatoes, and vegetables, are mixed with more highly concentrated nourishment. This explains why coarse bread, of unbolted wheat, so often proves beneficial. Where, from inactive habits, or other causes, the bowels become constipated and sluggish, this kind of food proves the appropriate remedy. One fact on this subject is worthy of notice. Under the administration of William Pitt, for two years or more, there was such a scarcity of wheat, that, to make it hold out longer, Parliament passed to law, that the army should have all their bread made of unbolted flour. The result was, that the health of the soldiers improved so much as to be a subject of surprise to themselves, the officers, and the physicians. These last came out publicly, and declared, that the soldiers never before were so robust and healthy, and that disease had nearly disappeared from the army. The civic physicians joined and pronounced it the healthiest bread, and, for a time, schools, families, and public institutions, used it almost exclusively. Even the nobility, convinced by these facts, adopted it for their common diet, and the fashion continued a long time after the scarcity ceased, until more luxurious habits resumed their sway. For this reason, also, soups, jellies, and arrowroot, should have bread or crackers mixed with them. We thus see why children should not have cakes and candies allowed them between meals. These are highly concentrated nourishments 
and should be eaten with more bulky and less nourishing substances. The most indigestible of all kinds of food, are fatty and oily substances, especially if heated. It is on this account, that pie crust, and articles boiled and fried in fat or butter, are deemed not so healthful as other food. The following, then, may be put down as the causes of a debilitated constitution, from the misuse of food. Eating too much, eating too often, eating too fast, eating food and condiments that are too stimulating, eating food that is too warm or too cold, eating food that is highly concentrated, without a proper admixture of less nourishing matter, and eating food that is difficult of digestion. Footnote, F. The individual here referred to, comma, Alexis St. Martin, comma, was a young Canadian, of 18 years of age, of a good constitution, and robust health, who, in 1822, was accidentally wounded by the discharge of a musket, which carried away a part of the ribs, lacerated one of the lobes of the lungs, and perforated the stomach, making a large aperture, which never closed, and which enabled Dr. Beaumont, a surgeon of the American army, stationed at Michilimackinac, under whose care the patient was placed, to witness all the processes of digestion and other functions of the body, for several years. The published account of the experiments made by Dr. B., is highly interesting and instructive. Chapter 7. On Healthful Drinks. Although intemperance in eating is probably the most prolific cause of the diseases of mankind, intemperance in drink has produced more guilt, misery, and crime, than any other one cause. And the responsibilities of a woman, in this particular, are very great, for the habits and liabilities of those under her care will very much depend on her opinions and practice. It is a point fully established by experience, that the full development of the human body, and the vigorous exercise of all its functions, can be secured without the use of stimulating drinks. It is, therefore, perfectly safe, to bring up children never to use them, no hazard being incurred, by such a course. It is also found, by experience, that there are two evils incurred by the use of stimulating drinks. The first, is, their positive effect on the human system. Their peculiarity consists in so exciting the nervous system, that all the functions of the body are accelerated, and the fluids are caused to move quicker than at their natural speed. This increased motion of the animal fluids, always produces an agreeable effect on the mind. The intellect is invigorated, the imagination is excited, the spirits are enlivened, and these effects are so agreeable, that all mankind, after having once experienced them, feel a great desire for their repetition. But this temporary invigoration of the system, is always followed by a diminution of the powers of the stimulated organs, so that, though in all cases this reaction may not be perceptible, it is invariably the result. It may be set down as the unchangeable rule of physiology, that stimulating drinks, except in cases of disease, deduct from the powers of the constitution, in exactly the proportion in which they operate to produce temporary invigoration. The second evil, is, the temptation which always attends the use of stimulants. Their effect on the system is so agreeable, and the evils resulting are so imperceptible and distant, that there is a constant tendency to increase such excitement, both in frequency and power. And the more the system is thus reduced in strength, the more craving is the desire for that which imparts a temporary invigoration. This process of increasing debility and increasing craving for the stimulus that removes it, often goes to such an extreme, that the passion is perfectly uncontrollable, and mind and body perish under this baleful habit. In this country, there are five forms in which the use of such stimulants is common, namely, alcoholic drinks, tea, coffee, opium mixtures, and tobacco. These are all alike, in the main peculiarity of imparting that extra stimulus to the system, which tends to exhaust its powers. Multitudes in this nation are in the habitual use of some one of these stimulants, and each person defends the indulgence by these arguments first, that the desire for stimulants is a natural propensity, implanted in man's nature, 
as is manifest from the universal tendency to such indulgences, in every nation. From this, it is inferred, that it is an innocent desire, which ought to be gratified, to some extent, and that the aim should be, to keep it within the limits of temperance, instead of attempting to exterminate a natural propensity. This is an argument, which, if true, makes it equally proper to use opium, brandy, tea, or tobacco, as stimulating principles, provided they are used temperately. But, if it be granted that perfect health and strength can be gained and secured without these stimulants, and that their peculiar effect is to diminish the power of the system, in exactly the same proportion as they stimulate it, then there is no such thing as a temperate use, unless they are so diluted, as to destroy any stimulating power, and in this form, they are seldom desired. The other argument for their use, is, that they are among the good things provided by the Creator, for our gratification, that, like all other blessings, they are exposed to abuse and excess, and that we should rather seek to regulate their use, than to banish them entirely. This argument is based on the assumption, that they are, like healthful foods and drinks, necessary to life and health, and injurious only by excess. But this is not true, for, whenever they are used in any such strength as to be a gratification, they operate, to a greater or less extent, as stimulants, and, to just such extent, they wear out the powers of the constitution, and it is abundantly proved, that they are not, like food and drink, necessary to health. Such articles are designed for medicine, and not for common use. There can be no argument framed to defend the use of one of them, which will not equally defend all. That men have a love for being stimulated, after they have once felt the pleasurable excitement, and that providence has provided the means for securing it, are arguments as much in favor of alcohol, opium, and tobacco, as of coffee and tea. All that can be said in favor of the last mentioned favorite beverages, is, that the danger in their use is not so great. Let anyone, who defends one kind of stimulating drink, remember, then, that he uses an argument, which, if it be allowed that stimulants are not needed, and are injurious, will equally defend all kinds, and that all which can be said in defense of tea and coffee, is, that they may be used, so weak, as to do no harm, and that they actually have done less harm than some of the other stimulating narcotics. The writer is of opinion that tea and coffee are a most extensive cause of much of the nervous debility and suffering endured by American women, and that relinquishing such drinks would save an immense amount of such suffering. But there is little probability that the present generation will make so decided a change in their habits, as to give up these beverages, and the subject is presented rather in reference to forming the habits of children. It is a fact, that tea and coffee are, at first, seldom or never agreeable to children. It is the mixture of milk, sugar, and water, that reconciles them to a taste, which in this manner gradually becomes agreeable. Now, suppose that those who provide for a family conclude that it is not their duty to give up entirely the use of stimulating drinks, may not the case appear different, in regard to teaching their children to love such drinks? Let the matter be regarded thus colon the experiments of physiologists all prove, that stimulants are not needful to health, and that, as the general rule, they tend to debilitate the constitution. Is it right, then, for a parent to tempt a child to drink what is not needful, when there is a probability that it will prove, to some extent, an undermining drain on the constitution? Some constitutions can bear much less excitement than others, and, in every family of children, there is usually one, or more, of delicate organization, and consequently peculiarly exposed to dangers from this source. It is this child who ordinarily becomes the victim to stimulating drinks. The tea and coffee which the parents and the healthier children can use without immediate injury, gradually sap the energies of the feebler child, who proves either an early victim, or a living martyr to all the sufferings that debilitated nerves inflict. Can it be right, to lead children, where all allow that there is some danger, and where, in many cases, disease and death are met, when another path is known to be perfectly safe? 
of the stimulating drinks in common use, black tea is least injurious, because its flavor is so strong, in comparison with its narcotic principle, that one who uses it, is much less liable to excess. Children can be trained to love milk and water sweetened with sugar, so that it will always be a pleasant beverage, or, if there are exceptions to the rule, they will be few. Water is an unfailing resort. Everyone loves it, and it is perfectly healthful. The impression, common in this country, that warm drinks, especially in winter, are more healthful than cold, is not warranted by any experience, nor by the laws of the physical system. At dinner, cold drinks are universal, and no one deems them injurious. It is only at the other two meals that they are supposed to be hurtful. There is no doubt that warm drinks are healthful, and more agreeable than cold, at certain times and seasons, but it is equally true, that drinks above blood heat are not healthful. If any person should hold a finger in hot water, for a considerable time, twice every day, it would be found that the finger would gradually grow weaker. The frequent application of the stimulus of heat, like all other stimulants, eventually causes debility. If, therefore, a person is in the habit of drinking hot drinks, twice a day, the teeth, throat, and stomach are gradually debilitated. This, most probably, is one of the causes of an early decay of the teeth, which is observed to be much more common among American ladies, than among those in European countries. It has been stated to the writer, by an intelligent traveler, who had visited Mexico, that it was rare to meet an individual with even a tolerable set of teeth, and that almost every grown person, he met in the street, had merely remnants of teeth. On inquiry into the customs of the country, it was found, that it was the universal practice to take their usual beverage at almost the boiling point, and this, doubtless, was the chief cause of the almost entire want of teeth in that country. In the United States, it cannot be doubted that much evil is done, in this way, by hot drinks. Most tea drinkers consider tea as ruined, if it stands until it reaches the healthful temperature for drink. The following extract from Dr. Andrew Coombe, presents the opinion of most intelligent medical men on this subject. G. Water is a safe drink for all constitutions, provided it be resorted to in obedience to the dictates of natural thirst, only, and not of habit. Unless the desire for it is felt, there is no occasion for its use during a meal. The primary effect of all distilled and fermented liquors, is, to stimulate the nervous system and quicken the circulation. In infancy and childhood, the circulation is rapid, and easily excited, and the nervous system is strongly acted upon, even by the slightest external impressions. Hence slight causes of irritation readily excite febrile and convulsive disorders. In youth, the natural tendency of the constitution is still to excitement, and consequently, as a general rule, the stimulus of fermented liquors is injurious. These remarks show, that parents, who find that stimulating drinks are not injurious to themselves, may mistake an inferring, from this, that they will not be injurious to their children. Dr. Coombe continues thus, in mature age, when digestion is good and the system in full vigor, if the mode of life be not too exhausting, the nervous functions and general circulation are in their best condition, and require no stimulus for their support. The bodily energy is then easily sustained, by nutritious food and a regular regimen, and consequently artificial excitement only increases the wasting of the natural strength. In old age, when the powers of life begin to fail, moderate stimulus may be used with evident advantage. It may be asked, in this connection, why the stimulus of animal food is not to be regarded in the same light, as that of stimulating drinks. In reply, a very essential difference may be pointed out. Animal food furnishes nutriment to the organs which it stimulates, but stimulating drinks excite the organs to quicken action, without affording any nourishment. It has been supposed, by some, that tea and coffee have, at least, a degree of nourishing power. But it is proved, that it is the milk and sugar, and not the main portion of the drink, which imparts the nourishment. 
Tea has not one particle of nourishing properties, and what little exists in the coffee berry, is lost by roasting it in the usual mode. All that these articles do, is simply to stimulate, without nourishing. It is very common, especially in schools, for children to form a habit of drinking freely of cold water. This is a debilitating habit, and should be corrected. Very often, chewing a bit of cracker will stop a craving for drink, better than taking water, and when teachers are troubled with very thirsty scholars, they should direct them to this remedy. A person who exercises but little, requires no drink, between meals, for health, and the craving for it is unhealthful. Spices, wines, fermented liquors, and all stimulating condiments, produce unhealthful thirst. Footnote, G, the writer would here remark, in reference to extracts made from various authors, that, for the sake of abridging, she has often left out parts of a paragraph but never so as to modify the meaning of the author. Some ideas, not connected with the subject in hand, are omitted, but none are altered. Chapter 8. On clothing. It appears, by calculations made from bills of mortality, that one quarter of the human race perishes in infancy. This is a fact not in accordance with the analogy of nature. No such mortality prevails among the young of animals, it does not appear to be the design of the Creator and it must be owing to causes which can be removed. Medical men agree in the opinion, that a great portion of this mortality, is owing to mismanagement, in reference to fresh air, food, and clothing. At birth, the circulation is chiefly in the vessels of the skin, for the liver and stomach, being feeble in action, demand less blood, and it resorts to the surface. If, therefore, an infant be exposed to cold, the blood is driven inward, by the contracting of the blood vessels in the skin, and, the internal organs being thus overstimulated, bowel complaints, group, convulsions, or some other evil, ensues. This shows the sad mistake of parents, who plunge infants in cold water to strengthen their constitution, and teaches, that infants should be washed in warm water, and in a warm room some have constitutions strong enough to bear mismanagement in these respects, but many fail in consequence of it. Hence we see the importance of dressing infants warmly, and protecting them from exposure to a cold temperature. It is for this purpose, that mothers, now, very generally, cover the arms and necks of infants, especially in winter. Fathers and mothers, if they were obliged to go with bare arms and necks, even in moderate weather, would often shiver with cold, and yet they have a power of constitution which would subject them to far less hazard and discomfort, than a delicate infant must experience from a similar exposure. This mode of dressing infants, with bare necks and arms, has arisen from the common impression, that they have a power of resisting cold superior to older persons. This is a mistake, for the experiments of medical men have established the fact, that the power of producing heat is least in the period of infancy. Extensive investigations have been made in France, in reference to this point. It is there required, in some districts, that every infant, at birth, be carried to the office of the mayor, mayor, to be registered. It is found, in these districts, that the deaths of newly born infants, are much more numerous in the cold, than in the warm, months and that a much greater proportion of such deaths occurs among those who reside at a distance from the office of the mayor, than among those in its vicinity. This proves, that exposure to cold has much to do with the continuance of infant life. But it is as dangerous to go to the other extreme, and keep the body too warm. The skin, when kept at too high a temperature, is relaxed and weakened by too profuse perspiration, and becomes more sensitive and more readily affected by every change of temperature. This increases the liabilities to sudden colds, and it frequently happens, that the children, who are most carefully guarded from cold, are the ones most liable to take sudden and dangerous chills. The reason is, that, by the too great accumulation of clothing, the skin is too much excited, and the blood is withdrawn from the internal organs, thus weakening them while the skin itself is debilitated by the same process. The rule of safety, is, so to cover the body, 
as to keep it entirely warm, but not so as to induce perspiration in any part. The perspiration induced by exercise is healthful, because it increases the appetite, but the perspiration produced by excessive clothing is debilitating. This shows the importance of adjusting beds and their covering to the season. Feather beds are unhealthful in warm weather, because they induce perspiration, and in all cases, those, who have the care of children, should proportion their covering by night to the season of the year. Infants and children should never be so clothed, as either to feel chilly, or to induce perspiration. The greatest trouble, in this respect, to those who have the care of children, is owing to their throwing off their covering in the night. The best guard, against such exposures, is a nightgown, of the warmest and thickest flannel, made like pantaloons at the lower part, and the legs long, so that they can be tied over the feet. This makes less covering needful, and saves the child from excessive cold when it is thrown off. The clothing ought always to be proportioned to the constitution and habits. A person of strong constitution, who takes much exercise, needs less clothing than one of delicate and sedentary habits. According to this rule, women need much thicker and warmer clothing, when they go out, than men. But how different are our customs, from what sound wisdom dictates? Women go out with thin stockings, thin shoes, and open necks, when men are protected by thick woolen hose and boots and their whole body encased in many folds of flannel and broadcloth. Flannel, worn next the skin, is useful, for several reasons. It is a bad conductor of heat, so that it protects the body from sudden chills when in a state of perspiration. It also produces a kind of friction on the skin, which aids it in its functions, while its texture, being loose, enables it to receive and retain much matter, thrown off from the body which would otherwise accumulate on its surface. This is the reason, why medical men direct, that young children wear flannel next the body, and woolen hose, the first two years of life. They are thus protected from sudden exposures. For the same reason, laboring men should thus wear flannels, which are also considered as preservatives from infection, in unhealthy atmospheres. They give a healthy action to the skin and thus enable it to resist the operation of unhealthy miasms. On this account, persons residing in a new country should wear such clothing next the skin, to guard them from the noxious miasms caused by extensive vegetable decompositions. It is stated, that the fatal influence of the malaria, or noxious exhalations around Rome, has been much diminished by this practice. But those who thus wear flannel, through the day, ought to take it off at night, when it is not needed. It should be hung so that it can be well aired, during the night. But the practice, by which females probably suffer most, is, the use of tight dresses. Much has been said against the use of corsets by ladies. But these may be worn with perfect safety, and be left off, and still injury, such as they often produce, be equally felt. It is the constriction of dress, that is to be feared and not any particular article that produces it. A frock, or a belt, may be so tight, as to be even worse than a corset, which would more equally divide the compression dot so long as it is the fashion to admire, as models of elegance, the wasp-like figures which are presented at the rooms of Mantua makers and milliners, there will be hundreds of foolish women, who will risk their lives and health to secure some resemblance to these deformities of the human frame. But it is believed, that all sensible women, when they fairly understand the evils which result from tight dressing, and learn the real model of taste and beauty for a perfect female form, will never risk their own health, or the health of their daughters, in efforts to secure one which is as much at variance with good taste, as it is with good health. Such female figures as our print shops present, are made, not by the hand of the author of all grace and beauty but by the murderous contrivances of the corset shop, and the more a woman learns the true rules of grace and beauty for the female form, the more her taste will revolt from such ridiculous distortions. The folly of the Chinese belle, who totters on two useless deformities, is nothing, compared to that of the American belle, 
who impedes all the internal organs in the discharge of their functions, that she may have a slender waist. It was shown, in the article on the bones and muscles, that exercise was indispensable to their growth and strength. If any muscles are left unemployed, they diminish in size and strength. The girding of tight dresses operates thus on the muscles of the body. If an article, like corsets, is made to hold up the body, then those muscles, which are designed for this purpose, are released from duty, and grow weak, so that, after this has been continued for some time, leaving off the unnatural support produces a feeling of weakness. Thus a person will complain of feeling so weak and unsupported, without corsets, as to be uncomfortable. This is entirely owing to the disuse of those muscles, which corsets throw out of employed. Another effect of tight dress, is, to stop or impede the office of the lungs. Unless the chest can expand, fully, and with perfect ease, a portion of the lungs is not filled with air, and thus the full purification of the blood is prevented. This movement of the lungs, when they are fully inflated, increases the peristaltic movement of the stomach and bowels, and promotes digestion, any constriction of the waist tends to impede this important operation, and indigestion, with all its attendant evils, is often the result. The rule of safety, in regard to the tightness of dress, is this. Every person should be dressed so loosely, that, when sitting in the posture used in sewing, reading, or study the lungs can be as fully and as easily inflated, as they are without clothing. Many a woman thinks she dresses loosely, because, when she stands up, her clothing does not confine her chest. This is not a fair test. It is in the position most used when engaged in common employments, that we are to judge of the constriction of dress. Let every woman, then, bear in mind, that, just so long as her dress and position oppose any resistance to the motion of her chest, in just such proportion her blood is unpurified, and her vital organs are debilitated. The English ladies set our country woman a good example, in accommodating their dress to times and seasons. The richest and noblest among them wear warm cotton hose and thick shoes, when they walk for exercise, and would deem it vulgar to appear, as many of our ladies do with thin hose and shoes, in damp or cold weather. Any mode of dress, not suited to the employment, the age, the season, or the means of the wearer, is in bad taste. Chapter 9. On cleanliness. The importance of cleanliness, in person and dress, can never be fully realized, by persons who are ignorant of the construction of the skin, and of the influence which its treatment has on the health of the body. Persons deficient in such knowledge, frequently sneer at what they deem the foolish and fidgety particularity of others, whose frequent ablutions and changes of clothing, exceed their own measure of importance. The popular maxim, that dirt is healthy, has probably arisen from the fact, that playing in the open air is very beneficial to the health of children, who thus get dirt on their persons and clothes. But it is the fresh air and exercise and not the dirt, which promotes the health. In a previous article, it was shown, that the lungs, bowels, kidneys, and skin, were the organs employed in throwing off those waste and noxious parts of the food not employed in nourishing the body. Of this, the skin has the largest duty to perform, throwing off, at least, 20 ounces every 24 hours, by means of insensible perspiration. When exercise sets the blood in quicker motion, it ministers its supplies faster, and there is consequently a greater residuum to be thrown off by the skin, and then the perspiration becomes so abundant as to be perceptible. In this state, if a sudden chill take place, the blood vessels of the skin contract, the blood is driven from the surface, and the internal organs are taxed with a double duty. If the constitution be a strong one, these organs march on and perform the labor exacted. But if any of these organs be debilitated, the weakest one generally gives way, and some disease ensues. One of the most frequent illustrations of this reciprocated action, is afforded by a convivial meeting in cold weather. The heat of the room, the food, and the excitement, quicken the circulation, and perspiration is evolved. 
when the company passes into the cold air, a sudden revulsion takes place. The increased circulation continues, for some time after, but the skin being cooled, the blood retreats, and the internal organs are obliged to perform the duties of the skin as well as their own. Then, in case the lungs are the weakest organ, the mucus secretion becomes excessive, so that it would fill up the cells, and stop the breathing, were it not for the spasmodic effort called coughing, by which this substance is thrown out. In case the nerves are the weakest part of the system, such an exposure would result in pains in the head or teeth, or in some other nervous ailment. If the muscles be the weakest part, rheumatic affections will ensue, and if the bowels or kidneys be weakest, some disorder in their functions will result. But it is found, that the closing of the pores of the skin with other substances, tends to a similar result on the internal organs. In this situation, the skin is unable perfectly to perform its functions, and either the blood remains to a certain extent unpurified, or else the internal organs have an unnatural duty to perform. Either of these results tends to produce disease, and the gradual decay of the vital powers. Moreover, it has been shown, that the skin has the power of absorbing into the blood particles retained on its surface. In consequence of these peculiarities, the skin of the whole body needs to be washed, every day. This process removes from the pores the matter exhaled from the blood, and also that collected from the atmosphere and other bodies. If this process be not often performed, the pores of the skin fill up with the redundant matter expelled, and being pressed, by the clothing, to the surface of the body, the skin is both interrupted in its exhaling process and its absorbents take back into the system portions of the noxious matter. Thus the blood is not relieved to the extent designed, while it receives back noxious particles, which are thus carried to the lungs, liver, and every part of the system. This is the reason why the articles worn next to the skin should often be changed, and why it is recommended that persons should not sleep in the article they wear next the skin through the day. The alternate change and daring of the articles worn next the body by day or night, is a practice very favorable to the health of the skin. The fresh air has the power of removing much of the noxious effluvia received from the body by the clothing. It is with reference to this, that on leaving a bed, its covering should be thrown open and exposed to the fresh air. The benefit arising from a proper care of the skin, is the reason why bathing has been so extensively practiced by civilized nations. The Greeks and Romans considered bathing as indispensable to daily comfort, as much so, as their meals, and public baths were provided for all classes. In European countries, this practice is very prevalent, but there is no civilized nation which pays so little regard to the rules of health, on this subject, as our own. To wash the face, feet, hands, and neck, is the extent of the ablutions practiced by perhaps the majority of our people. In regard to the use of the bath, there is need of some information, in order to prevent danger from its misuse. Persons in good health, and with strong constitutions, can use the cold bath, and the shower bath, with entire safety and benefit. But if the constitution be feeble, cold bathing is injurious. If it is useful, It can be known by an invigorated feeling, and a warm glow on the skin, but if, instead of this, there be a feeling of debility, and the hands and feet become cold, it is a certain sign, that this kind of bathing is injurious. A bath at 95 degrees of Fahrenheit, is about the right temperature. A bath, blood warm, or a little cooler than the skin, is safe for all constitutions, if not protracted over half an hour. After bathing, the body should be rubbed with a brush or coarse towel, to remove the light scales of scarf skin, which adhere to it, and also to promote a healthful excitement. A bath should never be taken, till three hours after eating, as it interrupts the process of digestion, by withdrawing the blood from the stomach to the surface. Neither should it be taken, when the body is weary with exercise, nor be immediately followed by severe exercise. Many suppose that a warm bath exposes a person more readily to take cold, 
and that it tends to debilitate the system. This is not the case, unless it be protracted too long. If it be used so as to cleanse the skin, and give it a gentle stimulus, it is better able to resist cold than before the process. This is the reason why the Swedes and Russians can rush, reeking, out of their steam baths, and throw themselves into the snow, and not only escape injury, but feel invigorated. It is for a similar reason, that we suffer less in going into the cold, from a warm room, with our body entirely warm, than when we go out somewhat chilled. When the skin is warm, the circulation is active on the surface, and the cold does not so reduce its temperature, but that increased exercise will keep up its warmth. When families have no bathing establishment, every member should wash the whole person, on rising or going to bed, either in cold or warm water, according to the constitution. It is especially important, that children have the perspiration and other impurities, which their exercise and sports have occasioned, removed from their skin before going to bed. The hours of sleep are those when the body most freely exhales the waste matter of the system, and all the pores should be properly freed from impediments to this healthful operation. For this purpose, a large tin wash pan should be kept for children, just large enough, at bottom, for them to stand in, and flaring outward, so as to be very broad at top. A child can then be placed in it, standing, and washed with a sponge, without wetting the floor. Being small at bottom, it is better than a tub, it is not only smaller, but lighter, and requires less water. These remarks indicate the wisdom of those parents, who habitually wash their children, all over, before they go to bed. The chance of life and health, to such children, is greatly increased by this practice, and no doubt much of the suffering of childhood, from cutaneous eruptions, weak eyes, earache, colds, and fevers, is owing to a neglect of the skin. The care of the teeth should be made habitual to children, not merely as promoting an agreeable appearance, but as a needful preservative. The saliva contains tartar, an earthy substance, which is deposited on the teeth, and destroys both their beauty and health. This can be prevented, by the use of the brush, night and morning. But, if this be neglected, the deposit becomes hard and can be removed only by the dentist. If suffered to remain, it tends to destroy the health of the gums. They gradually decay, and thus the roots of the teeth become bare, and they often drop out. When children are shedding their first set of teeth, care should be taken, to remove them as soon as they become loose, otherwise the new teeth will grow awry. When persons have defective teeth, they can often be saved, by having them filled by a dentist. This also will frequently prevent the toothache. Children should be taught to take proper care of their nails. Long and dirty nails have a disagreeable appearance. When children wash, in the morning, they should be supplied with an instrument to clean the nails, and be required to use it. Chapter 10. On early rising. There is no practice, which has been more extensively eulogized, in all ages, than early rising and this universal impression, is an indication that it is founded on true philosophy. For, it is rarely the case, that the common sense of mankind fastens on a practice, as really beneficial, especially one that demands self-denial, without some substantial reason. This practice, which may justly be called a domestic virtue, is one, which has a peculiar claim to be styled American and democratic. The distinctive mark of aristocratic nations, is, a disregard of the great mass, and a disproportionate regard for the interests of certain privileged orders. All the customs and habits of such a nation, are, to a greater or less extent, regulated by this principle. Now the mass of any nation must always consist of persons who labor at occupations which demand the light of day. But in aristocratic countries, especially in England, Labor is regarded as the mark of the lower classes, and indolence is considered as one mark of a gentleman. This impression has gradually and imperceptibly, to a great extent, regulated their customs, so that, even in their hours of meals and repose, the higher orders aim at being different and distinct from those, who, by laborious pursuits, 
are placed below them. From this circumstance, while the lower orders labor by day, and sleep at night, the rich, the noble, and the honored, sleep by day, and follow their pursuits and pleasures by night. It will be found, that the aristocracy of London breakfast near midday, dine after dark, visit and go to Parliament between ten and twelve at night, and retire to sleep towards morning. In consequence of this, the subordinate classes, who aim at gentility, gradually fall into the same practice. The influence of this custom extends across the ocean, and here, in this democratic land, we find many, who measure their grade of gentility by the late hour at which they arrive at a party. And this aristocratic tendency is growing upon us, so that, throughout the nation, the hours for visiting and retiring are constantly becoming later, while the hours for rising correspond in lateness. The question, then, is one which appeals to American women, as a matter of patriotism, as having a bearing on those great principles of democracy, which we conceive to be equally the principles of Christianity. Shall we form our customs on the principle that labor is degrading, and indolence genteel? Shall we assume, by our practice, that the interests of the great mass are to be sacrificed for the pleasures and honors of a privileged few? Shall we ape the customs of aristocratic lands, in those very practices which result from principles and institutions that we condemn? Shall we not rather take the place to which we are entitled, as the leaders, rather than the followers, in the customs of society, turn back the tide of aristocratic inroads, and carry through the whole, not only of civil and political, but of social and domestic, life, the true principles of democratic freedom and equality? The following considerations may serve to strengthen an affirmative decision. The first, relates to the health of a family. It is a universal law of physiology, that all living things flourish best in the light. Vegetables, in a dark cellar, grow pale and spindling, H, and children, brought up in mines, are one and stinted. This universal law, indicates the folly of turning day into night, thus losing the genial influence which the light of day produces on all animated creation. There is another phenomenon in the physiology of nature, which equally condemns this practice. It has been shown, that the purification of the blood, in the lungs, is secured, by the oxygen of the atmosphere absorbing its carbon and hydrogen. This combination forms carbonic acid and water, which are expired from our lungs into the atmosphere. Now all the vegetable world undergoes a similar process. In the light of day, all the leaves of vegetables absorb carbon and expire oxygen, thus supplying the air with its vital principle, and withdrawing the more deleterious element. But, when the light is withdrawn, this process is reversed, and all vegetables exhale carbonic acid, and inspire the oxygen of the air. Thus it appears, that the atmosphere of day is much more healthful than that of the night, especially out of doors. Moreover, when the body is fatigued, it is much more liable to deleterious influences, from noxious particles in the atmosphere, which may be absorbed by the skin or the lungs. In consequence of this, the last hours of daily labor are more likely to be those of risk, especially to delicate constitutions. This is a proper reason for retiring to the house and to slumber, at an early hour, that the body may not be exposed to the most risk, when, after the exertions of the day, it is least able to bear it. The observations of medical men, whose inquiries have been directed to this point, have decided, that from six to eight hours, is the amount of sleep demanded by persons in health. Some constitutions require as much as eight, and others no more than six hours of repose. But eight hours is the maximum for all persons in ordinary health, with ordinary occupations. In cases of extra physical exertions, or the debility of disease, or a decayed constitution, more than this is required. Let eight hours, then, be regarded as the ordinary period required for sleep, by an industrious people, like the Americans. According to this, the practice of rising between four and five, and retiring between nine and ten, in summer, would secure most of the sunlight, and expose us the least to that period of the atmosphere, when it is most noxious. In winter, 
the night air is less deleterious, because the frost binds noxious exhalations, and vegetation ceases its inspiring and expiring process, and, moreover, as the constitution is more tried, in cold, than in warm, weather, and as in cold weather the body exhales less during the hours of sleep, it is not so injurious to protract our slumbers beyond the proper period, as it is in the warm months. But in winter, it is best for grown persons, in health, to rise as soon as they can see to dress, and retire so as not to allow more than eight hours for sleep. It thus appears, that the laws of our political condition, the laws of the natural world, and the constitution of our bodies, alike demand that we rise with the light of day to prosecute our employments, and that we retire within doors, when this light is withdrawn. In regard to the effects of protracting the time spent in repose, many extensive and satisfactory investigations have been made. It has been shown, that, during sleep, the body perspires most freely, while yet neither food nor exercise are ministering to its wants. Of course, if we continue our slumbers, beyond the time required to restore the body to its usual vigor, there is an unperceived undermining of the constitution, by this protracted and debilitating exhalation. This process, in a course of years, renders the body delicate, and less able to withstand disease, and in the result shortens life. Sir John Sinclair, who has written a large work on the causes of longevity, states, as one result of his extensive investigations, that he has never yet heard or read of a single case of great longevity, where the individual was not an early riser. He says, that he has found cases, in which the individual has violated some one of all the other laws of health, and yet lived to great age, but never a single instance, in which any constitution has withstood that undermining, consequent on protracting the hours of repose beyond the demands of the system. Another reason for early rising, is, that it is indispensable to a systematic and well-regulated family. At whatever hour the parents retire, children and domestics, wearied by play or labor, must retire early. Children usually awake with the dawn of light, and commence their play, while domestics usually prefer the freshness of morning for their labors. If, then, the parents rise at a late hour, they either induce a habit of protracting sleep in their children and domestics, or else the family is up, and at their pursuits, while their supervisors are in bed. Any woman, who asserts that her children and domestics, in the first hours of day, when their spirits are freshest, will be as well regulated without her presence, as with it, confesses that, which surely is little for her credit. It is believed, that any candid woman, whatever may be her excuse for late rising, will concede, that, if she could rise early, it would be for the advantage of her family. A late breakfast puts back the work, through the whole day, for every member of a family, and, if the parents thus occasion the loss of an hour or two, to each individual, who, but for their delay in the morning, would be usefully employed, they, alone, are responsible for all this waste of time. Is it said, that those, who wish to rise early, can go to their employments before breakfast? It may be replied, that, in most cases, it is not safe to use the eyes or the muscles in the morning, till the losses of the night have been repaired by food. In addition to this, it may be urged, that, where the parents set an example of the violation of the rules of health and industry, their influence tends in the wrong direction, so that whatever waste of time is induced, by a practice which they thus uphold, must be set down to their account. But the practice of early rising has a relation to the general interests of the social community, as well as to that of each distinct family. All that great portion of the community, who are employed in business and labor, find it needful to rise early, and all their hours of meals, and their appointments for business or pleasure, must be accommodated to these arrangements. Now, if a small portion of the community establish very different hours, it makes a kind of jostling, in all the concerns and interests of society. The various appointments for the public, such as meetings, schools, and business hours, must be accommodated to the mass, and not to individuals. The few, then, 
who establish domestic habits at variance with the majority, are either constantly interrupted in their own arrangements, or else are interfering with the rights and interests of others. This is exemplified in the case of schools. In families where latrizing is practiced, either hurry, irregularity, and neglect, are engendered in the family, or else the interests of the school, and thus of the community, are sacrificed. In this, and many other concerns, it can be shown, that the well-being of the bulk of the people, is, to a greater or less extent, impaired by this aristocratic practice. Let any teacher select the unpunctual scholars comma a class who most seriously interfere with the interests of the school semicolon and let men of business select those who cause the most waste of time and vexation, by unpunctuality, and it will be found, that they are among the late risers, and rarely among those who rise early. Thus, it is manifest, that late rising not only injures the person and family which practice it, but interferes with the rights and convenience of the community. Footnote, H, shooting into a long, small, store core root. Chapter 11. On domestic exercise. In the preceding chapters, we have noticed the various causes, which, one or all, operate to produce that melancholy delicacy and decay of the female constitution which are the occasion of so much physical and mental suffering throughout this country. These, in a more condensed form, may be enumerated thus a want of exercise, inducing softness in the bones, weakness in the muscles, inactivity in the digestive organs, and general debility in the nervous system, a neglect of the care of the skin, whereby the blood has not been properly purified, and the internal organs have been weakened a violation of the laws of health, in regard to food, by eating too much, too fast, and too often, by using stimulating food and drinks, by using them too warm or too cold, and by eating that which the power of the stomach is not sufficient to digest, a neglect of the laws of health, in regard to clothing, by dressing too tight, and by wearing too little covering, in cold and damp weather and especially by not sufficiently protecting the feet, a neglect to gain a proper supply of pure air, in sleeping apartments and schoolrooms, and too great a confinement to the house, the pursuit of exciting amusements at unseasonable hours, and the many exposures involved at such times, and lastly, sleeping by day, instead of by night, and protracting the hours of sleep, beyond the period of repose demanded for rest, thus exhausting, instead of recruiting, the energies of the system. But all the other causes, combined, probably, do not produce one half the evils, which result from a want of proper exercise. A person who keeps all the functions of the system in full play, by the active and frequent use of every muscle, especially if it be in the open air, gains a power of constitution, which can resist many evils that would follow from the other neglects and risks detailed. This being the case, there can be no subject, more important for mothers and young ladies to understand, than the influence on the health, both of body and mind, of the neglect or abuse of the muscular system. It has been shown, in the previous pages, that all the muscles of nerves and blood vessels, running in larger trunks, or minute branches, to every portion of the body. The experiments of Sir Charles Bell and others, have developed the curious fact, that each apparently single nerve, in reality consists of two distinct portions, running together in the same covering. One portion, is the nerve of sensation or feeling, the other, the nerve of motion. The nerves of sensation are those which are affected by the emotions and volitions of the mind, and the nerves of motion are those which impart moving power to the muscles. Experiments show, that, where the nerves issue from the spine, the nerve of sensation may be cut off without severing the nerve of motion, and then the parts, to which this nerve extends, lose the power of feeling, while the power of motion continues, and so, on the other hand, the nerve of motion may be divided, and, the nerve of sensation remaining uninjured, the power of feeling is retained, and the power of motion is lost. In certain nervous diseases, Sometimes a limb loses its power of feeling, and yet retains the power of motion, in other cases, the power of motion is lost, and the power of sensation is retained, 
and in other cases, still, when a limb is paralyzed, both the power of motion and of sensation are lost. Now, the nerves, like all other parts of the body, gain and lose strength, according as they are exercised. If they have too much, or too little, exercise, they lose strength, if they are exercised to a proper degree, they gain strength. When the mind is continuously excited, by business, study, or the imagination, the nerves of feeling are kept in constant action, while the nerves of motion are unemployed. If this is continued, for a long time, the nerves of sensation lose their strength, from overaction, and the nerves of motion lose their power, from inactivity. In consequence, there is a morbid excitability of the nervous, and a debility of the muscular, system, which may call exertion irksome and wearisome. The only mode of preserving the health of these systems, is, to keep up in them an equilibrium of action. For this purpose, occupations must be sought, which exercise the muscles, and interest the mind, and thus the equal action of both kinds of nerves is secured. This shows why exercise is so much more healthful and invigorating, when the mind is interested, than when it is not. As an illustration, let a person go shopping, with a friend, and have nothing to do, but look on, how soon do the continuous walking and standing weary. But suppose one, thus wearied, hears of the arrival of a very dear friend, she can instantly walk off a mile or two, to meet her, without the least feeling of fatigue. By this is shown the importance of furnishing, for young persons, exercise in which they will take an interest. Long and formal walks, merely for exercise, though they do some good, in securing fresh air and some exercise of the muscles, would be of triple benefit, if changed to amusing sports, or to the cultivation of fruits and flowers, in which it is impossible to engage, without acquiring a great interest. It shows, also, why it is far better to trust to useful domestic exercise, at home, than to send a young person out to walk, for the mere purpose of exercise. Young girls can seldom be made to realize the value of health, and the need of exercise to secure it, so as to feel much interest in walking abroad, when they have no other object. But, if they are brought up to minister to the comfort and enjoyment of themselves and others, by performing domestic duties, they will constantly be interested and cheered in their exercise, by the feeling of usefulness, and the consciousness of having performed their duty. There are few young persons, it is hoped, who are brought up with such miserable habits of selfishness and indolence, that they cannot be made to feel happier, by the consciousness of being usefully employed. And those who have never been accustomed to think or care for anyone but themselves, and who seem to feel little pleasure in making themselves useful, by wise and proper influences, can often be gradually awakened to the new pleasure of benevolent exertion to promote the comfort and enjoyment of others. And the more this sacred and elevating kind of enjoyment is tasted, the greater is the relish induced. Are their enjoyments, often cloy, but the heavenly pleasure, secured by virtuous industry and benevolence, while it satisfies, at the time, awakens fresh desires for so ennobling a good dot but, besides the favorable influence on the nervous and muscular system, thus gained, it has been shown, that exercise imparts fresh strength and vitality to all parts of the body. The exertion of the muscles quickens the flow of the blood, which thus ministers its supplies faster to every part of the body, and, of course, loses a portion of its nourishing qualities. When this is the case, the stomach assumes its mandate of hunger, calling for new supplies. When these are furnished, the action of the muscles again hastens a full supply to every organ, and thus the nerves, the muscles, the bones, the skin, and all the internal organs, are invigorated, and the whole body develops its powers, in fair proportions, fresh strength and full beauty. All the cosmetics of trade, all the labors of mantua makers, milliners, makers of corsets, shoe makers, and hairdressers, could never confer so clear and pure a skin, so fresh a color, so finely molded a form, and such cheerful health and spirits, as would be secured by training a child to obey the laws of the benevolent Creator.
in the appropriate employment of body and mind in useful domestic exercise, and the present habits of the wealthy, and even of those without wealth, which condemn young girls so exclusively to books or sedentary pursuits, are as destructive to beauty and grace, as they are to health and happiness. Every allowance should be made for the mistakes of mothers and teachers, to whom the knowledge which would have saved them from the evils of such a course has never been furnished, but as information, on these matters, is every year becoming more abundant, it is to be hoped, that the next generation, at least, may be saved from the evils which afflict those now on the stage. What a change would be made in the happiness of this country, if all the pale and delicate young girls should become blooming, healthful, and active, and all the enfeebled and careworn mothers should be transformed into such fresh, active, healthful, and energetic matrons, as are so frequently found in our motherland. It has been stated, that the excessive use of the muscles, as much as their inactivity, tends to weaken them. Nothing is more painful, than the keeping a muscle constantly on the stretch, without any relaxation or change. This can be realized, by holding out an arm, perpendicularly to the body, for 10 or 15 minutes, if anyone can so long bear the pain. Of course, confinement to one position, for a great length of time, tends to weaken the muscles thus strained. This shows the evil of confining young children to their seats, in the schoolroom, so much and so long as is often done. Having no backs to their seats, as is generally the case, the muscles, which are employed in holding up the body, are kept in a state of constant tension, till they grow feeble from overworking. Then, the child begins to grow crooked, and the parents, to remedy the evil, sometimes put on braces or corsets. These, instead of doing any good, serve to prevent the use of those muscles, which, if properly exercised, would hold the body straight, and thus they grow still weaker, from entire inactivity. If a parent perceives that a child is growing crooked, the proper remedy is, to withdraw it from all pursuits which tax one particular set of muscles, and turn it out to exercise in sports, or in gardening, in the fresh air, when all the muscles will be used, and the whole system strengthened. Or, if this cannot be done, sweeping, dusting, running of errands, and many household employments, which involve lifting, stooping, bending, and walking, are quite as good, and, on some accounts, better, provided the house is properly supplied with fresh air. Where persons have formed habits of inactivity, some caution is necessary, in attempting a change, this must be made gradually, and the muscles must never be excessively fatigued at any time. If this change be not thus gradually made, the weakness, at first caused by inactivity, will be increased by excessive exertion. A distinguished medical gentleman gives this rule, to direct us in regard to the amount of fatigue, which is safe and useful. A person is never too much fatigued, if one night of repose gives sufficient rest, and restores the usual strength. But, if the sleep is disturbed, and the person wakes with a feeling of weariness and languor, it is a sure indication that the exercise has been excessive. No more fatigue, then, should be allowed, than one night's rest will remedy. Some persons object to sweeping, on account of the dust inhaled. But free ventilation, frequent sweeping, and the use of damp sand, or damp Indian meal, or damp tea leaves, for carpets will secure a more clear atmosphere than is often found in the streets of cities. And the mother, who will hire domestics, to take away this and other domestic employments. Which would secure to her daughters, health, grace, beauty, and domestic virtues, and the young ladies, who consent to be deprived of these advantages, will probably live to mourn over the languor, discouragement, pain, and sorrow, which will come with ill health, as the almost inevitable result. The following are extracts from the young lady's friend, on this subject, whether rich or poor, young or old, married or single, a woman is always liable to be called to the performance of every kind of domestic duty, as well as to be placed at the head of a family, and nothing, 
short of a practical knowledge of the details of housekeeping, can ever make those duties easy, or render her competent to direct others in the performance of them? All moral writers on female character, treat of domestic economy as an indispensable part of female education, and this, too, in the old countries of Europe, where an abundant population, and the institutions of society, render it easy to secure services of faithful domestics. All female characters that are held up to admiration, whether in fiction or biography, will be found to possess these domestic accomplishments, and, if they are considered indispensable in the old world, how much more are they needed, in this land of independence, where riches cannot exempt the mistress of a family from the difficulty of procuring efficient aid, and where perpetual change of domestics, renders perpetual instruction and superintendence necessary. Since, then, the details of good housekeeping must be included in a good female education, it is very desirable that they should be acquired when young, and so practiced as to become easy, and to be performed dexterously and expeditiously. The elegant and accomplished Lady Mary Wortley Montagu, who figured in the fashionable, as well as the literary, circles of her time, has said, that the most minute details of household economy become elegant and refined, when they are ennobled by sentiment, and they are truly ennobled, when we do them either from a sense of duty, or consideration for a parent, or love to a husband. To furnish a room, continues this lady, is no longer a commonplace affair, shared with upholsterers and cabinet makers, it is decorating the place where I am to meet a friend or lover. To order dinner is not merely arranging a meal with my cook, it is preparing refreshment for him whom I love. These necessary occupations, viewed in this light, by a person capable of strong attachment, are so many pleasures, and afford her far more delight, than the games and shows which constitute the amusements of the world. Such is the testimony of a titled lady of the last century, to the sentiment that may be made to mingle in the most homely occupations. I will now quote that of a modern female writer and traveller, who, in her pleasant book, called Six Weeks on the Loire, has thus described the housewifery of the daughter of a French nobleman, residing in a superb chateau on that river. The travellers had just arrived, and been introduced, when the following scene took place. The bill of fare for dinner was discussed in my presence, and settled, sans face and I, with that delightful frankness and gaiety, which, in the French character, gives a charm to the most trifling occurrence. Mademoiselle Louise then begged me to excuse her for half an hour, as she was going to make some creams, and some pasties. J. I requested that I might accompany her, and also render myself useful, we accordingly went together to the dairy. I made tart sail and glaze, K., whilst she made confections and bonbons, L., and all manner of pretty things, with as much ease as if she had never done anything else, and as much grace as she displayed in the saloon. I could not help thinking, as I looked at her, with her servants about her, all cheerful, respectful, and anxious to attend upon her, how much better it would be for the young ladies in England, if they would occasionally return to the habits of their grandmamas, and mingle the animated and endearing occupations of domestic life and the modest manners and social amusements of home, with the perpetual practicing on harps and pianos, and the incessant efforts at display, and search after gaiety, which, at the present day, render them anything but what an amiable man, of a reflecting mind and delicate sentiments, would desire in the woman he might wish to select as the companion of his life. Footnotes, I, without formality, or useless ceremony. J. Rolls of paste, or pastry, or sugar plums. K. According to the English fashion. L. Nice things or dainties, such as sweetmeats. Chapter 12. On domestic manners. Good manners are the expressions of benevolence in personal intercourse, by which we endeavor to promote the comfort and enjoyment of others, and to avoid all that gives needless uneasiness. It is the exterior exhibition of the divine precept which requires us to do to others, as we would that they should do to us. It is saying, by our deportment, to all around, that we consider their feelings, tastes, and convenience, 
as equal in value to our own. Good manners lead us to avoid all practices which offend the taste of others, all violations of the conventional rules of propriety, all rude and disrespectful language and deportment, and all remarks, which would tend to wound the feelings of another. There is a serious defect, in the manners of the American people, especially in the free states, which can never be efficiently remedied, except in the domestic circle and during early life. It is a deficiency in the free expression of kindly feelings and sympathetic emotions, and a want of courtesy and deportment. The causes, which have led to this result, may easily be traced. The forefathers of this nation, to a wide extent, were men who were driven from their native land, by laws and customs which they believed to be opposed both to civil and religious freedom. The sufferings they were called to endure the subduing of those gentler feelings which bind us to country, kindred, and home, and the constant subordination of the passions to stern principle, induced characters of great firmness and self-control. They gave up the comforts and refinements of a civilized country, and came, as pilgrims, to a hard soil, a cold clime, and a heathen shore. They were continually forced to encounter danger, privations, sickness, loneliness, and death, and all these, their religion taught them to meet with calmness, fortitude, and submission. And thus it became the custom and habit of the whole mass, to repress, rather than to encourage, the expression of feeling. Persons who are called to constant and protracted suffering and privation, are forced to subdue and conceal emotion, for the free expression of it would double their own suffering, and increase the sufferings of others. Those, only, who are free from care and anxiety, and whose minds are mainly occupied by cheerful emotions, are at full liberty to unveil their feelings. It was under such stern and rigorous discipline, that the first children in New England were reared, and the manners and habits of parents are usually, to a great extent, transmitted to children. Thus it comes to pass, that the descendants of the Puritans, now scattered over every part of the nation, are predisposed to conceal the gentler emotions, while their manners are calm, decided, and cold, rather than free and impulsive. Of course, there are very many exceptions to these predominating results. The causes, to which we may attribute a general want of courtesy in manners, are certain incidental results of our democratic institutions. Our ancestors, and their descendants, have constantly been combating the aristocratic principle, which would exalt one class of men at the expense of another. They have had to contend with this principle, not only in civil, but in social, life. Almost every American, in his own person, as well as in behalf of his class, has had to assume and defend the main principle of democracy, comma, that every man's feelings and interests are equal in value to those of every other man. But, in doing this, there has been some want of clear discrimination. Because claims, based on distinctions of mere birth, fortune, or position, were found to be injurious, many have gone to the extreme of inferring that all distinctions, involving subordination, are useless. Such, would regard children as equals to parents, pupils to teachers, domestics to their employers, and subjects to magistrates, and that, too, in all respects. The fact, that certain grades of superiority and subordination are needful, both for individual and public benefit, has not been clearly discerned, and there has been a gradual tendency to an extreme, which has sensibly affected our manners. All the proprieties and courtesies, which depend on the recognition of the relative duties of superior and subordinate, have been warred upon, and thus we see, to an increasing extent, disrespectful treatment of parents from children, of teachers, from pupils, of employers, from domestics, and of the aged, from the young. In all classes and circles, there is a gradual decay in courtesy of address. In cases, too, where kindness is rendered, it is often accompanied with a cold, unsympathizing manner, which greatly lessens its value, while kindness or politeness is received in a similar style of coolness, as if it were but the payment of a just due. It is owing to these causes, that the American people, especially the inhabitants of New England, 
do not do themselves justice. For, while those, who are near enough to learn their real character and feelings, can discern the most generous impulses, and the most kindly sympathies, they are so veiled, in a composed and indifferent demeanor, as to be almost entirely concealed from strangers. These defects in our national manners, it especially falls to the care of mothers, and all who have charge of the young, to rectify, and if they seriously undertake the matter, and wisely adapt means to ends, these defects will be remedied. With reference to this object, the following ideas are suggested. The law of Christianity and of democracy, which teaches that all men are born equal, and that their interests and feelings should be regarded as of equal value, seems to be adopted in aristocratic circles, with exclusive reference to the class in which the individual moves. The courtly gentleman, addresses all of his own class with politeness and respect, and, in all his actions, seems to allow that the feelings and convenience of others are to be regarded, the same as his own. But his demeanor to those of inferior station, is not based on the same rule. Among those, who make up aristocratic circles, such as are above them, are deemed of superior, and such as are below, of inferior, value. Thus, if a young, ignorant, and vicious coxcomb, happens to be born a lord, the aged, the virtuous, the learned, and the well-bred, of another class, must give his convenience the precedence, and must address him in terms of respect. So, when a man of noble birth is thrown among the lower classes, he demeans himself in a style, which, to persons of his own class, would be deemed the height of assumption and rudeness. Now, the principles of democracy require, that the same courtesy, which we accord to our own circle, shall be extended to every class and condition, and that distinctions, of superiority and subordination, shall depend, not on accidents of birth, fortune, or occupation, but solely on those relations, which the good of all classes equally require. The distinctions demanded, in a democratic state, are simply those, which result from relations, that are common to every class, and are for the benefit of all. It is for the benefit of every class, that children be subordinate to parents, pupils to teachers, the employed to their employers, and subjects to magistrates. In addition to this, it is for the general well-being, that the comfort or convenience of the delicate and feeble, should be preferred to that of the strong and healthy, who would suffer less by any deprivation, and that precedence should be given to their elders, by the young, and that reverence should be given to the hoary head. The rules of good breeding, in a democratic state, must be founded on these principles. It is, indeed, assumed, that the value of the happiness of each individual, is the same as that of every other, but, as there must be occasions, where there are advantages which all cannot enjoy, there must be general rules for regulating a selection. Otherwise, there would be constant scrambling, among those of equal claims, and brute force must be the final resort, in which case the strongest would have the best of everything. The democratic rule, then, is, that superiors, in age, station, or office, of precedence of subordinates, age and feebleness, of youth and strength, and the feebler sex, of more vigorous man. M. There is, also, a style of deportment and address, which is appropriate to these different relations. It is suitable for a superior to secure compliance with his wishes, from those subordinate to him, by commands, but a subordinate must secure compliance with his wishes, from a superior, by requests. It is suitable for a parent, teacher, or employer, to admonish for neglect of duty, but not for an inferior to adopt such a course towards a superior. It is suitable for a superior to take precedence of a subordinate, without any remark, but not for an inferior, without previously asking leave, or offering an apology. It is proper for a superior to use language and manners of freedom and familiarity which would be improper from a subordinate to a superior. The want of due regard to these proprieties, occasions the chief defect in American manners. It is very common to hear children talk to their parents, in a style proper only between companions and equals, so, also, 
the young address their elders, those employed, their employers, and domestics, the members of the family and their visitors, in a style, which is inappropriate to their relative positions. A respectful address is required not merely towards superiors, every person desires to be treated with courtesy and respect, and therefore, the law of benevolence demands such demeanor, towards all whom we meet in the social intercourse of life. Be ye courteous, is the direction of the apostle in reference to our treatment of all. Good manners can be successfully cultivated, only in early life, and in the domestic circle. There is nothing which depends so much upon habit, as the constantly recurring proprieties of good breeding, and, if a child grows up without forming such habits, it is very rarely the case that they can be formed at a later period. The feeling, that it is of little consequence how we behave at home, if we conduct properly abroad, is a very fallacious one. Persons, who are careless and ill-bred at home, may imagine that they can assume good manners abroad, but they mistake. Fixed habits of tone, manner, language, and movements, cannot be suddenly altered, and those who are ill-bred at home, even when they try to hide their bad habits, are sure to violate many of the obvious rules of propriety and yet be unconscious of it. And there is nothing, which would so effectually remove prejudice against our democratic institutions, as the general cultivation of good breeding in the domestic circle. Good manners are the exterior of benevolence, the minute and often recurring exhibitions of peace and goodwill, and the nation, as well as the individual, which most excels in the external, as well as the internal, principle, will be most respected and beloved. The following are the leading points, which claim attention from those who have the care of the young. In the first place, in the family, there should be required, a strict attention to the rules of precedence, and those modes of address appropriate to the various relations to be sustained. Children should always be required to offer their superiors, in age or station, the precedence in all comforts and conveniences and always address them in a respectful tone and manner. The custom of adding sir, or ma'am, to yes, or no, is valuable, as a perpetual indication of a respectful recognition of superiority. It is now going out of fashion, even among the most well-bred people, probably from a want of consideration of its importance. Every remnant of courtesy of address, in our customs, should be carefully cherished by all who feel a value for the proprieties of good breeding. If parents allow their children to talk to them, and to the grown persons in the family, in the same style in which they address each other, it will be vain to hope for the courtesy of manner and tone, which good breeding demands in the general intercourse of society. In a large family, where the elder children are grown up, and the younger are small, it is important to require the latter to treat the elder as superiors. There are none, so ready as young children to assume airs of equality, and, if they are allowed to treat one class of superiors in age and character disrespectfully, they will soon use the privilege universally. This is the reason, why the youngest children of a family are most apt to be pert, forward, and unmannerly. Another point to be aimed at, is, to require children always to acknowledge every act of kindness and attention, either by words or manner. If they are so trained as always to make grateful acknowledgments, when receiving favors, one of the objectionable features in American manners will be avoided. Again, children should be required to ask leave, whenever they wish to gratify curiosity, or use an article which belongs to another. And if cases occur, when they cannot comply with the rules of good breeding, as, for instance, when they must step between a person and the fire, or take the chair of an older person, they should be required either to ask leave, or to offer an apology. There is another point of good breeding, which cannot, in all cases, be understood and applied by children, in its widest extent. It is that, which requires us to avoid all remarks which tend to embarrass, vex, mortify, or in any way wound the feelings, of another. To notice personal defects, to allude to others' faults, or the faults of their friends, to speak disparagingly of the sect or party to which a person belongs, to be inattentive, when addressed in conversation, to contradict flatly, 
to speak in contemptuous tones of opinions expressed by another semicolon all these, are violations of the rules of good breeding, which children should be taught to regard. Under this head, comes the practice of whispering, and staring about, when a teacher, or lecturer, or clergyman, is addressing a class or audience. Such inattention, is practically saying, that what the person is uttering is not worth attending to, and persons of real good breeding always avoid it. Loud talking and laughing, in a large assembly, even when no exercises are going on, yawning and gaping in company, and not looking in the face a person who is addressing you, are deemed marks of ill breeding. Another branch of good manners, relates to the duties of hospitality. Politeness requires us to welcome visitors with cordiality, to offer them the best accommodations, to address conversation to them, and to express, by tone and manner, kindness and respect. Offering the hand to all visitors, at one's own house, is a courteous and hospitable custom, and a cordial shake of the hand, when friends meet, would abate much of the coldness of manner ascribed to Americans. The last point of good breeding, to be noticed, refers to the conventional rules of propriety and good taste. Of these, the first class relates to the avoidance of all disgusting or offensive personal habits, such as fingering the hair, cleaning the teeth or nails, picking the nose, spitting on carpets, snuffing, instead of using a handkerchief, or using the article in an offensive manner, lifting up the boots or shoes, as some men do, to tend them on the knee, or to finger them semicolon all these tricks, either at home or in society children should be taught to avoid. Another branch, under this head, may be called table manners. To persons of good breeding, nothing is more annoying, than violating the conventional proprieties of the table. Reaching over another person's plate, standing up, to reach distant articles, instead of asking to have them passed, using one's own knife, and spoon, for butter, salt, or sugar when it is the custom of the family to provide separate utensils for the purpose, setting cups, with tea dripping from them, on the tablecloth, instead of the mats or small plates furnished, using the tablecloth, instead of the napkins, eating fast, and in a noisy manner, putting large pieces in the mouth, looking and eating as if very hungry, or as if anxious to get at certain dishes, sitting at too great a distance from the table, and dropping food laying the knife and fork on the tablecloth, instead of on the bread, or the edge of the plate semicolon all these particulars, children should be taught to avoid. It is always desirable, too, to require children, when at table with grown persons, to be silent, except when addressed by others, or else their chattering will interrupt the conversation and comfort of their elders. They should always be required, too, to wait, in silence, till all the older persons are helped. All these things should be taught to children, gradually, and with great patience and gentleness. Some parents, with whom good manners is a great object, are in danger of making their children perpetually uncomfortable, by suddenly surrounding them with so many rules, that they must inevitably violate some one or other, a great part of the time. It is much better to begin with a few rules, and be steady and persevering with these, till a habit is formed, and then take a few more, thus making the process easy and gradual. Otherwise, the temper of children will be injured, or, helpless of fulfilling so many requisitions, they will become reckless and indifferent to all. But, in reference to those who have enjoyed advantages for the cultivation of good manners, and who duly estimate its importance, one caution is necessary. Those, who never have had such habits formed in youth, are under disadvantages, which no benevolence of temper can remedy. They may often violate the tastes and feelings of others, not from a want of proper regard for them, but from ignorance of custom, or want of habit, or abstraction of mind, or from other causes, which demand forbearance and sympathy, rather than displeasure. An ability to bear patiently with defects in manners and to make candid and considerate allowance for a want of advantages, or for peculiarities and mental habits, is one mark of the benevolence of real good breeding. The advocates of monarchical and aristocratic institutions, 
have always had great plausibility given to their views, by the seeming tendencies to insubordination and bad manners, of our institutions. And it has been too indiscriminately conceded, by the defenders of the latter, that such are these tendencies, and that the offensive points, in American manners, are the necessary result of democratic principles. But it is believed, that both facts and reasoning are in opposition to this opinion. The following extract from the work of de Tocqueville, exhibits the opinion of an impartial observer, when comparing American manners with those of the English, who are confessedly the most aristocratic of all people. He previously remarks on the tendency of aristocracy to make men more sympathizing with persons of their own peculiar class, and less so towards those of lower degree, and he then contrasts American manners with the English claiming that the Americans are much the most affable, mild, and social. In America, where the privileges of birth never existed, and where riches confer no peculiar rights on their possessors, men acquainted with each other are very ready to frequent the same places, and find neither peril nor advantage in the free interchange of their thoughts. If they meet, by accident, they neither seek nor avoid intercourse, their manner is therefore natural, frank, and open. If their demeanor is often cold and serious, it is never haughty or constrained. But an aristocratic pride is still extremely great among the English, and, as the limits of aristocracy are ill-defined, everybody lives in constant dread, lest advantage should be taken of his familiarity. Unable to judge, at once, of the social position of those he meets, an Englishman prudently avoids all contact with them. Men are afraid, lest some slight service rendered should draw them into an unsuitable acquaintance, they dread civilities, and they avoid the obtrusive gratitude of a stranger, as much as his hatred. Thus, facts seem to show that when the most aristocratic nation in the world is compared, as to manners, with the most democratic, the judgment of strangers is in favor of the latter. Dot, and if good manners are the outward exhibition of the democratic principle of impartial benevolence and equal rights, surely the nation which adopts this rule, both in social and civil life, is the most likely to secure a desirable exterior. The aristocrat, by his principles, extends the exterior of impartial benevolence to his own class, only, the democratic principle, requires it to be extended to all. There is reason, therefore, to hope and expect more refined and polished manners in America, than in any other land, while all the developments of taste and refinement, such as poetry, music, painting, sculpture, and architecture, it may be expected, will come to a higher state of perfection, here, than in any other nation. If this country increases in virtue and intelligence, as it may, there is no end to the wealth which will pour in as the result of our resources of climate, soil, and navigation, and the skill, industry, energy, and enterprise, of our countrymen. This wealth, if used as intelligence and virtue dictate, will furnish the means for a superior education to all classes, and every facility for the refinement of taste, intellect, and feeling. Moreover, in this country, labor is ceasing to be the badge of a lower class, so that already it is disreputable for a man to be a lazy gentleman. And this feeling must increase, till there is such an equalization of labor, as will afford all the time needful for every class to improve the many advantages offered to them. Already, in Boston, through the munificence of some of her citizens, there are literary and scientific advantages, offered to all classes, rarely enjoyed elsewhere. In Cincinnati, too, the advantages of education, now offered to the poorest classes, without charge, surpass what, some years ago, most wealthy men could purchase. For any price. And it is believed, that a time will come, when the poorest boy in America can secure advantages which will equal what the heir of the proudest peerage can now command. The records of the courts of France and Germany, as detailed by the Duchess of Orleans, in and succeeding the brilliant reign of Louis XIV, a period which was deemed the acme of elegance and refinement, exhibit a grossness, of vulgarity, and a coarseness, not to be found among the lowest of our respectable poor. 
and the biography of Beau Nash, who attempted to reform the manners of the gentry, in the times of Queen Anne, exhibits violations of the rules of decency among the aristocracy, which the commonest yeoman of this land would feel disgraced in perpetrating. This shows, that our lowest classes, at this period, are more refined, than were the highest in aristocratic lands, a hundred years ago, and another century may show the lowest classes, in wealth, in this country, attaining as higher polish, as adorns those who now are leaders of good manners in the courts of kings. Footnote, M. The universal practice of this nation, in thus giving precedence to woman, has been severely commented on by Miss Martin and some others, who would transfer all the business of the other sex to women, and then have them treated like men. May this evidence of our superior civilization and Christianity increase, rather than diminish. Chapter 13. On the preservation of a good temper in a housekeeper. There is nothing, which has a more abiding influence on the happiness of a family, than the preservation of equable and cheerful temper and tones in the housekeeper. A woman, who is habitually gentle, sympathizing, forbearing, and cheerful, carries an atmosphere about her, which imparts a soothing and sustaining influence, and renders it easier for all to do right, under her administration, than in any other situation. The writer has known families, where the mother's presence seemed the sunshine of the circle around her, imparting a cheering and vivifying power, scarcely realized, till it was withdrawn. Everyone, without thinking of it, or knowing why it was so, experienced a peaceful and invigorating influence, as soon as he entered the sphere illumined by her smile, and sustained by her cheering kindness and sympathy. On the contrary, many a good housekeeper, good in every respect but this, by wearing a countenance of anxiety and dissatisfaction, and by indulging in the frequent use of sharp and reprehensive tones, more than destroys all the comfort which otherwise would result from her system, neatness, and economy. There is a secret, social sympathy, which every mind, to a greater or less degree, experiences with the feelings of those around, as they are manifested by the countenance and voice. A sorrowful, a discontented, or an angry, countenance, produces a silent, sympathetic influence, imparting a sombre shade to the mind, while tones of anger or complaint still more effectually jar the spirits. No person can maintain a quiet and cheerful frame of mind, while tones of discontent and displeasure are sounding on the ear. We may gradually accustom ourselves to the evil, till it is partially diminished, but it always is an evil, which greatly interferes with the enjoyment of the family state. There are sometimes cases, where the entrance of the mistress of a family seems to awaken a slight apprehension, in every mind around, as if each felt in danger of a reproof, for something either perpetrated or neglected. A woman, who should go around her house with a small stinging snapper, which she habitually applied to those whom she met, would be encountered with feelings very much like to those which are experienced by the inmates of a family, where the mistress often uses her countenance and voice to inflict similar penalties for duties neglected. Yet, there are many allowances to be made for housekeepers, who sometimes imperceptibly and unconsciously fall into such habits. A woman, who attempts to carry out any plans of system, order, and economy, and who has her feelings and habits conform to certain rules, is constantly liable to have her plans crossed, and her taste violated, by the inexperience or inattention of those about her. And no housekeeper, whatever may be her habits, can escape the frequent recurrence of negligence or mistake, which interferes with her plans. It is probable, that there is no class of persons, in the world, who have such incessant trials of temper, and temptations to be fretful, as American housekeepers. For a housekeeper's business is not, like that of the other sex, limited to a particular department, for which previous preparation is made. It consists of ten thousand little disconnected items, which can never be so systematically arranged, that there is no daily jostling, somewhere. And in the best regulated families, it is not unfrequently the case, that some act of forgetfulness or carelessness, from some member, will disarrange the business of the whole day, 
so that every hour will bring renewed occasion for annoyance. And the more strongly a woman realizes the value of time, and the importance of system and order, the more will she be tempted to irritability and complaint. The following considerations may aid in preparing a woman to meet such daily crosses, with even a cheerful temper and tones. In the first place, a woman, who has charge of a large household, should regard her duties as dignified, important, and difficult. The mind is so made, as to be elevated and cheered by a sense of far reaching influence and usefulness. A woman, who feels that she is a cipher, and that it makes little difference how she performs her duties, has far less to sustain and invigorate her, than one, who truly estimates the importance of her station. A man, who feels that the destinies of a nation are turning on the judgment and skill with which he plans and executes, has a pressure of motive, and an elevation of feeling, which are great safeguards from all that is low, trivial, and degrading. So, an American mother and housekeeper, who looks at her position in the aspect presented in the previous pages, and who rightly estimates the long train of influences which will pass down to thousands, whose destinies, from generation to generation, will be modified by those decisions of her will, which regulated the temper, principles, and habits, of her family, must be elevated above petty temptations, which would otherwise assail her dot again, a housekeeper should feel that she really has great difficulties to meet and overcome. A person, who wrongly thinks there is little danger, can never maintain so faithful a guard, as one who rightly estimates the temptations which beset her. Nor can one, who thinks that they are trifling difficulties which she has to encounter, and trivial temptations, to which she must yield, so much enjoyed the just reward of conscious virtue and self-control, as one who takes an opposite view of the subject. A third method, is, for a woman deliberately to calculate on having her best arranged plans interfered with, very often, and to be in such a state of preparation, that the evil will not come unawares. So complicated are the pursuits, and so diverse the habits of the various members of a family, that it is almost impossible for everyone to avoid interfering with the plans and taste of a housekeeper, in some one point or another. It is, therefore, most wise, for a woman to keep the loins of her mind ever girt, to meet such collisions with a cheerful and quiet spirit. Another important rule, is, to form all plans and arrangements in consistency with the means at command, and the character of those around. A woman, who has a heedless husband, and young children, and incompetent domestics, ought not to make such plans, as one may properly form, who will not, in so many directions, meet embarrassment. She must aim at just so much as she can probably secure, and no more, and thus she will usually escape much temptation, and much of the irritation of disappointment. The fifth, and a very important, consideration, is, that system, economy, and neatness, are valuable, only so far as they tend to promote the comfort and well-being of those affected. Some women seem to act under the impression, that these advantages must be secured at all events, even if the comfort of the family be the sacrifice. True, it is very important that children grow up in habits of system, neatness, and order, and it is very desirable that the mother give them every incentive, both by precept and example, but it is still more important, that they grow up with amiable tempers, that they learn to meet the crosses of life with patience and cheerfulness, and nothing has a greater influence to secure this than a mother's example. Whenever, therefore, a woman cannot accomplish her plans of neatness and order, without injury to her own temper, or to the temper of others, she ought to modify and reduce them, until she can dot the sixth method, relates to the government of the tones of voice. In many cases, when a woman's domestic arrangements are suddenly and seriously crossed, it is impossible not to feel some irritation but it is always possible to refrain from angry tones. A woman can resolve, that, whatever happens, she will not speak, till she can do it in a calm and gentle manner. Perfect silence is a safe resort, when such control cannot be attained, as enables a person to speak calmly, 
and this determination, persevered in, will eventually be crowned with success. Many persons seem to imagine that tones of anger are needful in order to secure prompt obedience. But observation has convinced the writer that they are never necessary, that in all cases, reproof, administered in calm tones, would be better. A case will be given in illustration. A young girl had been repeatedly charged to avoid a certain arrangement in cooking. On one day, when company was invited to dine, the direction was forgotten, and the consequence was, an accident, which disarranged everything, seriously injured the principal dish, and delayed dinner for an hour. The mistress of the family entered the kitchen, just as it occurred, and, at a glance, saw the extent of the mischief. For a moment, her eyes flashed, and her cheeks glowed, but she held her peace. After a minute or so, she gave directions, in a calm voice, as to the best mode of retrieving the evil, and then left, without a word said to the offender. After the company left, she sent for the girl, alone, and in a calm and kind manner pointed out the aggravations of the case, and described the trouble which had been caused to her husband, her visitors, and herself. She then portrayed the future evils which would result from such habits of neglect and inattention and the modes of attempting to overcome them, and then offered a reward for the future, if, in a given time, she succeeded in improving in this respect. Not a tone of anger was uttered, and yet the severest scolding of a practiced Xantip could not have secured such contrition, and determination to reform, as was gained by this method. But similar negligence is often visited by a continuous stream of complaint and reproof, which, in most cases, is met, either by sullen silence, or impertinent retort, while anger prevents any contrition, or any resolution of future amendment. It is very certain, that some ladies do carry forward a most efficient government, both of children and domestics, without employing tones of anger, and therefore they are not indispensable, nor on any account desirable. Though some ladies, of intelligence and refinement, do fall unconsciously into such a practice, it is certainly very unladylike, and in very bad taste, to scold, and the further a woman departs from all approach to it, the more perfectly she sustains her character as a lady. Another method of securing equanimity, amid the trials of domestic life, is, to cultivate a habit of making allowances for the difficulties, ignorance, or temptations, of those who violate rule or neglect duty. It is vain, and most unreasonable, to expect that consideration and care of a mature mind, in childhood and youth, or that persons, of such limited advantages as most domestics have enjoyed, should practice proper self-control, and possess proper habits and principles. Every parent, and every employer, needs daily to cultivate the spirit expressed in the divine prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The same allowances and forbearance, which we supplicate from our Heavenly Father, and desire from our fellow men, in reference to our own deficiencies, we should constantly aim to extend to all, who cross our feelings and interfere with our plans. The last, and most important, mode of securing a placid and cheerful temper and tones, is, by a right view of the doctrine of a superintending providence, all persons are too much in the habit of regarding the more important events of life, as exclusively under the control of perfect wisdom. But the fall of a sparrow, or the loss of a hair, they do not feel to be equally the result of his directing agency. In consequence of this, Christian persons, who aim at perfect and cheerful submission to heavy afflictions, and who succeed, to the edification of all about them, are sometimes sadly deficient under petty crosses. If a beloved child be laid in the grave, even if its death resulted from the carelessness of a domestic, or of a physician, the eye is turned from the subordinate agent, to the supreme guardian of all, and to him they bow, without murmur or complaint. But if a pudding be burned, or a room badly swept, or an errand forgotten, then vexation and complaint are allowed, just as if these events were not appointed by perfect wisdom as much as the sore chastisement. A woman, therefore, needs to cultivate the habitual feeling, 
that all the events of her nursery and kitchen, are brought about by the permission of our Heavenly Father, and that fretfulness or complaint, in regard to these, is, in fact, complaining and disputing at the appointments of God, and is really as sinful, as unsubmissive murmurs amid the sore chastisements of his hand. And a woman, who cultivates this habit of referring all the minor trials of life to the wise and benevolent agency of a heavenly parent, and daily seeks his sympathy and aid, to enable her to meet them with a quiet and cheerful spirit, will soon find it the perennial spring of abiding peace and content. Chapter 14 on habits of system and order. The discussion of the question of the equality of the sexes, in intellectual capacity, seems frivolous and useless, both because it can never be decided, and because there would be no possible advantage in the decision. But one topic, which is often drawn into this discussion, is of far more consequence, and that is, the relative importance and difficulty of the duties a woman is called to perform. It is generally assumed and almost as generally conceded, that woman's business and cares are contracted and trivial, and that the proper discharge of her duties, demands far less expansion of mind and vigor of intellect, than the pursuits of the other sex. This idea has prevailed, because women, as a mass, have never been educated with reference to their most important duties, while that portion of their employments, which is of least value, has been regarded as the chief if not the soul, concern of a woman. The covering of the body, the conveniences of residences, and the gratification of the appetite, have been too much regarded as the sole objects, on which her intellectual powers are to be exercised. But, as society gradually shakes off the remnants of barbarism, and the intellectual and moral interests of man rise, in estimation, above the merely sensual, a truer estimate is formed of woman's duties, and of the measure of intellect requisite for the proper discharge of them. Let any man, of sense and discernment, become the member of a large household, in which, a well-educated and pious woman is endeavouring systematically to discharge her multiform duties, let him fully comprehend all her cares, difficulties, and perplexities, and it is probable he would coincide in the opinion, that no statesman, at the head of a nation's affairs, had more frequent calls for wisdom, firmness, tact, discrimination, prudence, and versatility of talent, than such a woman. She has a husband, to whose peculiar tastes and habits she must accommodate herself, she has children, whose health she must guard, whose physical constitutions she must study and develop, whose temper and habits she must regulate, whose principles she must form, whose pursuits she must direct. She has constantly changing domestics, with all varieties of temper and habits, whom she must govern, instruct, and direct. She is required to regulate the finances of the domestic state, and constantly to adapt expenditures to the means and to the relative claims of each department. She has the direction of the kitchen, where ignorance, forgetfulness, and awkwardness, are to be so regulated, that the various operations shall each start at the right time, and all be in completeness at the same given hour. She has the claims of society to meet, calls to receive and return, and the duties of hospitality to sustain. She has the poor to relieve, benevolent societies to aid, the schools of her children to inquire and decide about, the care of the sick, the nursing of infancy, and the endless miscellany of odd items, constantly recurring in a large family. Surely, it is a pernicious and mistaken idea, that the duties, which tax a woman's mind, are petty, trivial, or unworthy of the highest grade of intellect and moral worth. Instead of allowing this feeling, every woman should imbibe, from early youth, the impression, that she is training for the discharge of the most important, the most difficult, and the most sacred and interesting duties that can possibly employ the highest intellect. She ought to feel, that her station and responsibilities, in the great drama of life, are second to none, either as viewed by her maker, or in the estimation of all minds whose judgment is most worthy of respect. She, who is the mother and housekeeper in a large family, is the sovereign of an empire, demanding more varied cares, and involving more difficult duties, 
than are really exacted of her, who, while she wears the crown, and professedly regulates the interests of the greatest nation on earth, finds abundant leisure for theatres, balls, horse races, and every gay pursuit. There is no one thing, more necessary to a housekeeper, in performing her varied duties, than a habit of system and order, and yet, the peculiarly desultory nature of women's pursuits, and the embarrassments resulting from the state of domestic service in this country, render it very difficult to form such a habit. But it is sometimes the case, that women, who could and would carry forward a systematic plan of domestic economy, do not attempt it, simply from a want of knowledge of the various modes of introducing it. It is with reference to such, that various modes of securing system and order, which the writer has seen adopted, will be pointed out. A wise economy is nowhere more conspicuous, than in the right apportionment of time to different pursuits. There are duties of a religious, intellectual, social, and domestic, nature, each having different relative claims on attention. Unless a person has some general plan of apportioning these claims, some will entrench on others, and some, it is probable, will be entirely excluded. Thus, some find religious, social, and domestic, duties, so numerous, that no time is given to intellectual improvement. Others, find either social, or benevolent, or religious, interests, excluded by the extent and variety of other engagements. It is wise, therefore, for all persons to devise a general plan, which they will at least keep in view, and aim to accomplish, and by which, a proper proportion of time shall be secured, for all the duties of life. In forming such a plan, every woman must accommodate herself to the peculiarities of her situation. If she has a large family, and a small income, she must devote far more time to the simple duty of providing food and raiment, than would be right were she in affluence, and with a small family. It is impossible, therefore, to draw out any general plan, which all can adopt. But there are some general principles, which ought to be the guiding rules, when a woman arranges her domestic employments. These principles are to be based on Christianity, which teaches us to seek first the kingdom of God, and to deem food, raiment, and the conveniences of life, as of secondary account. Every woman, then, ought to start with the assumption, that religion is of more consequence than any worldly concern, and that, whatever else may be sacrificed, this, shall be the leading object, in all her arrangements, in respect to time, money, and attention. It is also one of the plainest requisitions of Christianity, that we devote some of our time and efforts, to the comfort and improvement of others. There is no duty, so constantly enforced, both in the Old and New Testament, as the duty of charity, in dispensing to those, who are destitute of the blessings we enjoy. In selecting objects of charity, the same rule applies to others, as to ourselves, their moral and religious interests are of the highest moment, and for them, as well as for ourselves, we are to seek first the kingdom of God. Another general principle, is, that our intellectual and social interests are to be preferred, to the mere gratification of taste or appetite. A portion of time, therefore, must be devoted to the cultivation of the intellect and the social affections. Another, is, that the mere gratification of appetite, is to be placed last in our estimate, so that, when a question arises, as to which shall be sacrificed, some intellectual, moral, or social, advantage, or some gratification of sense, we should invariably sacrifice the last. Another, is, that, as health is indispensable to the discharge of every duty, nothing, which sacrifices that blessing, is to be allowed, in order to gain any other advantage or enjoyment. There are emergencies, when it is right to risk health and life, to save ourselves and others from greater evils, but these are exceptions, which do not militate against the general rule. Many persons imagine, that, if they violate the laws of health, in performing religious or domestic duties, they are guiltless before God. But such greatly mistake. We as directly violate the law, thou shalt not kill, when we do what tends to risk or shorten our own life, 
as if we should intentionally run a dagger into a neighbor. True, we may escape any fatal or permanently injurious effects, and so may a dagger or bullet miss the mark, or do only transient injury. But this, in either case, makes the sin none the less. The life and happiness of all his creatures are dear to our Creator, and he is as much displeased, when we injure our own interests, as when we injure those of others. The idea, therefore, that we are excusable, if we harm no one but ourselves, is false and pernicious. These, then, are the general principles, to guide a woman in systematizing her duties and pursuits. The creator of all things, is a being of perfect system and order, and, to aid us in our duty, in this respect, he has divided our time, by a regularly returning day of rest from worldly business. In following this example, the intervening six days may be subdivided to secure similar benefits. In doing this, a certain portion of time must be given to procure means of livelihood, and for preparing food, raiment, and dwellings. To these objects, some must devote more, and others less, attention. The remainder of time not necessarily thus employed, might be divided somewhat in this manner, the leisure of two afternoons and evenings, could be devoted to religious and benevolent objects, such as religious meetings, charitable associations, school visiting, and attention to the sick and poor. The leisure of two other days, might be devoted to intellectual improvement, and the pursuits of taste. The leisure of another day, might be devoted to social enjoyments, in making or receiving visits, and that of another, to miscellaneous domestic pursuits, not included in the other particulars. It is probable, that few persons could carry out such an arrangement, very strictly, but every one can make a systematic apportionment of time, and at least aim at accomplishing it, and they can also compare the time which they actually devote to these different objects, with such a general outline, for the purpose of modifying any mistaken proportions. Without attempting any such systematic employment of time, and carrying it out, so far as they can control circumstances, most women are rather driven along, by the daily occurrences of life, so that, instead of being the intelligent regulators of their own time, they are the mere sport of circumstances. There is nothing, which so distinctly marks the difference between weak and strong minds, as the fact, whether they control circumstances, or circumstances control them. It is very much to be feared, that the apportionment of time, actually made by most women, exactly inverts the order, required by reason and Christianity. Thus, the furnishing a needless variety of food, the conveniences of dwellings, and the adornments of dress, often take a larger portion of time, than is given to any other object. Next after this, comes intellectual improvement, and, last of all, benevolence and religion. It may be urged, that it is indispensable for most persons to give more time to earn a livelihood, and to prepare food, raiment, and dwellings, than to any other object. But it may be asked, how much of the time, devoted to these objects, is employed in preparing varieties of food, not necessary, but rather injurious? and how much is spent for those parts of dress and furniture not indispensable, and merely ornamental. Let a woman subtract from her domestic employments, all the time, given to pursuits which are of no use, except as they gratify a taste for ornament, or minister increased varieties, to tempt the appetite, and she will find, that much, which she calls domestic duties, and which prevent her attention to intellectual, benevolent, and religious, objects, should be called by a very different name. No woman has a right to give up attention to the higher interests of herself and others, for the ornaments of taste, or the gratification of the palate. To a certain extent, these lower objects are lawful and desirable, but, when they intrude on nobler interests, they become selfish and degrading. Every woman, then, when employing her hands, in ornamenting her person, her children, or her house, ought to calculate, whether she has devoted as much time, to the intellectual and moral wants of herself and others. 
if she has not, she may know that she is doing wrong, and that her system, for apportioning her time and pursuits, should be altered. Some persons, endeavor to systematize their pursuits, by apportioning them to particular hours of each day. For example, a certain period before breakfast, is given to devotional duties, after breakfast, certain hours are devoted to exercise and domestic employments, other hours, to sewing, or reading, or visiting, and others, to benevolent duties. But, in most cases, it is more difficult to systematize the hours of each day, than it is to secure some regular division of the week. In regard to the minuty of domestic arrangements, the writer has known the following methods to be adopted. Monday, with some of the best housekeepers, is devoted to preparing for the labors of the week. Any extra cooking, the purchasing of articles to be used during the week, the assorting of clothes for the wash, and mending such as would be injured without semicolon these, and similar items, belong to this day. Tuesday is devoted to washing, and Wednesday to ironing. On Thursday, the ironing is finished off, the clothes are folded and put away, and all articles, which need mending, are put in the mending basket, and attended to. Friday is devoted to sweeping and house cleaning. On Saturday, and especially the last Saturday of every month, every department is put in order, the casters and table furniture are regulated, the pantry and cellar inspected, the trunks, drawers, and closets arranged, and everything about the house, put in order for Sunday. All the cooking, needed for Sunday, is also prepared. By this regular recurrence of a particular time, for inspecting everything, nothing is forgotten till ruined by neglect. Another mode of systematizing, relates to providing proper supplies of conveniences, and proper places in which to keep them. Thus, some ladies keep a large closet, in which are placed the tubs, pails, dippers, soap dishes, starch, blueing, clothes line, clothes pins, and every other article used in washing, and in the same, or another, place, are kept every convenience for ironing. In the sewing department, a trunk, with suitable partitions, is provided, in which are placed, each in its proper place, white thread of all sizes, colored thread, yarns for mending, colored and black sewing silks and twist, tapes and bobbins of all sizes, white and colored welting cords, silk braids and cords, needles of all sizes, papers of pins, remnants of linen and colored cambric, a supply of all kinds of buttons used in the family, black and white hooks and eyes, a yard measure, and all the patterns used in cutting and fitting. These are done up in separate parcels, and labeled. In another trunk, are kept all pieces used in mending, arranged in order, so that any article can be found without loss of time. A trunk, like the first mentioned, will save many steps, and often much time and perplexity, while by purchasing articles thus by the quantity, they come much cheaper, than if bought in little portions as they are wanted. Such a trunk should be kept locked, and a smaller supply, for current use, retained in a work basket. A full supply of all conveniences in the kitchen and cellar and a place appointed for each article, very much facilitates domestic labor. For want of this, much vexation and loss of time is occasioned, while seeking vessels in use, or in cleansing those employed by different persons, for various purposes. It would be far better, for a lady to give up some expensive article, in the parlor, and apply the money, thus saved, for kitchen conveniences, than to have a stinted supply where the most labor is to be performed. If our cow country woman would devote more to comfort and convenience, and less to show, it would be a great improvement. Expensive mirrors and pier tables in the parlor, and an unpainted, gloomy, ill-furnished kitchen, not unfrequently are found under the same roof. Another important item, in systematic economy, is, the apportioning of regular employment to the various members of a family. If a housekeeper can secure cooperation of all her family, she will find that many hands make light work. There is no greater mistake than in bringing up children to feel that they must be taken care of, 
and waited on, by others, without any corresponding obligations on their part. The extent, to which young children can be made useful, in a family, would seem surprising, to those who have never seen a systematic and regular plan for securing their services. The writer has been in a family, where a little girl, of eight or nine years of age, washed and dressed herself and young brother, and made their small beds, before breakfast, set and cleared all the tables, at meals, with a little help from a grown person in moving tables and spreading cloths, while all the dusting of parlors and chambers was also neatly performed by her. A brother, of ten years old, brought in and piled all the wood, used in the kitchen and parlor, brushed the boots and shoes, neatly, went on errands, and took all the care of the poultry. They were children, whose parents could afford to hire servants to do this, but who chose to have their children grow up healthy and industrious, while proper instruction, system, and encouragement, made these services rather a pleasure, than otherwise, to the children. Some parents pay their children for such services, but this is hazardous, as tending to make them feel that they are not bound to be helpful without pay and also as tending to produce a hoarding, money-making spirit. But, where children have no hoarding propensities, and need to acquire a sense of the value of property, it may be well to let them earn money, for some extra services, rather as a favor. When this is done, they should be taught to spend it for others, as well as for themselves, and in this way, a generous and liberal spirit will be cultivated. There are some mothers, who take pains to teach their boys most of the domestic arts, which their sisters learn. The writer has seen boys, mending their own garments, and aiding their mother or sisters in the kitchen, with great skill and adroitness, and at an early age, they usually very much relish joining in such occupations. The sons of such mothers, in their college life, or in roaming about the world, or in nursing a sick wife or infant, find occasion to bless the forethought and kindness, which prepared them for such emergencies. Few things are in worse taste, than for a man needlessly to busy himself in women's work, and yet a man never appears in a more interesting attitude, than when, by skill in such matters, he can save a mother or wife from care and suffering. The more a boy is taught to use his hands, in every variety of domestic employment, the more his faculties, both of mind and body, are developed, for mechanical pursuits exercise the intellect, as well as the hands. The early training of New England boys, in which they turn their hands to almost everything, is one great reason of the quick perceptions, versatility of mind, and mechanical skill, for which that portion of our countrymen is distinguished. The writer has known one mode of systematizing the aid of the older children in a family, which, in some cases of very large families, it may be well to imitate. In the case referred to, when the oldest daughter was eight or nine years old, an infant sister was given to her, as her special charge. She tended it, made and mended its clothes, taught it to read, and was its nurse and guardian, through all its childhood. Another infant was given to the next daughter, and thus the children were all paired in this interesting relation. In addition to the relief thus afforded to the mother, the elder children were in this way qualified for their future domestic relations, and both older and younger bound to each other by peculiar ties of tenderness and gratitude. In offering these examples, of various modes of systematizing, one suggestion may be worthy of attention. It is not unfrequently the case, that ladies, who find themselves cumbered with oppressive cares, after reading remarks on the benefits of system, immediately commence the task of arranging their pursuits, with great vigor and hope. They divide the day into regular periods, and give each hour its duty, they systematize their work, and endeavor to bring everything into a regular routine. But, in a short time, they find themselves baffled, discouraged, and disheartened, and finally relapse into their former desultory ways in a sort of resigned despair. The difficulty, in such cases, is, that they attempt too much at a time. There is nothing, which so much depends upon habit, as a systematic mode of performing duty, and, where no such habit has been formed, 
it is impossible for a novice to start, at once, into a universal mode of systematizing, which none but an adept could carry through. The only way for such persons, is, to begin with a little at a time. Let them select some three or four things, and resolutely attempt to conquer at these points. In time, a habit will be formed, of doing a few things at regular periods, and in a systematic way. Then it will be easy to add a few more, and thus, by a gradual process, the object can be secured, which it would be vain to attempt, by a more summary course. Early rising is almost an indispensable condition to success, in such an effort, but, where a woman lacks either the health or the energy to secure a period for devotional duties before breakfast, let her select that hour of the day, in which she will be least liable to interruption, and let her then seek strength and wisdom from the only true source. At this time, let her take a pen, and make a list of all the things which she considers as duties. Then, let a calculation be made, whether there be time enough, in the day or the week, for all these duties. If there be not, let the least important be stricken from the list, as not being duties, and which must be omitted. In doing this, let a woman remember, that, though what we shall eat, and what we shall drink, and wherewithal we shall be clothed, are matters requiring due attention, they are very apt to obtain a wrong relative importance, while social, intellectual, and moral, interests, receive too little regard. In this country, eating, dressing, and household furniture and ornaments, take far too large a place in the estimate of relative importance, and it is probable, that most women could modify their views and practice, so as to come nearer to the Saviour's requirements. No woman has a right to put a stitch of ornament on any article of dress or furniture, or to provide one superfluity in food, until she is sure she can secure time for all her social, intellectual, benevolent, and religious, duties. If a woman will take the trouble to make such a calculation as this, she will usually find that she has time enough, to perform all her duties easily and well. It is impossible, for a conscientious woman to secure that peaceful mind, and cheerful enjoyment of life, which all should seek, who is constantly finding her duties jarring with each other, and much remaining undone, which she feels that she ought to do. In consequence of this, there will be a secret uneasiness, which will throw a shade over the whole current of life, never to be removed, till she so efficiently defines and regulates her duties, that she can fulfill them all. And here the writer would urge upon young ladies, the importance of forming habits of system, while unembarrassed with those multiplied cares, which will make the task so much more difficult and hopeless. Every young lady can systematize her pursuits, to a certain extent. She can have a particular day for mending her wardrobe, and for arranging her trunks, closets, and drawers. She can keep her work basket, her desk at school, and all her other conveniences, in their proper places, and in regular order. She can have regular periods for reading, walking, visiting, study, and domestic pursuits. And, by following this method, in youth, she will form a taste for regularity, and a habit of system, which will prove a blessing to her, through life. Chapter 15. On giving in charity. It is probable, that there is no point of duty, where conscientious persons differ more in opinion, or where they find it more difficult to form discriminating and decided views, than on the matter of charity. That we are bound to give some of our time, money, and efforts, to relieve the destitute, all allow. But, as to how much we are to give, and on whom our charities shall be bestowed, many a reflecting mind has been at a loss. Yet it seems very desirable, that, in reference to a duty so constantly and so strenuously urged by the supreme ruler, we should be able so to fix meets and bounds, as to keep a conscience void of offence, and to free the mind from disquieting fears of deficiency. The writer has found no other topic of investigation so beset with difficulty, and so absolutely without the range of definite rules, which can apply to all, in all circumstances. But on this, as on a previous topic, there seem to be general principles, by the aid of which, any candid mind, 
sincerely desirous of obeying the commands of Christ, however much self-denial may be involved, can arrive at definite conclusions, as to its own individual obligations, so that, when these are fulfilled, the mind may be at peace. But, for a mind that is worldly, living mainly to seek its own pleasures, instead of living to please God, no principles can be so fixed, as not to leave a ready escape from all obligation. Such minds, either by indolence, and consequent ignorance, or by sophistry, will convince themselves, that a life of engrossing self-indulgence, with perhaps the gift of a few dollars, and a few hours of time, may suffice, to fulfill the requisitions of the eternal judge. For such minds, no reasonings will avail, till the heart is so changed, that, to learn the will and follow the example of Jesus Christ, become the leading objects of interest and effort. It is to aid those, who profess to possess this temper of mind, that the following suggestions are offered. The first consideration, which gives definiteness to this subject, is, a correct view of the object for which we are placed in this world. A great many even of professed Christians, seem to be acting on the supposition, that the object of life is to secure as much as possible of all the various enjoyments placed within reach. Not so, teaches reason or revelation. From these, we learn, that, though the happiness of his creatures, is the end for which God created and sustains them, yet, that this happiness depends, not on the various modes of gratification put within our reach, but mainly on character. A man may possess all the resources for enjoyment which this world can afford, and yet feel that all is vanity and vexation of spirit, and that he is supremely wretched. Another, may be in want of all things, and yet possess that living spring of benevolence, faith, and hope, which will make an Eden of the darkest prison. In order to be perfectly happy, man must attain that character, which Christ exhibited, and the nearer he approaches it, the more will happiness reign in his breast. But what was the grand peculiarity of the character of Christ? It was self denying benevolence. He came not to seek his own, he went about doing good, and this was his meat and drink, that is, it was this which sustained the health and life of his mind, as a food and drink sustain the health and life of the body. Now, the mind of man is so made, that it can gradually be transformed into the same likeness. A selfish being, who, for a whole life, has been nourishing habits of indolent self indulgence, can, by taking Christ as his example, by communion with him, and by daily striving to imitate his character and conduct, form such a temper of mind, that doing good will become the chief and highest source of enjoyment. And this heavenly principle will grow stronger and stronger, until self denial loses the more painful part of its character and then, living to make happiness, will be so delightful and absorbing a pursuit, that all exertions, regarded as the means to this end, will be like the joyous efforts of men, when they strive for a prize or a crown, with the full hope of success. In this view of the subject, efforts and self-denial, for the good of others, are to be regarded, not merely as duties enjoined for the benefit of others, but as the moral training indispensable to the formation of that character on which depends our own happiness. This view, exhibits the full meaning of the Saviour's declaration, how hardly shall they that of riches enter into the kingdom of God. He had before taught, that the kingdom of heaven consisted, not in such enjoyments as the world they seek, but, in the temper of self-denying benevolence, like his own, and, as the rich have far greater temptations to indolent self-indulgence, they are far less likely to acquire this temper than those, who, by limited means, are inured to some degree of self-denial. But, on this point, one important distinction needs to be made, and that is, between the self-denial, which has no other aim than mere self-mortification, and that, which is exercised to secure greater good to ourselves and others. The first is the foundation of monasticism, penances, and all other forms of asceticism. The latter, only, is that which Christianity requires. A second consideration, which may give definiteness to this subject, is, that the formation of a perfect character, involves, 
not the extermination of any principles of our nature, but rather the regulating of them, according to the rules of reason and religion, so that the lower propensities shall always be kept subordinate to nobler principles. Thus, we are not to aim at destroying our appetites, or at needlessly denying them, but rather so to regulate them, that they shall best secure the objects for which they were implanted. We are not to annihilate the love of praise and admiration, but so to control it, that the favor of God shall be regarded more than the estimation of men. We are not to extirpate the principle of curiosity, which leads us to acquire knowledge, but so to direct it, that all our acquisitions shall be useful and not frivolous or injurious. And thus, with all the principles of the mind, God has implanted no desires in our constitution, which are evil and pernicious. On the contrary, all our constitutional propensities, either of mind or body, he designed we should gratify, whenever no evils would thence result, either to ourselves or others. Such passions as envy, ambition, pride, revenge, and hatred, are to be exterminated, for they are either excesses or excrescences, not created by God, but rather the result of our own neglect to form habits of benevolence and self-control. In deciding the rules of our conduct, therefore, we are ever to bear in mind, that the development of the nobler principles, and the subjugation of inferior propensities to them, is to be the main object of effort, both for ourselves and for others. And, in conformity with this, in all our plans, we are to place religious and moral interests as first in estimation, our social and intellectual interests, next, and our physical gratifications, as subordinate to all. A third consideration, is, that, though the means for sustaining life and health are to be regarded as necessaries, without which no other duties can be performed, yet, that a very large portion of the time, spent by most persons, in easy circumstances, for food, raiment, and dwellings, are for mere superfluities, which are right, when they do not involve the sacrifice of higher interests, and wrong, when they do. Life and health can be sustained in the humblest dwellings, with the plainest dress, and the simplest food, and, after taking from our means, what is necessary for life and health, the remainder is to be so divided, that the larger portion shall be given to supply the moral and intellectual wants of ourselves and others, and the smaller share to procure those additional gratifications, of taste and appetite, which are desirable, but not indispensable. Mankind, thus far, have never made this apportionment of their means, yet, just as fast as they have risen from a savage state, mere physical wants have been made, to an increasing extent subordinate to higher objects. Another very important consideration, is, that, in urging the duty of charity, and the prior claims of moral and religious objects, no rule of duty should be maintained, which it would not be right and wise for all to follow. And we are to test the wisdom of any general rule, by inquiring what would be the result, if all mankind should practice according to it. In view of this, we are enabled to judge of the correctness of those, who maintain, that, to be consistent, men believing in the eternal destruction of all those of our race who are not brought under the influence of the Christian system, should give up, not merely the elegances, but all the superfluities, of life, and devote the whole of their means, not indispensable to life and health, for the propagation of Christianity. But, if this is the duty of any, it is the duty of all, and we are to inquire what would be the result, if all conscientious persons gave up the use of all superfluities. Suppose, that two millions of the people in the United States, were conscientious persons, and relinquished the use of everything not absolutely necessary to life and health. It would instantly throw out of employment one half of the whole community. The manufacturers, mechanics, merchants, agriculturists, and all the agencies they employ, would be beggared, and one half of those not reduced to poverty, would be obliged to spend all their extra means, in simply supplying necessaries to the other half. The use of superfluities, therefore, to a certain extent, is as indispensable to promote industry, virtue, and religion, as any direct giving of money or time, 
and it is owing entirely to a want of reflection, and of comprehensive views, that any man ever make so great a mistake, as is here exhibited. Dot instead, then, of urging a rule of duty which is at once irrational and impracticable, there is another course, which commends itself to the understandings of all. For whatever may be the practice, of intelligent men, they universally concede the principle, that our physical gratifications should always be made subordinate to social, intellectual, and moral, advantages. And all that is required, for the advancement of our whole race to the most perfect state of society, is, simply, that men should act in agreement with this principle. And, if only a very small portion, of the most intelligent of our race, should act according to this rule, under the control of Christian benevolence, the immense supplies, furnished, for the general good, would be far beyond what any would imagine, who had never made any calculations on the subject. In this nation, alone, suppose the one million and more, of professed followers of Christ, should give a larger portion of their means, for the social, intellectual, and moral, wants of mankind, than for the superfluities that minister to taste, convenience, and appetite, it would be enough to furnish all the schools, colleges, Bibles, ministers, and missionaries, that the whole world could demand, or, at least, it would be far more, than properly qualified agents to administer it, could employ. But, it may be objected, that, though this view is one, which, in the abstract, looks plausible and rational, not one in a thousand, can practically adopt it. How few keep any account, at all, of their current expenses. How impossible it is, to determine, exactly, what are necessaries, and what are superfluities. And in regard to women, how few have the control of an income, so as not to be bound by the wishes of a parent or a husband. In reference to these difficulties, the first remark is, that we are never under obligations to do, what is entirely out of our power, so that those persons, who have no power to regulate their expenses or their charities, are under no sort of obligation to attempt it. The second remark is, that, when a rule of duty is discovered, we are bound to aim at it, and to fulfill it, just so far as we can. We have no right to throw it aside, because we shall find some difficult cases, when we come to apply it. The third remark is, that no person can tell how much can be done, till a faithful trial has been made. If a woman has never kept any accounts, nor attempted to regulate her expenditures by the right rule, nor used her influence with those that control her plans, to secure this object, she has no right to say how much she can, or cannot, do, till after a fair trial has been made. In attempting such a trial, the following method can be taken. Let a woman keep an account of all she spends, for herself and her family, for a year, arranging the items under three general heads. Under the first, put all articles for food, raiment, rent, wages, and all conveniences. Under the second, place all sums paid in securing an education, and books, and other intellectual advantages. Under the third head, place all that is spent for benevolence and religion. At the end of the year, the first and largest account will show the mixed items of necessaries and superfluities, which can be arranged, so as to gain some sort of idea how much has been spent for superfluities, and how much for necessaries. Then, by comparing what is spent for superfluities, with what is spent for intellectual and moral advantages, data will be gained, for judging of the past, and regulating the future. Does a woman say she cannot do this? Let her inquire, whether the offer of a thousand dollars, as a reward for attempting it one year, would not make her undertake to do it, and, if so, let her decide, in her own mind, which is most valuable, a clear conscience, and the approbation of God, in this effort to do his will, or one thousand dollars. And let her do it, with this warning of the Saviour before her eyes, no man can serve two masters. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Is it objected, how can we decide between superfluities and necessaries, in this list? It is replied, that we are not required to judge exactly, in all cases. 
Our duty is, to use the means in our power to assist us in forming a correct judgment, to seek the divine aid in freeing our minds from indolence and selfishness, and then to judge as well as we can, in our endeavors rightly to apportion and regulate our expenses. Many persons seem to feel that they are bound to do better than they know how. But God is not so hard a master, and, after we have used all proper means to learn the right way, if we then follow it, according to our ability, we do wrong to feel misgivings, or to blame ourselves, if results come out differently from what seems desirable. The results of our actions, alone, can never prove as deserving of blame. For men are often so placed, that, owing to lack of intellect or means, it is impossible for them to decide correctly. To use all the means of knowledge within our reach, and then to judge, with a candid and conscientious spirit, is all that God requires, and, when we have done this, and the event seems to come out wrong, we should never wish that we had decided otherwise. For it is the same as wishing that we had not followed the dictates of judgment and conscience. As this is a world designed for discipline and trial, untoward events are never to be construed as indications of the obliquity of our past decisions. But it is probable, that a great portion of the women of this nation, cannot secure any such systematic mode of regulating their expenses. To such, the writer would propose one inquiry, cannot you calculate how much time and money you spend for what is merely ornamental, and not necessary, for yourself? your children, and your house. Cannot you compare this with the time and money you spend for intellectual and benevolent purposes? And will not this show the need of some change? In making this examination, is not this brief rule, deducible from the principles before laid down, the one which should regulate you? Every person does right, in spending some portion of time and means in securing the conveniences and adornments of taste but the amount should never exceed what is spent in securing our own moral and intellectual improvement, nor exceed what is spent in benevolent efforts to supply the physical and moral wants of our fellow men. In making an examination on this subject, it is sometimes the case, that a woman will count among the necessaries of life, all the various modes of adorning the person or house, practiced in the circle in which she moves, and, after enumerating the many duties which demand attention, counting these as a part, she will come to the conclusion, that she has no time, and but little money, to devote to personal improvement, or to benevolent enterprises. This surely is not in agreement with the requirements of the Saviour, who calls on us to seek for others, as well as ourselves, first of all, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. In order to act in accordance with the rule here presented, it is true, that many would be obliged to give up the idea of conforming to the notions and customs of those, with whom they associate, and compelled to adopt the maxim, be not conformed to this world. In many cases, it would involve an entire change in the style of living. And the writer has the happiness of knowing more cases than one, where persons, who have come to similar views, on this subject, have given up large and expensive establishments, disposed of their carriages, dismissed a portion of their domestics, and modified all their expenditures, that they might keep a pure conscience, and regulate their charities more according to the requirements of Christianity. And there are persons, well known in the religious world, who save themselves all labor of minute calculation, by devoting so large a portion of their time and means to benevolent objects, that they find no difficulty in knowing that they give more for religious, benevolent, and intellectual, purposes, than for superfluities. In deciding what particular objects shall receive our benefactions, there are also general principles to guide us. The first, is that presented by our Saviour, when, after urging the great law of benevolence, he was asked, and who is my neighbor? His reply, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, teaches us, that any human being, whose wants are brought to our knowledge, is our neighbor. The wounded man was not only a stranger, but he belonged to a foreign nation, peculiarly hated, and he had no claim, except that his wants were brought to the knowledge of the wayfaring man. 
From this, we learn, that the destitute, of all nations, become our neighbors, as soon as their wants are brought to our knowledge. Another general principle, is this, that those who are most in need, must be relieved, in preference to those who are less destitute. On this principle, it is, that we think the followers of Christ should give more to supply those who are suffering for want of the bread of eternal life, than for those who are deprived of physical enjoyments. And another reason for this preference, is, the fact, that many, who give in charity, have made such imperfect advances in civilization and Christianity, that the intellectual and moral wants of our race make but a feeble impression on the mind. Relate a pitiful tale of a family, reduced to live, for weeks, on potatoes, only, and many a mind would awake to deep sympathy, and stretch forth the hand of charity. But describe cases, where the immortal mind is pining in stupidity and ignorance, or racked with the fever of baleful passions, and how small the number, so elevated in sentiment, and so enlarged in their views, as to appreciate and sympathize in these far greater misfortunes. The intellectual and moral wants of our fellow men, therefore, should claim the first place in our attention, both because they are most important, and because they are most neglected. Another consideration, to be borne in mind, is, that, in this country, there is much less real need of charity, in supplying physical necessities, than is generally supposed, by those who have not learned the more excellent way. This land is so abundant in supplies, and labor is in such demand, that every healthy person can earn a comfortable support. And if all the poor were instantly made virtuous, it is probable that there would be no physical wants, which could not readily be supplied by the immediate friends of each sufferer the sick, the aged, and the orphan, would be the only objects of charity. In this view of the case, the primary effort, in relieving the poor, should be, to furnish them the means of earning their own support, and to supply them with those moral influences, which are most effectual in securing virtue and industry. Another point to be attended to, is, the importance of maintaining a system of associated charities. There is no point in which the economy of charity has more improved, than in the present mode of combining many small contributions, for sustaining enlarged and systematic plans of charity. If all the half dollars, which are now contributed to aid in organized systems of charity, were returned to the donors, to be applied by the agency and discretion of each, thousands and thousands of the treasures, now employed to promote the moral and intellectual wants of mankind would become entirely useless. In a democracy, like ours, where few are very rich, and the majority are in comfortable circumstances, this collecting and dispensing of drops and drills, is the mode, by which, in imitation of nature, the dews and showers are to distill on parched and desert lands. And every person, while earning a pittance to unite with many more, may be cheered with the consciousness of sustaining a grand system of operations, which must have the most decided influence, in raising all mankind to that perfect state of society, which Christianity is designed to secure. Another consideration, relates to the indiscriminate bestowal of charity. Persons, who have taken pains to inform themselves, and who devote their whole time to dispensing charities, unite in declaring, that this is one of the most fruitful sources of indolence, vice, and poverty. From several of these, the writer has learned, that, by their own personal investigations, they have ascertained, that there are large establishments of idle and wicked persons, in most of our cities, who associate together, to support themselves by every species of imposition. They hire large houses, and live in constant rioting, on the means thus obtained. Among them, are women who have, or who hire the use of, infant children, others, who are blind, or maimed, or deformed, or who can adroitly feign such infirmities, and, by these means of exciting pity, and by artful tales of woe, they collect arms, both in city and country, to spend in all manner of gross and guilty indulgences. Meantime, many persons, finding themselves often duped by impostors, refuse to give at all and thus many benefactions are withdrawn, 
which a wise economy in charity would have secured. For this, and other reasons, it is wise and merciful, to adopt the general rule, never to give arms, till we have had some opportunity of knowing how they will be spent. There are exceptions to this, as to every general rule, which a person of discretion can determine. But the practice, so common among benevolent persons, of giving, at least a trifle, to all who ask, lest, perchance, they may turn away some, who are really sufferers, is one, which causes more sin and misery than it cures. The writer has never known any system for dispensing charity, so successful, as the one which, in many places, has been adopted in connection with the distribution of tracts. By this method, a town or city is divided into districts, and each district is committed to the care of two ladies, whose duty it is, to call on each family and leave a tract, and make that the occasion for entering into conversation, and learning the situation of all residents in the district. By this method, the ignorant, the vicious, and the poor, are discovered, and their physical, intellectual, and moral, wants, are investigated. In some places, where the writer has resided or visited, each person retained the same district, year after year, so that every poor family in the place was under the watch and care of some intelligent and benevolent lady, who used all her influence to secure a proper education for the children, to furnish them with suitable reading, to encourage habits of industry and economy, and to secure regular attendance on public religious instruction. Thus, the rich and the poor brought in contact, in a way advantageous to both parties, and, if such a system could be universally adopted, more would be done for the prevention of poverty and vice, than all the wealth of the nation could avail for their relief. But this plan cannot be successfully carried out, in this manner, unless there is a large proportion of intelligent, benevolent, and self-denying, persons, and the mere distribution of tracts, without the other parts of the plan, is of very little avail. But there is one species of charity, which needs a special consideration. It is that, which induces us to refrain from judging of the means and the relative charities of other persons. There have been such indistinct notions, and so many different standards of duty, on this subject, that it is rare for two persons to think exactly alike, in regard to the rule of duty. Each person is bound to inquire and judge for himself, as to his own duty or deficiencies, but as both the resources, and the amount of the actual charities of other men are beyond our ken, it is as indecorous, as it is uncharitable, to sit in judgment on their decisions. Chapter 16. On Economy of Time and Expenses. On Economy of Time. The value of time, and our obligation to spend every hour for some useful end, are what few minds properly realize. And those, who have the highest sense of their obligations in this respect, sometimes greatly misjudge in their estimate of what are useful and proper modes of employing time. This arises from limited views of the importance of some pursuits, which they would deem frivolous and useless, but which are, in reality, necessary to preserve the health of body and mind, and those social affections, which it is very important to cherish. Christianity teaches, that, for all the time afforded us, we must give account to God and that we have no right to waste a single hour. But time, which is spent in rest or amusement, is often as usefully employed, as if it were devoted to labor or devotion. In employing our time, we are to make suitable allowance for sleep, for preparing and taking food, for securing the means of a livelihood, for intellectual improvement, for exercise and amusement, for social enjoyments, and for benevolent and religious duties and it is the right apportionment of time, to these various duties, which constitutes its true economy. In making this apportionment, we are bound by the same rules, as relate to the use of property. We are to employ whatever portion is necessary to sustain life and health, as the first duty, and the remainder we are so to apportion, that our highest interests, shall receive the greatest allotment, and our physical gratifications the least dot the laws of the supreme ruler, when he became the civil as well as the religious head of the Jewish theocracy, furnish an example, which it would be well for all attentively to consider, 
when forming plans for the apportionment of time and property. To properly estimate this example, it must be borne in mind, that the main object of God, was, to preserve his religion among the Jewish nation, and that they were not required to take any means to propagate it among other nations, as Christians are now required to extend Christianity. So low were they, in the scale of civilization and mental development, that a system, which confined them to one spot, as an agricultural people, and prevented their growing very rich, or having extensive commerce with other nations, was indispensable to prevent their relapsing into the low idolatries and vices of the nations around them. The proportion of time and property, which every Jew was required to devote to intellectual, benevolent, and religious purposes, was as follows in regard to property, they were required to give one tenth of all their yearly income, to support the Levites, the priests, and the religious service. Next, they were required to give the first fruits of all their corn, wine, oil, and fruits, and the firstborn of all their cattle, for the Lord's treasury, to be employed for the priests, the widow, the fatherless, and the stranger. The firstborn, also, of their children, were the Lord's, and were to be redeemed by a specified sum, paid into the sacred treasury. Besides this, they were required to bring a free will offering to God, every time they went up to the three great yearly festivals. In addition to this, regular yearly sacrifices, of cattle and fowls, were required of each family, and occasional sacrifices for certain sins or ceremonial impurities. In reaping their fields, they were required to leave unreaped, for the poor, the corners, not to glean their fields, olive yards, or vineyards, and, if a sheaf was left, by mistake, they were not to return for it, but leave it for the poor. When a man sent away a servant, he was thus charged, furnish him liberally out of thy flock, and out of thy floor, and out of thy wine press. When a poor man came to borrow money, they were forbidden to deny him, or to take any interest, and if, at the sabbatical, or seventh, year, he could not pay, the debt was to be cancelled. And to this command, is added the significant caution, Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him naught, and he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Thou shalt surely give him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. Besides this, the Levites were distributed through the land, with the intention that they should be instructors and priests in every part of the nation. Thus, one twelfth of the people were set apart, having no landed property, to be priests and teachers, and the other tribes were required to support them liberally. In regard to the time taken from secular pursuits, for the support of religion, an equally liberal amount was demanded. In the first place, one seventh part of their time was taken for the weekly Sabbath, when no kind of work was to be done. Then the whole nation were required to meet, at the appointed place, three times a year, which, including their journeys, and stay there, occupied eight weeks, or another seventh part of their time. Then the sabbatical year, when no agricultural labor was to be done, took another seventh of their time from their regular pursuits as they were an agricultural people. This was the amount of time and property demanded by God, simply to sustain religion and morality within the bounds of that nation. Christianity demands the spread of its blessings to all mankind, and so the restrictions laid on the Jews are withheld, and all our wealth and time, not needful for our own best interest is to be employed in improving the condition of our fellow men. In deciding respecting the rectitude of our pursuits, we are bound to aim at some practical good, as the ultimate object. With every duty of this life, our benevolent Creator has connected some species of enjoyment, to draw us to perform it. Thus, the palate is gratified. By performing the duty of nourishing our bodies, the principle of curiosity is gratified. In pursuing useful knowledge, the desire of approbation is gratified, when we perform benevolent and social duties, 
and every other duty has an alluring enjoyment connected with it. But the great mistake of mankind has consisted in seeking the pleasures, connected with these duties, as the sole aim, without reference to the main end that should be held in view, and to which the enjoyment should be made subservient. Thus, men seek to gratify the palate, without reference to the question whether the body is properly nourished, and follow after knowledge, without inquiring whether it ministers to good or evil. But, in gratifying the implanted desires of our nature, we are bound so to restrain ourselves, by reason and conscience, as always to seek the main objects of existence, the highest good of ourselves and others, and never to sacrifice this, for the mere gratification of our sensual desires. We are to gratify appetite, just so far as is consistent with health and usefulness, and the desire for knowledge, just so far as will enable us to do most good by our influence and efforts, and no farther. We are to seek social intercourse, to that extent which will best promote domestic enjoyment and kindly feelings among neighbors and friends, and we are to pursue exercise and amusement, only so far as will best sustain the vigor of body and mind. For the right apportionment of time, to these and various other duties, we are to give an account to our creator and final judge. Instead of attempting to give any very specific rules on this subject, some modes of economizing time will be suggested. The most powerful of all agencies, in this matter, is, that habit of system and order, in all our pursuits, which has been already pointed out. It is probable, that a regular and systematic employment of time, will enable a person to accomplish thrice the amount of labor, that could otherwise be performed. Another mode of economizing time, is, by uniting several objects in one employment. Thus, exercise or charitable efforts, can be united with social enjoyments, as is done in associations for sewing, or visiting the poor. Instruction and amusement can also be combined. Pursuits like music, gardening, drawing, botany, and the like, unite intellectual improvement with amusement, social enjoyment, and exercise. With housekeepers, and others whose employments are various and desultory, much time can be saved by preparing employments for little intervals of leisure. Thus, some ladies make ready, and keep in the parlor, light work, to take up when detained there, some keep a book at hand, in the nursery, to read while holding or sitting by a sleeping infant. One of the most popular female poets of our country very often shows her friends, at their calls, that the thread of the knitting, never need interfere with the thread of agreeable discourse. It would be astonishing, to one who had never tried the experiment, how much can be accomplished, by a little planning and forethought, in thus finding employment for odd intervals of time. But, besides economizing our own time, we are bound to use our influence and example to promote the discharge of the same duty by others. A woman is under obligations so to arrange the hours and pursuits of her family, as to promote systematic and habitual industry, and if, by late breakfasts, irregular hours for meals, and other hindrances of this kind, she interferes with, or refrains from promoting regular industry in, others, she is accountable to God for all the waste of time consequent on her negligence. The mere example of system and industry in a housekeeper, has a wonderful influence in promoting the same virtuous habit in others. On economy in expenses. It is impossible for a woman to practice a wise economy in expenditures, unless she is taught how to do it, either by a course of experiments, or by the instruction of those who have had experience. It is amusing to notice the various, and oftentimes contradictory, notions of economy, among judicious and experienced housekeepers for there is probably no economist, who would not be deemed lavish or wasteful, in some respects, by another and equally experienced and judicious person, who, in some different points, would herself be as much condemned by the other. These diversities are occasioned by dissimilar early habits, and by the different relative value assigned, by each, to the various modes of enjoyment, for which money is expended. But, Though there may be much disagreement in minor matters, there are certain general principles, which all unite in sanctioning. The first, is, 
that care be taken to know the amount of income and of current expenses, so that the proper relative proportion be preserved, and the expenditures never exceed the means. Few women can do this, thoroughly, without keeping regular accounts. The habits of this nation, especially among businessmen, are so desultory, and the current expenses of a family, in many points, are so much more under the control of the man than of the woman, that many women, who are disposed to be systematic in this matter, cannot follow their wishes. But there are often cases, when much is left undone in this particular, simply because no effort is made. Yet every woman is bound to do as much as is in her power, to accomplish a systematic mode of expenditure, and the regulation of it by Christian principles. The following are examples of different methods which have been adopted, for securing a proper adjustment of expenses to the means. The first, is that of a lady, who kept a large boarding house, in one of our cities. Every evening, before retiring, she took an account of the expenses of the day, and this usually occupied her not more than fifteen minutes, at a time. On each Saturday, she made an inventory of the stores on hand, and of the daily expenses, and also of what was due to her, and then made an exact estimate of her expenditures and profits. This, after the first two or three weeks, never took more than an hour, at the close of the week. Thus, by a very little time, regularly devoted to this object, she knew, accurately, her income, expenditures, and profits. Another friend of the writer, lives on a regular salary. The method adopted, in this case, is to calculate to what the salary amounts, each week. Then an account is kept, of what is paid out, each week, for rent, fuel, wages, and food. This amount of each week is deducted from the weekly income. The remainders of each week are added, at the close of a month, as the stock from which is to be taken, the dress, furniture, books, traveling expenses, charities, and all other expenditures. Another lady, whose husband is a lawyer, divides the year into four quarters, and the income into four equal parts. She then makes her plans, so that the expenses of one quarter shall never infringe on the income of another. So resolute is she, in carrying out this determination, that if, by any mischance, she is in want of articles before the close of a quarter, which she has not the means for providing, she will subject herself to temporary inconvenience, by waiting, rather than violate her rule. Another lady, whose husband is engaged in a business, which he thinks makes it impossible for him to know what his yearly income will be, took this method colon she kept an account of all her disbursements, for one year. This she submitted to her husband, and obtained his consent, that the same sum should be under her control, the coming year, for similar purposes, with the understanding, that she might modify future apportionments, in any way her judgment and conscience might approve. A great deal of uneasiness and discomfort is caused, to both husband and wife, in many cases, by an entire want of system and forethought, in arranging expenses. Both keep buying what they think they need, without any calculation as to how matters are coming out and with a sort of dread of running in debt, all the time harassing them. Such never know the comfort of independence. But, if a man or woman will only calculate what their income is, and then plan so as to know that they are all the time living within it, they secure one of the greatest comforts, which wealth ever bestows, and what many of the rich, who live in a loose and careless way, never enjoy. It is not so much the amount of income as the regular and correct apportionment of expenses, that makes a family truly comfortable. A man, with ten thousand a year, is often more harassed, for want of money, than the systematic economist, who supports a family on only six hundred a year. And the inspired command, oh no man anything, can never be conscientiously observed, without a systematic adaptation of expenses to means. As it is very important that young ladies should learn systematic economy, in expenses, it will be a great benefit, for every young girl to begin, at twelve or thirteen years of age, to make her own purchases, and keep her accounts, under the guidance of her mother, or some other friend. And if parents would ascertain the actual expense of a daughter's clothing, for a year, 
and give the sum to her, in quarterly payments, requiring a regular account, it would be of great benefit in preparing her for future duties. How else are young ladies to learn to make purchases properly, and to be systematic and economical? The art of system and economy can no more come by intuition, than the art of watchmaking or bookkeeping, and how strange it appears. That so many young ladies take charge of a husband's establishment, without having had either instruction or experience in one of the most important duties of their station. The second general principle of economy, is, that, in apportioning an income, among various objects, the most important should receive the largest supply, and that all retrenchments be made in matters of less importance. In a previous chapter, some general principles have been presented, to guide in this duty. Some additional hints will here be added, on the same topic. In regard to dress and furniture, much want of judgment and good taste is often seen, in purchasing some expensive article, which is not at all in keeping with the other articles connected with it. Thus, a large sideboard, or elegant mirror, or sofa, which would be suitable only for a large establishment, with other rich furniture, is crowded into too small a room with coarse and cheap articles around it. So, also, sometimes a parlour, and company chamber, will be furnished in a style suitable only for the wealthy, while the table will be supplied with shabby linen, and imperfect crockery, and every other part of the house will look, in comparison with these fine rooms, mean and niggardly. It is not at all uncommon, to find very showy and expensive articles in the part of the house visible to strangers when the children's rooms, kitchen, and other back portions, are on an entirely different scale. So in regard to dress, a lady will sometimes purchase an elegant and expensive article, which, instead of attracting admiration from the eye of taste, will merely serve as a decoy to the painful contrast of all other parts of the dress. A woman of real good taste and discretion, will strive to maintain a relative consistency between all departments and not, in one quarter, live on a scale fitted only to the rich, and in another, on one appropriate only to the poor. Another mistake in economy, is often made, by some of the best educated and most intelligent of mothers. Such will often be found spending day after day at needlework, when, with a comparatively small sum, this labor could be obtained of those who need the money, which such work would procure for them. Meantime, the daughters of the family, whom the mother is qualified to educate, or so nearly qualified, that she could readily keep ahead of her children, are sent to expensive boarding schools, where their delicate frames, their pliant minds, and their moral and religious interests, are relinquished to the hands of strangers. And the expense, thus incurred, would serve to pay the hire of everything the mother can do in sewing, four or five times over. The same want of economy is shown in communities, where, instead of establishing a good female school in their vicinity, the men of wealth send their daughters abroad, at double the expense, to be either educated or spoiled, as the case may be. Another species of poor economy, is manifested in neglecting to acquire and apply mechanical skill, which, in consequence, has to be hired from others. Thus, all the plain sewing will be done by the mother and daughters while all that requires skill will be hired. Instead of this, others take pains to have their daughters instructed in mantua making, and the simpler parts of millinery, so that the plain work is given to the poor, who need it, and the more expensive and tasteful operations are performed in the family. The right to knows ladies, who not only make their own dresses, but also their caps, bonnets, and artificial flowers. Some persons make miscalculations in economy, by habitually looking up cheap articles, while others go to the opposite extreme, and always buy the best of everything. Those ladies, who are considered the best economists, do not adopt either method. In regard to cheap goods, the fading colors, the damages discovered in use, the poorness of material, and the extra sewing demanded to replace articles lost by such causes, usually render them very dear, in the end. On the other hand, though some articles, 
of the most expensive kind, wear longest and best, yet, as a general rule, articles at medium prices do the best service. This is true of table and bed linens, broadcloths, shirtings, and the like, though, even in these cases, it is often found, that the coarsest and cheapest last the longest. Buying by wholesale, and keeping a large supply on hand, are economical only in large families, where the mistress is careful, but in other cases, the hazards of accident, and the temptation to a lavish use, will make the loss outrun the profits. There is one mode of economizing, which, it is hoped, will every year grow more rare, and that is, making penurious savings by getting the poor to work as cheap as possible. Many amiable and benevolent women have done this, on principle, without reflecting on the want of Christian charity thus displayed. Let every woman, in making bargains with the poor, conceive herself placed in the same circumstances, toiling hour after hour, and day after day, for a small sum, and then deal with others as she would be dealt by in such a situation. Liberal prices, and prompt payment, should be an invariable maxim, in dealing with the poor. The third general principle of economy, is, that all articles should be so used, and taken care of, as to secure longest service, with the least waste. Under this head, come many particulars in regard to the use and preservation of articles, which will be found more in detail in succeeding chapters. It may be proper, however, here to refer to one very common impression, as to the relative obligation of the poor and the rich in regard to economy. Many seem to suppose, that those who are wealthy, have a right to be lavish and negligent in the care of expenses. But this surely is a great mistake. Property is a talent, given by God, to spend for the welfare of mankind, and the needless waste of it, is as wrong in the rich, as it is in the poor. The rich are under obligations to apportion their income, to the various objects demanding attention, by the same rule as all others, and if this will allow them to spend more for superfluities than those of smaller means, it never makes it right to misuse or waste any of the bounties of providence. Whatever is no longer wanted for their own enjoyment, should be carefully saved, to add to the enjoyment of others. It is not always that men understand the economy of providence, in that unequal distribution of property, which, even under the most perfect form of government, will always exist. Many, looking at the present state of things, imagine that the rich, if they acted in strict conformity to the law of benevolence, would share all their property with their suffering fellow men. But such do not take into account, the inspired declaration, that a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth, or, in other words, life is made valuable, not by great possessions, but by such a character as prepares a man to enjoy what he holds. God perceives that human character can be most improved, by that kind of discipline, which exists, when there is something valuable to be gained by industrious efforts. This stimulus to industry could never exist, in a community where all are just alike, as it does in a state of society where every man sees, possessed by others, enjoyments, which he desires, and may secure by effort and industry. So, in a community where all are alike as to property, there would be no chance to gain that noblest of all attainments, a habit of self-denying benevolence, which toils for the good of others, and takes from one's own store, to increase the enjoyments of another. Instead, then, of the stagnation, both of industry and of benevolence, which would follow the universal and equitable distribution of property, one class of men, by superior advantages of birth, or intellect, or patronage, come into possession of a great amount of capital. With these means, they are enabled, by study, reading, and travel, to secure expansion of mind, and just views of the relative advantages of moral, intellectual, and physical enjoyments. At the same time, Christianity imposes obligations, corresponding with the increase of advantages and means. The rich are not at liberty to spend their treasures for themselves, alone. Their wealth is given, by God, to be employed for the best good of mankind, and their intellectual advantages are designed, primarily, to enable them to judge correctly, 
in employing their means most wisely for the general good. Now, suppose a man of wealth inherits 10,000 acres of real estate, it is not his duty to divide it among his poor neighbors and tenants. If he took this course, it is probable, that most of them would spend all in thriftless waste and indolence, or in mere physical enjoyments. Instead, then, of thus putting his capital out of his hands, he is bound to retain, and so to employ, it, as to raise his neighbors and tenants to such a state of virtue and intelligence, that they can secure far more, by their own efforts and industry, than he, by dividing his capital, could bestow upon them. In this view of the subject, it is manifest, that the unequal distribution of property is no evil. The great difficulty is, that so large a portion of those who hold much capital, instead of using their various advantages for the greatest good of those around them, employ the chief of them for mere selfish indulgences, thus inflicting as much mischief on themselves, as results to others from their culpable neglect. A great portion of the rich seem to be acting on the principle, that the more God bestows on them, the less are they under obligation to practice any self-denial, in fulfilling his benevolent plan of raising our race to intelligence and holiness. There are not a few, who seem to imagine that it is a mark of gentility to be careless of expenses. But this notion, is owing to a want of knowledge of the world. As a general fact, it will be found, that persons of rank and wealth, abroad, are much more likely to be systematic and economical, than persons of inferior standing in these respects. Even the most frivolous, among the rich and great, are often found practicing a rigid economy, in certain respects, in order to secure gratifications in another direction. And it will be found so common, among persons of vulgar minds, and little education, and less sense, to make a display of profusion and indifference to expense, as a mark of their claims to gentility, that the really genteel look upon it rather as a mark of low breeding. So that the sort of feeling, which some persons cherish, as if it were a degradation to be careful of small sums, and to be attentive to relative prices, in making purchases, is founded on mistaken notions of gentility and propriety. But one caution is needful, in regard to another extreme. When a lady of wealth, is seen roaming about in search of cheaper articles, or trying to beat down a shopkeeper, or making a close bargain with those she employs, the impropriety is glaring to all minds. A person of wealth has no occasion to spend time in looking for extra cheap articles, her time could be more profitably employed in distributing to the wants of others. And the practice of beating down tradespeople, is vulgar and degrading, in any one. A woman, after a little inquiry, can ascertain what is the fair and common price of things, and if she is charged an exorbitant sum, she can decline taking the article. If the price be a fair one, it is not becoming in her to search for another article which is below the regular charge. If a woman finds that she is in a store where they charge high prices, expecting to be beat down, she can mention, that she wishes to know the lowest price as it is contrary to her principles to beat down charges. There is one inconsistency, worthy of notice, which is found among that class, who are ambitious of being ranked among the aristocracy of society. It has been remarked, that, in the real aristocracy of other lands, it is much more common, than with us, to practice systematic economy. And such do not hesitate to say so, when they cannot afford certain indulgences. This practice descends to subordinate grades, so that foreign ladies, when they come to reside among us, seldom hesitate in assigning the true reason, when they cannot afford any gratification. But in this country, it will be found, that many, who are most fond of copying aristocratic examples, are, on this point, rather with the vulgar. Not a few of those young persons, who begin life with parlors and dresses in a style fitting only to established wealth, go into expenses, which they can ill afford, and are ashamed even to allow, that they are restrained from any expense, by motives of economy. Such a confession is never extorted, except by some call of benevolence, and then, they are very ready to declare that they cannot afford to bestow even a pittance. In such cases, 
it would seem as if the direct opposite of Christianity had gained possession of their tastes and opinions. They are ashamed to appear to deny themselves, but are very far from having any shame in denying the calls of benevolence. Chapter 17 On Health of Mind. There is such an intimate connection between the body and mind, that the health of one cannot be preserved without a proper care of the other. And it is from a neglect of this principle, that some of the most exemplary and conscientious persons in the world, suffer a thousand mental agonies, from a diseased state of body, while others ruin the health of the body, by neglecting the proper care of the mind. When the brain is excited, by stimulating drinks taken into the stomach, it produces a corresponding excitement of the mental faculties. The reason, the imagination, and all the powers, are stimulated to preternatural vigor and activity. In like manner, when the mind is excited by earnest intellectual effort, or by strong passions, the brain is equally excited, and the blood rushes to the head. Sir Astley Cooper records, that, in examining the brain of a young man who had lost a portion of his skull, whenever he was agitated, by some opposition to his wishes, the blood was sent, with increased force, to his brain, and the pulsations became frequent and violent. The same effect was produced by any intellectual effort, and the flushed countenance, which attends earnest study or strong emotions of fear, shame, or anger, is an external indication of the suffused state of the brain from such causes. In exhibiting the causes, which injure the health of the mind, they will be found to be partly physical, partly intellectual, and partly moral. The first cause of mental disease and suffering is not unfrequently found in the want of a proper supply of duly oxygenized blood. It has been shown, that the blood, in passing through the lungs, is purified, by the oxygen of the air combining with the superabundant hydrogen and carbon of the venous blood, thus forming carbonic acid and water, which are expired into the atmosphere. Every pair of lungs is constantly withdrawing from the surrounding atmosphere its healthful principle, and returning one, which is injurious to human life. When, by confinement, and this process, the atmosphere is deprived of its appropriate supply of oxygen, the purification of the blood is interrupted, and it passes, without being properly prepared, into the brain, producing languor, restlessness, and inability to exercise the intellect and feelings. Whenever, therefore, persons sleep in a close apartment, or remain, for a length of time, in a crowded or ill-ventilated room, a most pernicious influence is exerted on the brain, and, through this, on the mind. A person, who is often exposed to such influences, can never enjoy that elasticity and vigor of mind, which is one of the chief indications of its health. This is the reason, why all rooms for religious meetings, and all schoolrooms, and sleeping apartments, should be so contrived as to secure a constant supply of fresh air from without. The minister, who preaches in a crowded and ill-ventilated apartment, loses much of his power to feel and to speak, while the audience are equally reduced, in their capability of attending. The teacher, who confines children in a close apartment, diminishes their ability to study, or to attend to his instructions. And the person, who habitually sleeps in a close room, impairs his mental energies, in a similar degree. It is not unfrequently the case, that depression of spirits, and stupor of intellect, are occasioned solely by inattention to this subject. Another cause of mental disease, is, the excessive exercise of the intellect or feelings. If the eye is taxed, beyond its strength, by protracted use, its blood vessels become gorged, and the bloodshot appearance warns of the excess and the need of rest. The brain is affected, in a similar manner, by excessive use, though the suffering and inflamed organ cannot make its appeal to the eye. But there are some indications, which ought never to be misunderstood or disregarded. In cases of pupils, at school or at college, a diseased state, from overaction, is often manifested by increased clearness of mind, and ease and vigor of mental action. In one instance, known to the writer, a most exemplary and industrious pupil, anxious to improve every hour, and ignorant or unmindful of the laws of health, 
first manifested the diseased state of her brain and mind, by demands for more studies, and a sudden and earnest activity in planning modes of improvement for herself and others. When warned of her danger, she protested that she never was better, in her life, that she took regular exercise, in the open air, went to bed in season, slept soundly, and felt perfectly well, that her mind was never before so bright and clear, and study never so easy and delightful. And at this time, she was on the verge of derangement, from which she was saved only by an entire cessation of all her intellectual efforts. A similar case occurred, under the eye of the writer, from overexcited feelings. It was during a time of unusual religious interest in the community, and the mental disease was first manifested, by the pupil bringing her hymn book or Bible to the classroom, and making it her constant resort, in every interval of school duty. It finally became impossible to convince her, that it was her duty to attend to anything else, her conscience became morbidly sensitive, her perceptions indistinct, her deductions unreasonable, and nothing, but entire change of scene, exercise, and amusement, saved her. When the health of the brain was restored, she found that she could attend to the one thing needful, not only without interruption of duty, or injury of health, but rather so as to promote both. Clergymen and teachers need most carefully to notice and guard against the danger here alluded to. Any such attention to religion, as prevents the performance of daily duties and needful relaxation, is dangerous, as tending to produce such a state of the brain, as makes it impossible to feel or judge correctly. And when any morbid and unreasonable pertinacity appears, much exercise, and engagement in other interesting pursuits, should be urged as the only mode of securing the religious benefits aimed at. And whenever any mind is oppressed with care, anxiety, or sorrow, the amount of active exercise in the fresh air should be greatly increased, that the action of the muscles may withdraw the blood, which, in such seasons, is constantly tending too much to the brain. There has been a most appalling amount of suffering, derangement, disease, and death, occasioned by a want of attention to this subject in teachers and parents. Uncommon precocity in children is usually the result of an unhealthy state of the brain, and, in such cases, medical men would now direct, that the wonderful child should be deprived of all books and study, and turned to play or work in the fresh air. Instead of this, parents frequently add fuel to the fever of the brain, by supplying constant mental stimulus until the victim finds refuge in idiocy or an early grave. Where such fatal results do not occur, the brain, in many cases, is so weakened, that the prodigy of infancy sinks below the medium of intellectual powers in afterlife. In our colleges, too, many of the most promising minds sink to an early grave, or drag out a miserable existence, from this same cause. And it is an evil, as yet little alleviated by the increase of physiological knowledge. Every college and professional school, and every seminary for young ladies, needs a medical man, not only to lecture on physiology and the laws of health, but empowered, in his official capacity, to investigate the case of every pupil, and, by authority, to restrain him to such a course of study, exercise, and repose, as his physical system requires. The writer has found, by experience, that, in a large institution, there is one class of pupils who need to be restrained, by penalties, from late hours and excessive study, as much as another class needs stimulus to industry. Under the head of excessive mental action, must be placed the indulgence of the imagination in novel reading and castle building. This kind of stimulus, unless counterbalanced by physical exercise, not only wastes time and energies, but undermines the vigor of the nervous system. The imagination was designed, by our kind creator, as the charm and stimulus to animate to benevolent activity, and its perverted exercise seldom fails to bring the appropriate penalty. A third cause of mental disease, is, the want of the appropriate exercise of the various faculties of the mind. On this point, Dr. Coombe remarks, we have seen, that, by disuse, muscle becomes emaciated, bone softens, blood vessels are obliterated, 
and nerves lose their characteristic structure. The brain is no exception to this general rule. Of it, also, the tone is impaired by permanent inactivity, and it becomes less fit to manifest the mental powers with readiness and energy. It is the withdrawal of the stimulus necessary for its healthy exercise, which renders solitary confinement so severe a punishment, even to the most daring minds. It is a lower degree of the same cause, which renders continuous seclusion from society so injurious, to both mental and bodily health. Inactivity of intellect and of feeling is a very frequent predisposing cause of every form of nervous disease. For demonstrative evidence of this position, we have only to look at the numerous victims to be found, among persons who have no call to exertion in gaining the means of subsistence and no objects of interest on which to exercise their mental faculties and who consequently sink into a state of mental sloth and nervous weakness. If we look abroad upon society, we shall find innumerable examples of mental and nervous debility from this cause. When a person of some mental capacity is confined, for a long time, to an unvarying round of employment, which affords neither scope nor stimulus for one half of his faculties, and, from want of education or society, has no external resources, his mental powers, for want of exercise, become blunted, and his perceptions slow and dull. The intellect and feelings, not being provided with interests external to themselves, must either become inactive and weak, or work upon themselves and become diseased. The most frequent victims of this kind of predisposition, are females of the middle and higher ranks especially those of a nervous constitution and good natural abilities, but who, from an ill-directed education, possess nothing more solid than mere accomplishments, and have no materials of thought, and no occupation to excite interest or demand attention. The liability of such persons to melancholy, hysteria, hypochondriasis, and other varieties of mental distress, really depends on a state of irritability of brain induced by imperfect exercise. These remarks, of a medical man, illustrate the principles before indicated semicolon namely, that the demand of Christianity, that we live to promote the general happiness, and not merely for selfish indulgence, has for its aim, not only the general good, but the highest happiness, of the individual of whom it is required. A person possessed of wealth, who has nothing more noble to engage his attention, than seeking his own personal enjoyment, subjects his mental powers and moral feelings to a degree of inactivity, utterly at war with health of mind. And the greater the capacities, the greater are the sufferings which result from this cause. Anyone, who has read the misanthropic wailings of Lord Byron, has seen the necessary result of great and noble powers bereft of their appropriate exercise, and, in consequence, becoming sources of the keenest suffering. It is this view of the subject, which has often awakened feelings of sorrow and anxiety in the mind of the writer, while aiding in the development and education of superior female minds, in the wealthier circles. Not because there are not noble objects for interest and effort, abundant, and within reach of such minds, but because long established custom has made it seem so quixotic, to the majority even of the professed followers of Christ, for a woman of wealth to practice any great self-denial, that few have independence of mind and Christian principle sufficient to overcome such an influence. The more a mind has its powers developed, the more does it aspire and bind after some object worthy of its energies and affections, and they are commonplace and phlegmatic characters, who are most free from such deep-seated wants. Many a young woman, a fine genius and elevated sentiment, finds a charm in Lord Byron's writings, because they present a glowing picture of what, to a certain extent, must be felt by every well-developed mind, which has no nobler object in life, than the pursuit of its own gratification. If young ladies of wealth could pursue their education, under the full conviction that the increase of their powers and advantages increased their obligations to use all for the good of society, and with some plan of benevolent enterprise in view, what new motives of interest would be added to their daily pursuits? And what blessed results would follow, 
to our beloved country, if all well-educated females carried out the principles of Christianity, in the exercise of their developed powers. It is cheering to know, that there are women, among the most intelligent and wealthy, who can be presented as examples of what may be done, when there is a heart to do. A pupil of the writer is among this number, who, though a rich heiress, immediately, on the close of her school life, commenced a course of self-denying benevolence, in the cause of education. She determined to secure a superior female institution.